Part zero zero of Researches into the Physical History of Man. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Researches into the Physical History of Man by James Cowles Pritchard. Preface the nature and causes of the physical diversities which characterize different races of men though a curious and interesting subject of inquiry is one which has rarely engaged the notice of writers of our country the few english authors who have treated of it at least those who have entered into the investigation on physiological grounds have for the most part maintained the opinion that there exist in mankind several distinct species. A considerable and very respectable class of foreign writers, at the head of whom we reckon Buffon and Blumenbach, have given their suffrages on the contrary side of this question, and have entered more diffusely into the proof of the doctrine they advocate. My attention was strongly excited to this inquiry many years ago, by happening to hear the truth of the mosaic records implicated in it and denied on the alleged impossibility of reconciling the history contained in them with the phenomena of nature and particularly with the diversified characters of several races of men the arguments of those who assert that these races constitute distinct species appeared to me at first irresistible and I found no satisfactory proof in the vague and conjectural reasonings by which the opposite opinion has generally been defended. I was at least convinced that most of the theories current concerning the effects of climate and other modifying causes are in great part hypothetical and irreconcilable with facts that cannot be disputed. I resumed my inquiry into the physical history of mankind on hearing it treated of by the late professor of moral philosophy in the University of Edinburgh, whose unrivaled powers of eloquence never failed to impart a lively interest even to the most sterile and unpleasing speculations. At this time I was induced to investigate the subject the more attentively, as I found that some of my own opinions concerning it did not altogether agree with those of my illustrious preceptor. This inquiry furnished me with the argument of an inaugural essay published in the same university. Having had occasion, after the lapse of several years, to reconsider my former reasonings and inferences, I have been persuaded that some of them approach more nearly to the truth than the notions which generally prevail and under this conviction i have ventured to offer the following pages to the perusal of the public in the course of this essay i have maintained the opinion that all mankind constitute but one race or proceed from a single family but i am far from wishing to interest any religious predilections in favor of my conclusions on the contrary i am ready to admit and shall be glad to believe if it can be made to appear, that the truth of the scriptures is not involved in the decision of this question. I have made no reference to the writings of Moses, except with relation to events concerning which the authority of those most ancient records may be received as common historical testimony, being aware that one class of persons would refuse to admit any such appeal, and that others, would rather wish to see the points in dispute established on distinct and independent grounds. Bristol, November 3rd, 1813. End of section 00, preface. Part 1 of Researches into the Physical History of Man. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by John Greenman. Chapter 1, Section 1 If an illiterate person, bred in some remote corner of England, who had never seen or heard of any human creatures different from the natives of his own vicinity, were suddenly transported into the western continent, and introduced to a horde of the naked and dusky barbarians who wander on the shores of the Mississippi, 
or if he were presented to a tribe of yellow and bald-headed mongols or carried into the midst of the black population of a negro hamlet he would certainly experience strong emotion of wonder and surprise he would indeed immediately recognize the beings whom he saw as men for the expression of rational intellect the likeness of the creator which was imprinted on the first of the humankind is everywhere instantly striking and conspicuous but a spectator in such circumstances would be exceedingly perplexed in contemplating appearances so new to him and in comparing with himself persons who differed from him in so extraordinary a manner and yet so nearly resembled him that he could not fail to consider them as fellow-creatures the differences of voice and gesture and manners of life would probably occasion no less surprise to him than the peculiarities of natural structure philosophers have learned to attribute all discretions of the former kind to accident and education and to consider the moral diversities of nations as proceeding rather from external and adventitious circumstances than from innate and inherent causes so far they have the advantage of the uninformed spectator of such phenomena but when these accessory differences are explained there still remains a great variety in the physical constitution of the several races of men concerning the nature of which the most sagacious of our scientific reasoners have made little progress towards a satisfactory conclusion some authors who have treated of this subject have supposed that all the nations on the earth are descended from a single family and have attributed the varieties which we observe in their aspect and bodily structure to the action of natural causes on a race originally uniform others on the contrary insist that the differences adverted to are too great to have been so produced and must therefore be referred to original diversity this question has already undergone much discussion and we find among the disputants in either party names eminently respectable in the literary and scientific world in the following pages i shall endeavor to state as clearly as possible the principal facts whether physiological or historical which appear to me likely to illustrate this interesting inquiry and shall draw such inferences as seem to be authorized by the commonly received methods of reasoning with such evidence i shall attempt to answer the question whether it is probable that all mankind are the offspring of one family and shall afterwards proceed to trace the affinities of different nations as far as an inquiry of this nature may tend to throw any light on the physical history of man i shall in the course of this investigation endeavor to obtain some idea of the efficacy of those causes which have been supposed capable of producing the diversities of the human kind many of the writers who have entered on the inquiry before us have preferred the more specious and expeditious modes of reasoning which are drawn from probabilities and founded on arguments a priori to the tedious process of analytical discussion some of them confidently assuming that all mankind are of one natural species proceed to force the newtonian principle of simplicity of causes into the support of the position that they all sprang from a single pair nature they tell us does nothing in vain but it is vain and superfluous to do by many means what may be done by fewer we must not therefore admit more causes of natural things than those which are true and sufficiently account for natural phenomena but it is true that one pair at least of every living species must at first have been created and that one single pair was sufficient for the population of our globe in a period of no considerable length is evident from the most common calculations of political arithmeticians it follows says the illustrious writer whose words we are quoting that the author of nature for all nature proclaims its divine author created but one pair of our species 
yet had it not been among other reasons for the devastations which history has recorded of water and fire famine and pestilence the earth would not now have had room for its multiplied inhabitants Note, sir w jones's essay on the families of nations the other party reason with as much logical subtlety and with arguments equally plausible and ingenious it is highly improbable they observe assuming in their turn some points which ought to have been first proved that so many extensive continents should be created to lie vacant and sterile during thousands of years till the tardy ramifications of our primary stock should spread themselves progressively to each distant corner of the globe or that the infinite number of islands which diversify and ornament the face of the deep should be left to be peopled by fortuitous incident by the chance of shipwrecks or the wanderings of some navigator or perhaps to lie perpetually desert destined never to be marked by the footsteps of men it is much more consistent with our views of divine wisdom and benevolence to suppose that the earth was plentifully covered at the period of its creation with animal and vegetable productions naturally adapted to every peculiarity of soil and climate and that each part became immediately subservient to the great designs of the almighty maker Note, see lord kames's sketches of the history of man and other writers who follow him it would be easy to multiply reasonings of this kind on either side of the question almost without any limit but it is impossible to arrive at any certain conclusion or to produce any conviction by means of them all speculations concerning the system of the world which are founded on arguments from probabilities and the supposed fitness of things demand a greater share of intelligence than has been given to the human mind and become not the humble interpreter of nature philosophers who pursue such modes of reasoning may explain to us very clearly indeed how they would have made the world if the task had been entrusted to their discretion but they never can afford us any insight into its actual constitution if truth be our object we must pursue it in a very different path our first and most important attempt in this pursuit must be the solution of the inquiry whether all mankind are to be considered as one natural species or not or whether the physical diversities which so curiously distinguish the several races of men are to borrow a term which is chiefly used in abstract reasonings specific differences or only varieties and here it will be advantageous to extend our view to the other departments of animated nature and to consider the general question how we are to determine on the identity or diversity of species in races of animals which differ enough in their appearance to excite our doubt on this point many of the discriminations which are most frequently used in the works of naturalists are artificial and have their origin not in any fundamental distinction established by nature but in some attempt of philosophers at generalization the design of arrangements of this kind is chiefly to facilitate memory by a lucid order to enable it to retain in its comprehension a vast variety of phenomena in which in the confused mass it could have no secure hold by distributing them according to certain classes such classes are constituted by some one character possessed by all the individuals belonging to each or by a general resemblance pervading a whole department of this kind are the genera of the older zoologists as well as the classes and orders in the several systems of linnaeus and other botanists and natural historians the principle of these arrangements being an arbitrary definition they may be changed or modified ad infinitum according to the caprice of the constructor but it is not so in the case of species here the distinction is formed by nature and the definition must be constant and uniform or it is of no sort of value it must coincide with nature 
Providence has distributed the animated world into a number of distinct species, and has ordained that each shall multiply according to its kind and propagate the stock to perpetuity, none of them ever transgressing their own limits, or approximating in any great degree to the others, or ever in any case passing into each other. Such a confusion is contrary to the established order of nature. The principle, therefore, of the distinction of species is constant and perpetual difference. Where two races of animals are distinguished by any undeviating marks in such a way that they never will under any circumstances pass into each other, or that the progeny of either can never acquire the characters of the other, they are of distinct species, and it matters not how wide or how narrow be the line of discrimination, provided that it never be broken in upon. This rule is simple, but it is not possible to apply it immediately to the phenomena, for it is well known that considerable varieties arise within the limits of one species, and such varieties often become to a great degree hereditary in the race and permanent. It is therefore often very difficult to ascertain whether the tribes thus distinguished are varieties which have arisen in the manner mentioned above, though we cannot trace their origin, or species distinct from their first creation. And in order to solve this question, we must have recourse to indirect methods of reasoning. The Count de Buffon, note, the invention of this criterion has been attributed to Dr. Ray, Bluchenbach, de General Humain Varnet, but I cannot find that our learned countryman has any claim to whatever degree of credit may attach to this real or fancied discovery. From a passage in his synopsis, Animalium, Quadrupenum, page 76, it would seem that he had a very imperfect idea of the distinct propagation of species. End of note. The Count de Buffon, our great physiologist John Hunter, and some others have sought a solution of the question of species in the breeding of animals. It seems reasonable to suppose that Providence has taken care to prevent the mixture of kinds, and the fact that most hybrid animals are wholly unprolific would appear to be a provision for the attainment of this desirable end, and for maintaining the order and variety of nature. For if such had not been the condition of these intermediate animals, we have reason to believe that all the primitive distinctions would have been long ago totally effaced, and universal confusion must have ensued, and there would not be at this day one pure and unmixed species left in existence. The naturalists above mentioned, inferring from the apparent utility of this law that it must universally prevail, obtain by means of it a ready method of determining on identity or diversity of species. They consider that if a male and female produce an offspring which is prolific, the tribes to which the parents respectively belong are hence proved not to be specifically different, and whatever diversities may happen to characterize them are in this case looked upon as examples of variation. But if the third animal be unprolific, it is to be concluded that the races from which it is descended are originally separate or of different kinds. On this ground John Hunter has thought himself authorized to lay it down as proved that the dog, wolf, and jackal are of the same species, and that the fox is of a distinct kind. Note, John Hunter on certain parts of the animal economy. End of note. The rule being thus established, there remains no difficulty with regard to the diversities of mankind. We very easily conclude that all men are of one and the same species. But we are prevented from acquiescing with full confidence in this conclusion, because the premises on which it is founded are not laid down with sufficient certainty. For until experiments shall have been made on a more extended scale, we shall not be authorized in affirming that there are not any two distinct species in nature 
of which the mixed progeny might be prolific. The unmixed propagation of each species, which we observe among animals in the natural state, is certainly an argument of great force, and goes a considerable way towards establishing the general law. But a question here arises whether nature has not provided for the preservation of these distinctions by a mutual repugnance between the individuals of different kinds rather than by any more absolute decree. This has been imagined, note, Frisch apud Blumenbach de generis humani veritate nativa, end of note, and it has been hence inferred as probable that many of the species which, while they remain in their wild, unstrained condition, continue distinct, would, if they were brought into a state of domestication, in which the natural propensities of animals cease in a great measure to direct their actions, procreate offspring which might for aught we know be prolific. This notion is contradicted, however, by the result of numerous experiments. For among the great number of domesticated races we find that the fact is far otherwise. Note, this assertion is doubtless true in general, and being so is sufficient to establish the inference here founded upon. It is not intended to assert the fact as universal. There are certainly exceptions to the rule, and some proper hybrid animals have produced offspring. This happens occasionally, though rarely, with mules, as it has been repeatedly observed. Mr. Hunter has attempted to account for this anomaly. Such uncommon deviations evidently have no effect in weakening the credit of the general observation. It is said by Buffon, and the assertion has been repeated by other naturalists, that the hybrid between the sheep and the goat is prolific. Probably some examples parallel to those related of the mule may have given rise to this notion, but if such be the usual fact, it must be considered as an exception against the law in question of a very different kind from the last. But the mixed progeny of the wolf and dog is prolific, and some naturalists are confident that these animals are of distinct species. They differ indeed in many points, and in some particulars of internal structure, viz. in the intestinum coacum, as shown by Professor Gildenstad, Petersburg Transactions, in which respect the dog and jackal agree. The Count de Buffon asserts that the time of utero gestation of a wolf is about one hundred days, while that of a bitch is known to be about sixty-two or sixty-three. If this fact be accurately stated, it must be admitted that the two animals are of distinct species. But the assertion seems to have been made carelessly by the Count, and is contradicted by facts related in his appendix. In the account of one of these it is evident that the time of gestation of a wolf must have been between fifty-seven and seventy-three days. Sixty-three is a probable intermediate time. Some facts are related by Mr. Hunter which appear to have been very accurately observed, and which seem to prove that this is the true time. An instance of the same kind is reported in the fourth volume of the Annals of the Museum of Natural History at Paris. The time of gestation in this example seemed to be eighty-nine or ninety-one days. It is difficult to reconcile these contradictory statements but the greater portion of evidence seems to be in favor of the coincidence of these two races in the time of utero gestation. The fact that the wolf is subject to hydrophobia is an argument tending to countenance the opinion of Hunter that the wolf and dog are of the same species. The Bactrian and Arabian camel breed together, and this fact has been mentioned as an argument contradicting the general doctrine of the distinct propagation of species, but these animals are considered by most naturalists as varieties of one species. On the whole, the assertion in the text seems not to be too general. End of note. The hybrid animals produced by the mixture of any two of them is unprolific. Therefore, the absolute sterility of such mixed offspring must be held to be a law established in nature, and to it 
rather than to any supposed agency of instinct, must be attributed the universal preservation of distinct species. On the whole, then, it is clear that the position on which the above theory is founded is true to a considerable extent. It is confirmed by experiment among the domesticated races, though perhaps not without exceptions. And in that wider range which uncultivated nature holds out to our view, we have strong reason for believing that the same law prevails. Still we are not authorized in affirming its universality. In the present case, however, I think we may deduce from this quarter a presumptive argument that all mankind are of one species. It must be confessed that this argument is not conclusive, and until the doctrine on which it is founded shall be more fully proved, we must look for some other method. In the present state of our knowledge, it will be better to proceed on a more cautious and inductive mode and, in the first instance, to ascertain as nearly as possible what are the kinds of variation in which nature chiefly delights. When we have found that any particular deviation from the primitive character has taken place in a number of examples, the tendency to such variety may be laid down as a law more or less general, and, accordingly, when parallel diversities are observed in instances which do not afford us a view of the origin and progress of the change, we may nevertheless venture to refer the latter with a sufficient degree of probability to the class of natural varieties, or to consider them as examples of diversified appearance in the same individual species. Thus if we find mice, rats, or crows, resembling in other respects the animals commonly known to us under those names, but having their hair or plumage perfectly white, and their eyes of a light red color, we need not hesitate in referring these peculiarities to variation from the primitive hue of the respective races, because we find a change exactly similar exhibited in many parts of the animal kingdom, concerning which we are well informed. Note, I had adopted this analogical method of reasoning in my first inquiries into this subject, and had soon the satisfaction of finding it received and amply established by Blumenbach, Blum de gen umen var nat. It is much to be desired that we were in possession of a more simple criterion of species, but it does not appear that the present state of our physiological science will afford any perhaps an attention to the diseases of animals might tend to throw light on this subject. Contagions appear to be, for the most part, incommunicable from one kind of animals to another. Apes have been discovered to be insusceptible to syphilitic poison. Sheep and hogs are often carried to the West Indies in the same vessel, and a pestilence arising in one kind has no effect on the other. But in these instances different genera are concerned, and we are not sure that several species closely allied may not be subject to the same contagion. Some species of plants, however, of the same genus, and which very nearly resemble, are found not to be subject to the same diseases. If this criterion shall appear to be correctly founded, it will prove that all mankind are of one species since all human contagions are communicable to the whole genus. In some degree allied to this method of distinction is the criterion which it has been proposed to derive from the examination of parasitical animals, a distinct set being believed to be peculiar to each species. Some distinguished naturalists are at present occupied in this inquiry and it seems likely to lead to curious and important results. End of note. On a general survey of the animal and vegetable world we perceive no law of which the influence appears to prevail more extensively than that of the tendency to assume, under circumstances not well ascertained, varieties of form and color. There is scarcely any species which does not exhibit some disposition of this kind, and its effects are particularly manifest among warm-blooded animals. 
the science of physiology must be much further advanced and we require to have far more accurate ideas of the general process of reproduction before it will be possible for us to ascertain with precision the causes of such deviations we may however in general observe that when the condition of each species is uniform and does not differ materially from the natural and original state the appearances are more constant and the phenomena of variation if they in any degree display themselves are more rare and less conspicuous than when the race has either been brought by human art into a state of cultivation or domestication or has been thrown casually into circumstances very different from the simple and primary condition the condition of man is more diversified than that of almost any other species for the human kind is exposed to the most various agency of natural causes being spread through more extensive regions than any other race and inhabiting all gradations of climate it is moreover found in every different stage and mode of cultivation therefore it would be contrary to expectation if we did not discover in the numerous tribes of men as many and as important diversities as those which we observe in the inferior species we shall now proceed to consider the various appearances which the human kind exhibits in its different races and holding in our view the method of reasoning before laid down shall endeavor to determine whether they are of a nature analogous to the diversities which other species have a tendency to assume and therefore to be referred according to our rule to the principle of natural deviation or on the contrary peculiar and such as must be held to constitute specific differences the variety of color in the races of men seems to form more general as well as more permanent discriminations than the peculiarities of figure which is contrary to what is observed in some other species we shall therefore first consider the diversities of the former class which are apparent in the human kind and shall rely upon them as much as on other characters as a principle of distribution and arrangement end of section one different modes of reasoning adopted on this question method proposed to be followed in this treatise part two of Researches into the Physical History of Man. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain, read by John Greenman. Section 2. Of the Diversities of Color. First, of the albino, or the leucothiop. A very remarkable variety of the human kind is that which has been commonly distinguished by the name of albino. The term leucothiops, or white Ethiopians, has also been appropriated to individuals of this class in the writings of some modern naturalists the latter denomination was known to the ancients note ptolemy lib four cap six and pliny lib five cap seven end of note and was by them applied to a tribe of people in nigritia who were probably of the character which we are now about to describe the most prominent peculiarities of this class of men are the following the iris of the eye is of a bright red hue and the organ of sight is remarkably sensible of light the complexion is either uncommonly fair and resembling that of the most exquisite examples of the sanguineous temperament or it is of a dull whiteness of disagreeable aspect and giving the appearance of disease the hair is extremely soft in its texture and in general is perfectly white but in some instances of a very light flaxen color and when this variety springs up among negroes the woolly excrescence which covers the heads of that race is white the same or very similar characters are found in various species of animals both wild and domesticated they have been observed in apes squirrels rabbits rats mice hamsters hogs moles opossums martins polecats goats note blumenbach de gen h v n 
sometimes though rarely in foxes note shaw's zoology they have been seen in the buffalo note shaw's zoology in the cervus capriolis or common row note shaw's zoology in the elephant though but rarely note shaw's zoology in the badger note penance hist quadrupeds and the beaver note penance hist quadrupeds in norway they have been remarked to occur in the common species of bear note pallas specileg zoalg fasis fourteen and in siberia in the dromedary or bactrian camel note shaw's zoology several species of birds as crows blackbirds canary birds partridges fowls and peacocks exhibit similar phenomena having their feathers of a pure white color and their eyes red in the human kind this variety frequently appears among all nations but it has been more remarked in tribes which are generally of a dark complexion note it has been principally observed in guinea ceylon java and darien the following curious description of this variety as seen in the latter country is given by wafer these persons are white and there are of them of both sexes yet there are but few of them in comparison of the copper-colored possibly but one to two or three hundred they differ from the other indians chiefly in respect of color though not in that only their skins are not of such a white as those of fair people among europeans with some tincture of a blush or sanguine complexion yet neither is it like that of our paler people but it is rather a milk white lighter than the color of any european and much like that of a white horse for there is this further remarkable in them that their bodies are beset all over more or less with a fine short milk-white down but they are not so thick-set with this down especially on the cheeks and forehead but that the skin appears distinct from it their eyebrows are milk-white also and so is the hair of their heads and very fine withal about the length of six or eight inches and inclining to a curl they are not so big as the other indians and their eyelids bend and open in an oblong figure pointing downwards at the corners and forming an arch or figure of a crescent with the points downwards from hence and from their seeing so clear as they do in a moonshiny night we used to call them moon-eyed for they see not well in the sun pouring in the clearest day their eyes being weak and running with water if the sun shines towards them so that in the daytime they care not to go abroad unless it be a cloudy dark day besides they are a weak people in comparison of the others and not very fit for hunting and other laborious exercises nor do they delight in any such but notwithstanding their being thus sluggish and dull in the daytime yet when moonshiny nights come they are all life and activity running abroad into the woods and skipping about like wild bucks and running as fast by moonlight even in the gloom and shade of the woods as the other indians by day being as nimble as they though not so strong and lusty the copper-colored indians seem not to respect them so much as those of their own complexion looking on them as something monstrous they are not a distinct race by themselves but now and then one is bred of a copper-colored father and mother and i have seen of less than a year old of this sort see waffer's account of the isthmus of darien sixteen ninety nine also phil's transact seventeen sixty three end of note those races indeed the hue of whose skin approaches most nearly to black are in general most prone to deviations in color. 2. Yellow-haired variety. Another variety of the human complexion is marked by hair of a reddish, 
yellowish or flaxen color, and a skin very fair, though not so white as that of the last-mentioned description of men, but generally more ruddy. The iris of the eye is always a light hue, generally blue or gray, the shade of color bearing a relation to that of the hair and skin, which relation is preserved not only in this variety, but in all the others, with scarcely any exceptions. Many species of animals, both wild and domesticated, exhibit the same characters as foxes, rabbits, dogs, oxen, cats. The chestnut horse is a similar example. Note, the color of the iris in the horse is subject to little variety, which seems to be an exception to the constancy of the relation between the hue of the pigmentum and that of the hair. But Mr. Hunter has observed that all foals are of the same color, and that though the hair varies as they become older, still the skin remains the same, being no darker in black than in white horses, which is contrary to what we observe in most species. But cream-colored horses have the skin of the same hue with the hair, and in these the iris is also cream-colored. Hunter on certain parts of the animal economy. End of note. The German tribes were remarked before they became intermixed with other nations to be universally of this complexion, and it is predominant in the present day in countries which received their stock of people from Germany. But it is well known to spring up occasionally in other races, as we shall have further occasion of observing. This variety includes the sanguineous and phlegmatic temperaments of physiological writers. Third variety. A variety still more extensively prevalent than the preceding is distinguished by dark or black hair, with the iris of a corresponding hue, while the complexion is white, though without that delicate tint which characterizes the sanguineous constitution. The skin soon becomes brown by exposure to the sun, but in persons who are constantly protected from the influence of the weather, it is frequently almost of the whiteness of marble. Such is the complexion of the women of Tunis, and other places of the Mediterranean coast, where the heat of the climate obliges them to be constantly covered. Note, Buffon hissed gnat. This class in the human kind is analogous to the varieties of animals which are a few shades darker than those compared above to the yellow-haired races of men. Such are gray animals among rabbits, cats, and many other species. Horses which have the coat of a light color, with their tails and manes black, are of this class. Such is invariably the case with bay horses, though in those horses, which have the coat of a chestnut color, the tail and mane are always of the same hue, or still lighter. The bay and chestnut color in the horse species seem to be strongly analogous to this and the last-mentioned varieties of mankind respectively. In this variety we include the choleric and melancholic temperaments of physiological and medical writers. Fourth Variety a complexion of a yellowish tint passing into an olive and stiff long black hair constitutes some of the distinguishing marks of several similar nations of men, the principal of whom are the Mongols, Manchurs or Tangusians, and Samoyeds. These tribes are perhaps still more strongly characterized by peculiarities of figure, which will be hereafter considered. Fifth Variety the race of Native Americans constitutes a class, which is characterized by a complexion darker than the preceding, varying from a copper color to a more dusky hue with black hair. The figure of the body is also peculiar, but with that we have no concern at present. The two last-mentioned varieties are analogous to many races of animals of dark hue, which approach in different shades to black as of horses oxen, cats, dogs, etc., of a deep brown or dun color. Sixth Variety The children of Negro parents are sometimes variegated, having their skin diversified with black and white spots, and part of their woolly hair white. They are commonly called piebald Negroes. 
This variety is not very rare in the West Indies, and some examples of it have been brought to this country. The white spots have the same hue as the skin of a very fair European. A similar appearance supervenes on some diseases in the black negro, and children with a part of the body black and a part white have been the offspring of parents, one of whom was an African and the other an European. These phenomena are foreign to our present purpose. There is a distinct native variety of the character here described. The resemblance of piebald horses has suggested the name by which persons of this description have been vulgarly designated. Also, dogs, cattle, cats, etc., are seen every day with similar appearances. In Kamschatka, wild foxes are found variegated. Note, Captain King's Voyage. Seventh variety. Black or dark tawny color forms the complexion of several races of men. Sheep, rabbits, cats, hogs, horses, foxes, dogs, fowls, etc., afford a perfect analogy among the brute kinds. Not only the hair, but the skin of many of them is perfectly black. Note, the skin of the black buffalo is remarked as being particularly black. The color of the animal is very generally black, but varieties are seen white, gray, and of a bay or reddish color. This species is as yet but imperfectly domesticated. Probably it may be susceptible of further changes, such as those which have been produced in the ox species, to which it is closely allied. End of note. Such are the varieties of color observed in the human kind. They are clearly shown by the foregoing comparison to be phenomena analogous to the deviations which continually occur in the inferior species of animals. We are therefore compelled, according to the received laws of reasoning on physical questions, to refer the former to the same class of natural appearances with the latter. It may be concluded that in the various colors of men there is certainly no specific difference. End of section 2 of the diversities of color. Part three of Researches into the Physical History of Man. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by John Greenman. Section three of the hereditary transmission of the varieties. All the characters above mentioned are commonly transmitted to the offspring which is indeed the case in general with every part of the natural structure. We see no instance of connate variety, however trifling, which does not manifest a tendency to become hereditary and permanent in the race. White animals with red eyes produce offspring resembling themselves, and the stock will retain its character permanently as long as no intermixture is suffered to take place. The progeny of black animals have the sable hue of their parents. On this account, black rams are always killed in this country, and never sufficed to remain with the flocks. In other countries, black sheep are preferred, and are bred up, while the white, when that variety springs up, are destroyed. Note, palace. Accordingly, the general color of the flocks is black. All the other varieties, as it is well known, have a tendency to hereditary transmission. We may observe that the disposition to variation is more frequently shown in some species than in others, and requires the agency of less powerful causes to excite it into action. The tendency to hereditary descent also is different, both among the animal and vegetable species, for in some species of the latter class Varieties are observed to reappear in the plants produced from the seed, and to continue constantly in the stock, resembling in this particular the nature of animal varieties. On the other hand, some species of animals approach to the capricious character of the vegetable kinds, and the variations which arise in them evince little tendency to become permanent. The varieties of the human kind obey the more prevalent law of the animal kingdom. Note, Blumenbach, de gen hum var nate, and 
Mopertius Venus Physique. Albinos produce offspring similar to themselves, and whole tribes of this character are said to exist in Java. Note Blumenbach, De Gen, Hume, Ver, Nat, and Mopertuis Venus Physique. In Ceylon and in the Isthmus of Darien. Note Mopertuis Ubi Supra, Haller, Elem Physiologie. The other varieties with which we are better acquainted have the same uniform tendency. The offspring of parents of different varieties sometimes partakes of the characters of both and forms an intermediate class. In other instances, the mixed progeny resembles either the father or mother distinctively. Even in the latter case, however, when there is no appearance of mixture in the perceptible qualities of the animal, characters which thus seem to be suppressed recur in succeeding generations. Among horses, facts of this kind can be ascertained more perfectly than in other kinds on account of the attention paid to the breed of these animals. In this species the color has been found to return after lying dormant during six generations. Note, this fact I relate on the authority of Dr. Gregory, professor of practical med in the University of Edinburgh. End of note. These phenomena perpetually occur in our own race. A son is often in every respect unlike his immediate parents, and closely resembles his grandfather or grandmother, or some remote ancestors. This fact Lucretius has advanced, among many other illustrations of the absurd theory of universal generation from atoms. Fit quoque ut interdum similis existere avorum possent, et referent pro avorum saipe figuras, propteria quia multa modis primordia multis mista so celant in corpore saipe parentes, quae patribus patres tradunt a stirpe profecta, inde venus varia producet sorte figuras, maiorum que refert voltus vocesque comasque. Note. Lucretius de Rer nat lib tu. End of note. It would appear that the different varieties were distinctly marked in several of the nations of antiquity which had not yet been intermixed. Thus Tacitus informs us that the Germans had universally blue eyes and red hair. Note Tacitus de Muribus Germanorum, and he compares the Silures, note Tacitus Vita Agricolae, to the Spaniards, and remarks that their complexion was dark and swarthy. The mixture of the German and Celtic races, from which the mass of our population in England is descended, has afforded us in the present day every possible intermediate shade between the opposite complexions of two aboriginal tribes, though some individuals are seen everywhere who deviate to the extreme of either variety. The union of black and white parents generally produces a child of intermediate character, which we term a mulatto. This, however, does not always happen, for the offspring sometimes resembles one of the parents without partaking the character of the other. Instances have been known in which the progeny has been party-colored, one portion of the body being black and the other white. Some curious facts of this nature were communicated by Dr. Parsons of the Royal Society, which I shall extract from the annals of that learned body, as they afford proof and illustration of the above remarks. Note, Phil Transact Vol. 55. The first is of a black man who married a white woman in York several years ago, Quote, of which, says Dr. Parsons, I had an account from an eye-witness. She soon proved with child and in due time brought forth one entirely black and in every particular of color and features resembling the father without the least participation from the mother. The second case was of a black man, servant to a gentleman who lived somewhere in the neighborhood of Gray's Inn, this black man married a white woman who lived in the same family, and when she proved with child, took a lodging for her in Gray's Inn Lane. When she was at her full time, the master had business out of town and took his man with him, 
and did not return till ten or twelve days after this woman was delivered of a girl, which was as fair a child to look at as any born of white parents, and her features exactly like the mother. The black at his return was very much disturbed at the appearance of the child, and swore it was not his. But the nurse who attended the lying-in woman soon satisfied him, for she undressed the infant and showed him the right buttock and thigh, which were as black as the father, and reconciled him immediately to both mother and child. I was informed of the fact, and went to the place, where I examined the child and found it true. This was in the spring of the year 1747, as my notes specify, which I took upon the spot. Dr. Parsons has given the following relation on the authority of the lady of a respectable family which resided several years in Virginia in an elevated rank. About nineteen years ago, in a small plantation near to that of this family, which belonged to a widow, two of her slaves, both black, were married, and the woman brought forth a white girl, which this lady saw very often and as the circumstances of the case were very particular, I shall make mention of them here, both for the entertainment of the society, and to show that this is exactly similar to the case of the boy before us, when the poor woman was told the child was like the children of white people, she was in great dread of her husband, declaring at the same time that she never had anything to do with a white man in her life, and therefore begged that they would keep the place dark, that he might not see it. When he came to ask her how she did, he wanted to see the child, and wondered why the room was shut up, as it was not usual. The woman's fears increased when he had it brought into the light, but while he looked at it he seemed highly pleased returned the child, and behaved with extraordinary tenderness. She imagined he dissembled his resentment till she should be able to go about, and that then he would leave her. But in a few days he said to her, You are afraid of me, and therefore keep the room dark, because my child is white. But I love it the better for that, for my own father was a white man though my grandfather and grandmother were as black as you and myself, and although we came from a place where no white people were ever seen, yet there was always a white child in every family that was related to us. The woman did well, and the child was shown about as a curiosity, and was, at about the age of fifteen, sold to Admiral Ward and brought to London in order to be shown to the Royal Society. These relations are evidently drawn up with great care, and are perfectly well authenticated. Therefore there is no reason to doubt of the facts asserted. Thus it appears that the phenomena of reproduction confirm the analogy which we have traced between the various complexions of men and the diversities of color in other kinds of animals. We have no reason to hesitate in attributing these similar appearances to similar causes, whatever they may be. End of section 3 of the Hereditary Transmission of the Varieties Part 4 of Researches into the Physical History of Man Chapter 2 The Same Inquiry Continued Section 1 on diversities of form, natural physiognomy, etc. In extending our view through the organized world, we perceive no common quality so universally characterizing the works of nature as an infinite and inexhaustible variety. Her purposes are everywhere satisfied with general similitude, and she never aims at that uniformity which we find in the productions of human art no two individuals were ever formed in any species with perfect and precise resemblance. This striking feature of nature has been remarked by the Epicurean poet in the following beautiful lines. 
praeterie genus humanum mutae quae natantes. Note, Lucretius de rer nat lib for. Squam migerum pecudes, et laeta armenta, feraeque, et variae volucres, laetanti quae loca aquarum concelebrant, circum ripas fonteisque lacusque, et quae per volgant nemora avia per voletantes, horum unum quod vis generatem sumere perge, in venies tamen inter se distare figuris. Nec ratione alea proles coniosquere matrem, nec mater posset prolem, quod posse videmus nec minus atque homines inter se nota cluere. And again, he applies the same observation to other departments of nature. Posteremo quod vis frumentum, non tamen omne. Note, Lucretius de rer nat lib for. Quodque in suo genere inter se simile esse videbis, quin intercurret quaedam distanti formis, con carunque genus parili ratione videmus, pingere telluris gremium, qua mollebus undis litturis in curui bibulam pavit aequor arenam. This variety, which is the general tenor of nature, prevails not more in other examples than in the human figure and stature, and in the features of the face. The children of the same parents, though often bearing a general resemblance, yet exhibit always some difference, and, frequently, a considerable diversity in these respects. To account for this apparently capricious variety is not what we attempt that there must be a sufficient reason why each individual figure should assume its own precise character rather than the other, is not to be doubted, but the causes which predetermine it seem to be beyond the reach of human sagacity, or at least they will never be discovered until the details of general physiology and the theory of generation in particular shall be much better understood than they seem likely ever to be but by observing that such a tendency to deviation exists, even among the individuals of the same family, and that whatever examples of variety may arise, have a general disposition to become hereditary, we appear to make some progress towards an explanation of the diversities of figure which characterize different races of the human kind. The brothers of the same family, and even the more distant relatives, bear generally a certain resemblance to each other. We often observe a common character of person prevailing through whole houses, and in a remote hamlet or district not frequently visited by strangers, which has been possessed by a few families during a long course of years, and where the population has undergone no changes by the introduction of new occupants, the inhabitants become connected together by intermarriages and a communication of hereditary varieties takes place till all become at length more or less alike. No man should travel through the more distant corners of our own country with an observant eye could fail of remarking the frequent occurrence of this fact. Note, a curious anecdote has been related by Dr. Gregory, the present respectable professor of physic in the University of Edinburgh, as an illustrative of the hereditary tendency of peculiar structure, he made a long journey from the capital of North Britain to a remote village to visit the principal inhabitant of the hamlet. The latter was a lady far advanced in life, who resided in an old baronial castle. On entering the hall his attention was attracted by the picture of a former lord of the place who had some time been Chancellor of Scotland. It held a conspicuous station among the family portraits, and was remarkable for a protuberant aquiline nose, and for a very peculiar set of features. But what excited the notice of the professor more strongly was a singular resemblance which he could not fail to observe between the countenance represented in the picture and that of the lady whom he was about to visit. 
the latter was descended in a direct line from the prototype of the portrait the picture had held the place in which it was fixed at least a century and a half going afterwards to other houses in the village our author was surprised to find the same cast of features prevalent in several other families and on inquiry was informed that the old chancellor had been the father of several illegitimate children who had disseminated thus widely the visage of their common progenitor dr gregory's lectures given in the university of edinburgh End of note. among nations the same causes act on a more extensive scale and with greater power diversities of manners religion and language and mutual animosities which may have originated from long subjection to hostile governments and may have been transmitted from distant times produce aversions between the inhabitants of neighboring countries and prevent intercourse and intermarriages the difference gradually increases the effect accumulating while the cause continues the people diverge if i may use the expression in the characters of person and national physiognomy becomes established note this fact is asserted by all travelers in italy End of note. it is said that in every different state or province of italy the people have their peculiar form of features or characteristic physiognomy this fact must be accounted for on the principle above stated for no other cause can be imagined the different castes of people in hindustan who are settled in the same country or who wander over it have been prevented by the strict prohibitions of their religion from intermarriages with each other for many ages the result of this long continued experiment is illustrative of the foregoing remarks each of these castes has acquired though all of them are subject to the same local causes a distinct set of features and they are all easily known by people who are conversant with them note major orme's indostan introduction End of note. from similar causes the difference of features which we remark between the english and scottish people and between the french and italians must be supposed to have arisen we cannot imagine diversity of origin or any considerable effect arising from difference of soil and climate in either of these instances and perhaps the distinct physiognomy which characterizes the several nations of europe may be in great part accounted for on the same principles the hereditary tendency of peculiar corporeal structure in the brute species has long been matter of common observation and it is on the skilful application of it that the art of the breeders of cattle horses and other domesticated animals consists the power which human art possesses of mollifying the individual is very limited indeed but by diligently taking advantage of the natural tendency to transmit any qualities which happen to arise a very considerable influence is exercised over the race different breeds are thus formed endowed with diverse properties which render them useful in various ways to their owners the process consists in a careful selection of those individual animals which happen to be possessed in a more remarkable degree than the generality of the characters which it is desirable to perpetuate these are kept for the future propagation of the stock and a repeated attention is paid to the same circumstances till the effect continually increasing a particular figure color proportion of limbs or any other attainable quality is established in the race and the conformity is afterwards maintained by removing from the breed any new variety which may casually spring up in it thus it has long been a favorite caprice among the farmers of different counties of england to encourage breeds of cattle of peculiar colors in some countries they have chosen to have all their stock of oxen brown in others they have them spotted in a particular manner in such places varieties thus rendered general become to a great degree constant and animals of a different character from that of the race in this manner constituted are very rarely produced 
It is perhaps to a similar diversity of choice in the breeders that we find in some districts of our country sheep and oxen of which the whole breeds are horned. In other places they are altogether destitute of horns. These instances are of an inferior class, though they exemplify the general principle, but it is capable of a much more useful application. By the same process, distinct breeds of animals, as of horses, for example, are formed, which are adapted by their peculiar conformation to various purposes of utility. Strength and the more unwieldy form, necessary to great power of limbs, become the character of one race of horses, while another is distinguished for a light and more graceful shape, favorable to agility and celerity of motion. The finer breeds of horses have perhaps attained greater elegance and perfection in England than was ever to be found in the species in any other country, and this is to be attributed to the great attention which has been bestowed on their propagation owing to the prevalent fashion of horse-racing. Note César de Belo Galileo. We find from the accounts of César and Tacitus, note, Tacitus de Mor Germanorum, that the horses of Germany were formerly much inferior to those of Gaul, but the German breeds have in the present day greatly the advantage of the French. The change must be ascribed to the more careful and scientific management of the propagators in the former country. Perhaps it has arisen from the same care in the formation of breeds that we find among the varieties of dogs, one race remarkable for acute sight, another for fine scent, and a third of which the greater strength and weight of limbs point them out as fit for the purpose of nightly protection. The instinct varies in all these instances, as we might expect from analogy, with the peculiarities of organization. This principle seems in general to direct every animal to seek its subsistence in the way for which its corporeal structure happens best to qualify it. Accordingly, we find considerable diversities of instinct within the limits of the same species. If the same constraint were exercised over men, which produces such remarkable effects among the brute kinds, there is no doubt that its influence would be as great. But no despot has ever thought of amusing himself in this manner, or, at least, such an experiment has never been carried on upon that extensive scale, which might lead to important results. Note, something of this kind was indeed attempted by the kings of Prussia, but their project referred to stature. End of note. Certain moral causes, however, have an influence on mankind which appears in some degree to lead to similar ends. Note D. S. S. Smith of New Jersey in America, in an essay on the causes of variety in the figure and complexion of the human species, has made some ingenious remarks on this subject. End of note. The perception of beauty is the chief principle in every country which directs men in their marriages. It does not appear that the inferior tribes of animals have anything analogous to this feeling, but in the human kind it is universally implanted. It is very obvious that this peculiarity in the constitution of man must have considerable effects on the physical character of the race and that it must act as a constant principle of improvement, supplying the place in our own kind of the beneficial control which we exercise over the brute creation. This is probably the final cause for which the instinctive perception of human beauty was implanted by providence in our nature. For the idea of beauty of person is synonymous with that of health and perfect organization. In the ruder stages of society, the natural principles operate with more undisturbed energy. In all nations that have not attained a high degree of civilization and refinement, we find beauty to be the only qualification in the female to which the least value or importance is affixed. The effect, therefore, of this principle must be much greater and more conspicuous in barbarous communities than among civilized people but it is everywhere on a great scale of considerable moment. 
the disgust which instances of deformity naturally excite prevents the hereditary transmission of such peculiarities which would probably in many cases happen if deformed persons were generally married the greater examples of malconformation would be frequently found to be conjoined with sterility but that is not the case with lesser instances and these might be rendered general and perpetual if that evil were not guarded against by a provision of instinct among savage tribes the repugnance felt at the view of any deformed appearance in the human kind is so strong that it is said to be the general custom in such nations to destroy children which are imperfect in their figure the same practice prevailed among the lacedaemonians and several other nations of antiquity in countries where the people are divided into different ranks or orders of society which is almost universally the case the improvement of person which is the result of the above-mentioned cause will always be much more conspicuous in the higher than in the inferior classes the former are guided in their marriages as in all the other actions of life by their inclinations the latter are governed especially where servile subjection is established by the caprice of their superiors or by motives of convenience or necessity the noble families of modern persia were originally descended from a tribe of ugly and bald-headed mongols they have constantly selected for their harems the most beautiful females of circassia the race has been thus gradually ameliorated and is said now to exhibit fine and comely persons in states thus situated with respect to their political circumstances the inferior people must in many instances suffer deterioration while the higher rank improves this must constitute a very marked difference in the aspect of the two orders such diversity is everywhere observed it has been remarked where we should scarcely have looked for it viz among the barbarous islanders of the pacific captain cook in describing the people of owahi says the same superiority which is observed in the iris nobles in all other islands is found also here those whom we saw were without exception perfectly well formed whereas the lower sort besides their general inferiority are subject to all variety of make and figure that is seen in the populace of other countries note cook's last voyage book three the same observation is equally applicable to the inhabitants of most of the european countries since it appears that the prevalent idea of beauty acting as a constant principle upon one nation during a long time produces a remarkable effect it is to be supposed that if different standards prevailed in several countries their influence would tend to establish a considerable diversity it is probable that the natural idea of the beautiful in the human person has been more or less distorted in almost every nation peculiar characters of countenance in many countries accidentally enter into the ideal standard this observation has been made particularly of negroes of africa who are said to consider a flat nose and thick lips as principal ingredients of beauty and we are informed by pallas that the kalmuks note pallas voyage en siberie french translation end of note esteem no face as handsome which has not the eyes in angular position and the other characteristics of their race note humboldt's political essay on the kingdom of new spain volume one end of note the aztecs of mexico have ever preferred a depressed forehead which forms the strongest contrast to the majestic contour of the grecian busts the former represented their divinities with a head more flattened than it is ever seen among the caribs and the greeks on the contrary gave to their gods and heroes a still more unnatural elevation we do not attempt thus to account for all the peculiarities of these races for the variety in the opinion of beauty may be in some part the effect as well as the cause of national diversity 
but we adduce these instances to exemplify a principle the effects of which must as we conceive be very important and tend to widen if they have not in the first instance produced the physical differences of nations these remarks were so obviously connected with the observation made in the former page on the disposition manifested by all living species to assume varieties of figure and on the tendency which such varieties in the animal kingdom evince to become permanent in the race that we have ventured to follow them out though they have led us to digress in some measure from the order of our argument they will be useful in our inquiry concerning the nature of national diversities and may enable us to explain some peculiar appearances but they do not afford any direct solution of the question now before us which is whether the differences in form that are found to subsist between the european the ethiopian and the mongol or in general whether the greatest examples of such diversity which are observed in mankind are specific differences or only instances of deviation in order to solve this doubt we must adopt a more systematical method of inquiry with reference to the analogical reasoning proposed in the foregoing pages end of chapter two section one on diversities of form natural physiognomy etc part five of researches into the physical history of man this librivox recording is in the public domain read by john greenman section two continuation diversities in the cranium the most striking and important instance of a diversity in the human form is in the configuration of the skull physiologists have directed much of their attention to this variety and have invented several methods of classifying the peculiar appearances and reducing them to general principles it will not be necessary or useful to mention all the schemes which have been proposed for this purpose but three celebrated anatomists camper blumenbach and cuvier have contributed by their more successful researches to throw some light on this intricate part of our investigation it will therefore be worth while to consider briefly the different views which these authors have taken of the subject the first of them considered the form of the skull principally with reference to the varieties of expression which the diversities of its configuration impart to the countenance and to the supposed connection of the former with characters of mind note see camper's dissertation physique sur la différence réelle que présentant les traits du visage chez les hommes de différents pays et de différents villages utrecht seventeen ninety one translated from the dutch End of note. he observed in the antique busts a greater expansion of forehead than is found in any human head and discovered that this peculiar form has a principal share in imparting the elevated and dignified aspect for which the works of ancient statuary are celebrated after repeated and accurate examination he found that the difference of the busts and of heads in general in this particular may be measured with convenience and precision by means of two lines drawn on an ideal plane on which the profile is supposed to be projected and forming what this author and others who adopted his method have termed the facial angle one of the lines is determined by the meatus auditorius externus and the basis of the nose the other descends from the most advancing point of the forehead through the anterior edge of the alveolar process of the upper jaw the angle included between these lines contains in the heads of european people from eighty to ninety degrees in the antique busts it is considerably greater in the skull of the kalmuk according to camper it is about seventy five degrees and in that of the african negro only seventy degrees accordingly this author has remarked or fancied a proportional stupidity of expression in the countenances of the latter nations he extended the same principle to the examination of the lower tribes of animals 
and found a curious coincidence between the capacity of this angle in each and the share of sagacity which nature has distributed to their respective species his remarks on this subject have led to speculations which if they are not founded on a solid base of truth have at least much appearance of plausibility it has been supposed that a scale might be formed comprehending the whole animal kingdom in which the proportion of intellect should be everywhere measured and represented by the number of degrees contained by the facial angle this scheme is found to agree with facts it is indeed confirmed by some apparent exceptions the owl for example has a very wide facial angle and for this reason probably it was fixed upon by the ancients as emblematical of wisdom its habits however indicate but a scanty portion of sagacity and in this instance the rule of camper would appear to lead us into error but we find on nearer scrutiny that the unusual expansion of the frontal sinuses in this animal is the cause of the seeming deviation and that if in constituting our angle we take a line determined by the interior surface of the bone it turns out just as we should expect a priori and the owl is again degraded into its natural station of stupidity the brain may be considered under a double character as performing functions of different kinds it appears to be the instrument of thought for our intellectual faculties depend on the perfection of its structure as much as the sensitive powers on that of their respective organs and the mental processes are disturbed by its affections just as the faculties of sight and hearing are influenced by any injuries of the eye and ear but the brain serves also another purpose for the activity and power of the nerves of sensation are in great measure dependent on it and when any portion of it is compressed or disorganized the nerves which take their origin from the part diseased are wholly inefficient to the performance of their accustomed offices considering therefore the brain in this double point of view if we can discover in what proportion the powers of this organ are distributed to these different functions and what relative provision nature has made for the maintenance of each we may be supposed to have obtained a method of determining in what comparative degrees the individuals or the species to which the structure in question belongs are intellectual or merely sensitive with a view to the accomplishment of this design or of something analogous to it several different schemes have been proposed one of the first and rudest attempts was by a comparison of the capacity of the cranium with the bulk of the body the ratio of the former to the latter is in general greater in europeans than in negroes but this notion is evidently formed on very imperfect grounds and is fully refuted by the infinite diversity we every day observe in the dimensions of the head without any corresponding difference of mind a more specious method and one which approaches much nearer to the attainment of the object is pursued by considering the relative magnitude of the brain and medulla spinalis or in general of the brain and the nerves which derive their origin from it note suomering de basi encephali et originibus nervorum cranio egredientum lib five end of note it is found that the human brain is much larger in comparison with the nerves than that of inferior animals and that those species which possess the greatest share of sagacity are nearest in this respect to the conformation of man we thus obtain upon hypothetical grounds a solution of the problem above stated for if any portion of the brain be supposed in all the examples subjected to the comparison to be exclusively appropriated to the nerves and to be subservient to their function and the parts so disposed of be imagined to bear any given proportion in quantity to the nerves taken collectively the remainder may be regarded as reserved solely to be the instrument of our intellectual operations 
the varying proportion of the remainder thus estimated to the whole may thus become a measure of intellect the african is according to this criterion inferior to the european the theory of camper depends on a similar principle the greater quantity of the facial angle denotes greater elevation of the forehead and consequent capacity of the cranium and allows less space for the evolution of the organs of sense especially of those which acquire most remarkable perfection in the inferior animals and on a notion of the same kind the theory of sublime beauty which prevailed among the ancient artists seems to have been founded they endeavored to give the expression of intellect and of the higher characters of mind by advancing the front of the head and giving it a more capacious form and proportionally contracting the lower parts of the face and they pursued this idea to so great an extent that the statues of their gods and demigods present a majestic form indeed but differ widely from any thing which can have existed in nature but this method of professor camper even if we give full credit to the soundness of the principles on which it seems to be founded appears liable to objection as not fulfilling with precision the purpose at which it aims it ascertains the dimensions of the cranium in one direction only and the capacity of the cavity may vary laterally or behind without our having by this mode of measuring any notice of the difference on this account we should not form a correct estimate of the comparative magnitude of the brain which seems to be the scope of the invention but the deficiency in the scheme of camper has been supplied by cuvier the justly celebrated comparative anatomist note leçon d'anatomie comparée end of note this author proposes to make two sections of the cranium and bones of the face one of them vertical and the other longitudinal by measuring these sections we obtain the means of comparing the area of the head as occupied by the brain with that of the face which is the seat of the organs of sense it is supposed that we thus compare the intellectual with the sensitive structure in each animal the lower jaw is removed as not concerned in the calculation it is found accordingly that the area of the cranium is to the area of the face as four to one in the heads of europeans in the skulls of kalmuks the ratio of the facial area to that of the cranium is increased by one-tenth and in that of the african negro by one-fifth the proportion is thus placed in one view in europeans the area of the skull is to the area of the face four to one in kalmuks four to one point one in negroes four to one point two the proportion of the area of the cranium to that of the face is less in the orangutan and it decreases as we descend through the scale of animated beings nearly in the same gradation with the lessening of the facial angle the conclusion we arrive at by all these operations is that in the african and the kalmuk a greater provision is made in the conformation of the head for the perfection of the senses and less proportionally for the evolution of the intellectual organ than in europeans it is clear that the organs of sense have a more perfect structure in the two former races than in the latter and that the properties which we should infer from this peculiar organization are conjoined the native americans who resemble the kalmuks in the figure of the skull possess so acute a sense of smell note the peruvian indians says baron humboldt who in the midst of the night distinguish the different races by their quick sense of smell have formed three words to express the odor of the european the indian american and the negro they call the first pezuna the second posco and the third Grayo. humboldt essay on new spain End of note. that they are accustomed to follow their enemies through the desert by the guidance of the olfactory nerves and they have proportional perfection of hearing and the other senses the cavity of the nose has a remarkable amplitude in the negro 
and all the parts which are subservient to the sense of smelling have a singularly perfect conformation. The ossa surbinata superiora are larger and finely convoluted, presenting a more extensive surface for the expansion of the nervous membrane. The pterygoid processes have a larger and rougher surface, and the passage of the posterior nostrils is wider in the negro than in the white man. Note, Sommering on the comparative anatomy of the white man and negro. End of note. The Africans have accordingly, as it is universally remarked, a very perfect perception of odors. It is said on authority which appeared sufficient to celebrate it Haller, note, Haller, Eb Physiologie, that the Negroes in the Antilles can distinguish in pursuit the vestiges of black and white people by the sense of smell. It appears thus that the sensitive powers are greater in the other races of men than in the European but that the intellect is proportionally less is not so fully evident, though it is probable from the structure of the head, considered with reference to the analogy of other species. The only circumstance which prevents our receiving the latter conclusion as a fair analogical inference is that we are not sure whether a general rule deduced from the comparison of separate species can be properly applied to different races which may be tribes of the same species. Blumenbach, note, Blumenbach, de generis humani varietate nativa, also his decades craniorum, end of note. Blumenbach found many defects in the method of his predecessor Camper, of sufficient importance, as he thought, to require his rejecting it altogether. He observed that the description we obtain by it is not a constant character even in the same nation for the facial angle in the heads of negroes according to this author exhibits considerable variety and persons whose skulls are very different in many particulars have this angle similar which blumenbach says he found to be the case in the heads note ibid of a negro of congo and a native of lithuania this objection, however, holds against all general descriptions, for there is no peculiarity of form common among any nation, which is not occasionally seen in individuals of almost any other. But the principal defect in Camper's scheme is that it gives by far too partial a view of the subject, for there may be many very important diversities in the form of the cranium, which would pass wholly unnoticed by this method of measuring by lines. Blumenbach's mode of examination affords a much more ample and accurate view of the diversities of the cranium. It regards chiefly the form of the frontal and superior maxillary bones as giving the most important characters, and those on which the general description of the head principally depends. One author placed the skulls he wished to compare in a row on a table, together with the lower jaws, in such a manner that the cheekbones or zygomatic processes should all touch the same horizontal line. Then, directing his view to the vertex of each, he described all the peculiarities apparent on the front which it thus presented, and this method he called his vertical rule. This plan gives with considerable exactness the most remarkable points, but is still too confined to answer completely the purpose designed. Blumenbach, however, has not been confined by its restrictions, but has noticed other particulars not thus included. His description of the skulls belonging to the three great divisions of mankind, which have often been mentioned in the preceding observations, are so concisely and accurately drawn that we shall give a literal translation of them. Note, Blumenbach, de generis humani veritate nativa. End of note. 1. Of the Skull of the European The head is the most symmetrical form, almost round, the forehead of moderate extent. The cheekbones are rather narrow, without any projection, but having a direction downward from the molar process of the frontal bone. The alveolar edge round, the front teeth of either jaw placed perpendicularly. 2. Of the Mongol the head is almost square, 
the cheekbones projecting outwards, the nose flat, the space between the eyebrows and nasal bones nearly in the same horizontal plane with the cheekbones, the superciliary arches scarcely to be perceived, the nostrils narrow, the fossa maxillaris slightly marked, the alveolar edge in some degree rounded forwards, the chin slightly prominent. 3. Of the negro. The head narrow, compressed at the sides the forehead very convex, vaulted, the cheekbones projecting forwards, the nostrils wide, the foci maxillaris deeply marked behind the infraorbital foramen, the jaws lengthened, the alveolar edge narrow, long, elliptical, the front teeth of the upper jaw turned obliquely forwards, the lower jaw strong and large, the skull in general thick and heavy. Such is the description of the heads of three races of mankind, which differ most widely from each other. One author afterwards subjoins two others, appertaining to the Americans and the Malay people, the former of which has an intermediate character between the European and Mongolic, and the latter between the European and the Negro. The bones in general seem to form the basis on which the muscles, skin, and cellular substance rest, and to the position and shape of which they appear more or less to accommodate themselves. Hence, physiologists have commonly considered the varieties of the osseous fabric as the primary cause of the diversities of form, and have viewed the peculiar appearances of the soft parts as secondary and dependent on the former. This notion, however, is very evidently erroneous, for the formation of bones is constantly very much modified by the muscular system. On every part of the skeleton the impression of the muscles and tendons are very conspicuous, and these are not to be considered as imprinted after the ossific process has been completed, but as the characters which the bony structure receives before its different parts have become hardened and compacted together, being continually influenced by the external force from the earliest periods of its growth. It is very necessary to advert to this circumstance in our observations on the diversities of the form of the cranium. It is well known to anatomists that the muscular system is subject to frequent and remarkable varieties, and to such varieties as their principal and immediate causes we may refer many of the chief peculiarities in the figure of the bones which compose the skull. The principal differences which distinguish the cranium of the negro from that of the European may be traced to the general and leading character of lateral compression. The skull of the African receives on each side the pressure of very strong and large muscles, which have much greater bulk and force than those which correspond to them in other races of men. The temporal muscle rises very near the sagittal suture, and covers almost the whole of the parietal bone, and in passing under the zygomatic arch it forms a large mass of fleshy fiber, the whole greatly exceeding in magnitude, and consequently in power, the usual conformation of the same part in Europeans. Note, somering ubi supra. The masseter is remarkably thick and strong. The force of these muscles continually exerted before the hardening and completion of the bones cannot but produce great compression on the sides of the head. Elongation of the upper jaw and extension of the face downwards and forwards must be the consequence. Greater space will thus be afforded for the expansion of the nasal cavities and the evolution of the organ of smell. The forehead on the same principle would be rendered narrow, and the cheekbones would take a projection forwards, while the fossa maxillaris could not fail of being very deeply imprinted. Note, the same causes will perhaps explain the different positions of the foramen magnum in the skull of the European and Negro. In the latter it is rather more posteriorly situated, as was observed by Somering. End of note. In the head of the Mongol, the peculiar characters 
are of an opposite description. The cheekbones extend outwards, the cranium assumes a more square form, and its prominences exhibit a tendency to lateral projection. In a considerable degree, this different structure may be accounted for by the deficiency of the compressing force, which being excessive produces such remarkable effects on the head of the African. But the anatomy of the Mongol has not been very accurately investigated, and it is possible that we should discover, if we were better acquainted with it, many circumstances tending to elucidate its peculiarities. We have laid down what appear to be the leading characters of diversity in the form of the head exhibited by those races of mankind which most widely differ from each other in this respect. It remains to determine, as far as may be in our power, whether they are specific differences or not. If it appear that these are not such, a similar conclusion may be drawn, a fortiori, of all other diversities of the same kind of lesser note. In the first place, it may be remarked that, so far as the diversity depends on variety in the form and distribution of the muscles, it is very far from establishing the affirmative of the above question. For the muscular system is well known to be subject to infinite and perpetual variations. It would be extremely difficult to find two individuals exactly similar in this part of the corporeal fabric. Such diversities in the form of the bones, as can be referred to varieties of the muscles, must accordingly be considered as instances of common deviation. We venture to refer all the variety in the form of the cranium to the principle of deviation from the consideration of the two following arguments. First, the natural peculiarities which have been described in the foregoing pages are not constant characters confined to races, but appear sometimes promiscuously. It is not a very rare occurrence to meet with individuals in this country, and descended from our own indigenous race, who have a form of head resembling that of the Mongol, or Negro. Blumenbach, who is inclined to insist strongly on the constancy of the description he wishes to establish, in opposition to Camper, nevertheless allows the existence of such exceptions. He observes that, note, Quanquam enim nulla gentilitia nationem forma tam constans et perpetua sit, quin multimodis lucibus deflectat, ut vi coacti, inter nostrates europeos passim aetiopicum habitum, aut culmucicum referentes vidiamus. Blumenbach, Collegio Craniorum. End of note. No peculiar national form is so constant and perpetual, but that it varies in many instances, as, for example, we may everywhere find among our European kindred persons who resemble in figure the Ethiopian or Kalmuk. We find examples of approximation towards the European model among the nations who have a different conformation, still more strongly marked and extensive than the instances of the contrary deviation in our own race. Note, many tribes of the Negro race approach very near to the form of Europeans. The Jalofs of Guinea, according to Park, are very black, but they have not the characteristic features of the Negro, the flat nose and thick lips. And Dampier assures us that the natives of Natal in Afrique have very good limbs, are oval-visaged, that their noses are neither flat nor high, but very well proportioned. Their teeth are white, and their aspect is altogether graceful. The same author informs us that their skin is black and their hair crisped. Dampier's Voyages Nor are other instances of this diversity more constant. In the native race of Americans, some tribes are found who differ not in the characters in question from Europeans. Under 54 degrees 10 minutes of north latitude, says Humboldt, at Cloak Bay, in the midst of copper-colored Indians, with small, long eyes, there is a tribe with large eyes, European features, and a skin less dark than that of our peasantry. 
Humboldt, Essay on En Spain, translated. End of note. The difference of the facial angle, if it were constant, would seem to afford more reason for the opinion of specific diversity than any other variety. But the elevation of the forehead, and the position of the meatus auditorius, and consequently this angle, exhibits great differences in the natives of this country, and probably in many examples would be found to agree with those of the Ethiopians. Blumenbach observed the angle to be the same in the head of a negro and a native of Lithuania. The authors, whose opinions we have been considering, in constituting their rules of comparison, have sought for the most strongly marked examples of each class which present the widest diversity, and have passed by those as unfit for their purpose in which the characters in question appeared blended and intermixed. But that such instances are not unfrequent in nature, every man may be convinced without looking far for opportunities of observation. Whatever varieties appear in individuals may, in favorable circumstances, become national, from the hereditary character of natural peculiarities. Secondly, several species of brute animals exhibit similar diversities in the figure of the cranium, but much greater in degree than the most remarkable examples which occur in mankind. Such is the difference in the skulls of the wild boar and domestic hog. Note, as remarked by Blumenbach, de gen hum var nat. The heads of the fine breeds of racehorses in this country are very different from those of the draft horses. Blumenbach has observed that the skull of the Neapolitan horse differs much more remarkably from that of the breed of Hungary, which is noted for its shortness and for the length of the lower jaw, than the head of the negro differs from that of the European. Note Ibid. The wild horse, also, from which the domesticated races originate, has a large head in proportion than the tame, and the forehead has a remarkably round or arched form. Note pedant hist quad. The urus or orox, which has been generally held to be the stock of our common oxen, has the fossa lacrimalis remarkably deep. The latter are destitute of any trace of it. Note. It must not, however, be omitted that the generally received opinion, which makes the urus or orox the wild representative of our domestic cattle, has lately been controverted by a naturalist of the first celebrity, namely by M. Cuvier. This author has described the fossil skull of an animal of the ox tribe, which he conceives to have been the true prototype of the domesticated breeds, and to have become extinct in its natural condition. It differs considerably, according to Cuvier, from that of the urus. It is certain that the ancients were acquainted with two wild animals of this tribe, viz. the urus and the bison, and that one of them has perished. Pliny distinguishes them, and Seneca mentions them both in the following lines. Tibi dant variae pectora tigres, tibi willosi terga bisontes, latisque feri cornibus uri. Seneca, Hippol. Si cuvier sur les eaux officiles de Ruminaus. Anal de Musée d'Histoire Nat de Paris, tome 12. End of note. The variety observed in the fowls of Padua is very remarkable, and much greater than any difference of the cranium in our own kind. The upper portion of the skull is dilated into a shell of hemispherical form, full of small holes. The whole cavity of the dilated bone is filled with an unusual abundance of the cerebral substance. Note, Pallas specileg, zoolg, fasci, four. End of note. Such being the diversities found in the skulls of animals which are undoubtedly of the same species, we may conclude, from the analogous reasoning which we have adopted as our principal guide, 
as well as from the other argument stated above, that the varieties observed in the form of the human cranium are not specific differences. End of section 2. Continuation. Diversities in the Cranium. Part 6 of Researches into the Physical History of Man, read by John Greenman. Section 3. Continuation. Other Diversities of Figure. The other diversities of form are of minor importance, and afford much less appearance of argument against the unity of species than those we have mentioned. There are none of which we have not clearly established instances among Europeans. In some instances, the skeletons of negroes have been found to have six lumbar vertebrae. Note, Somering, Ubi Supra, and Camper's Demonstraciones Anatomico Pathologe, Lib. 2. End of note. The same variety occurs in the natives of our own country, and some examples of it have fallen under my own observation. The ribs in the negro are said to be larger and more incurvated than they generally are with us, and in some instances the eighth rib approaches more nearly to the sternum, in others it is attached to it. Note, Zomering, Ibid, Camper, Ibid. End of note. Somering assures us that he has seen the same variety in Europeans. The sesamoid bones in the foot and the osa triquetra in the head are more frequent in the negro than in the European. In some of the varieties it appears that the generality of negroes approach more nearly to the structure of the ape than the generality of Europeans. But if we consider individuals there is no such approximation for all these examples of variety occur also among our own people. Those writers, therefore, make a very unauthorized inference, who conclude from such instances that the negro is an intermediate species between the white man and those tribes of brutes which most resemble the human form. Note. See White's essay on the gradation of the human species. This most absurd hypothesis that the negro is the connecting link between the white man and the ape, took its rise from the arbitrary classification of Linnaeus, which associates man and the ape in the same order. The more natural arrangement of later systems separates them into the biminous and the quadraminous orders. If this classification had been followed, it would not have occurred to the most fanciful mind to find in the negro an intermediate link. End of note. Some differences have also been observed in the usual proportion of parts in Europeans and Africans. It is said, although not sufficiently ascertained, that the dimensions of the female pelvis in comparison with the male are greater in the majority of the latter people than in the majority of the former. Note, Sommerling Ibid. The fingers and forearms are longer in proportion to the os humeri in negroes than in the generality of other men. Note White's essay. Much greater varieties than any of these are found in the form and proportion of parts in many other species of animals. The different breeds of horses and cattle in our own country afford many examples. In some parts of Britain the sheep and oxen have horns. In others they are entirely destitute of them. A breed of fowls with five claws and another without rumps are very common in the south of England. It is wonderful what a variety with regard to the production of horns many animals exhibit. No example of diversity in the species can be more striking than that which is exhibited by the comparison of the polyceratus Cretan sheep with the hornless English breed. Several instances have occurred of hares of the common species having horns in form resembling those of the roebuck. Note, Pennant's History of Quadrupeds. With regard to the proportion of parts, Blumenbach observes that there is a great difference between the Arabian and the German horses, and between the tall oxen of the Cape of Good Hope and the short-legged breeds of England. Note, Blumenbach, de gen hum var nat. The hogs of Normandy have the hind legs much longer than the forelegs. 
the animals of other countries exhibit greater instances of diversity in the form of parts than those of our own a remarkable variety of the hog has been noticed by naturalists from the time of aristotle and pliny it has the hoof entire and undivided this race is not unfrequent in some parts of england professor pallas gives the following curious description of the race of sheep which he found among the kirkuses and which retain as he observes their peculiar form when removed into very different climates and situations on ne trouve nulle part des moutons aussi gros ni aussi difformes que ceux qui gris ils sont plus élevés qu'un veau naissant et fort pressant ils ressemblent un peu pour les proportions aux moutons des indes ils ont la tête très bosselée des grandes oreilles pendantes la lèvre inférieure dévance beaucoup la supérieure la plupart ont une ou deux verrues couvertes de poils qui leur pendent au cou au lieu de cul ils ont un gros peloton de graisse rond presque sans laine au-dessus les culs des gros moutons pesant trente ou quarante livres et donnent vingt ou trente livres de suif note palace voyage en sibérie traduction française End of note. The same author remarks the astonishing diversities which are found in the Galanaceous tribe. E voluclibus altilibus varietatum numero et insigni discrepantia certe eminent gallinae, habentur magnae, minutae, procerae, pumilitones cristarum paruitate, vel multiplicitate, aut tiaris plumacies insignes, urhopigur carentes, flauipides, plumipides, habentur toto corpore reversis plumis hirsutae, immo in India nascitur varietas plumis lanuginosis albis vestita, et cute per totum corpus nigra, et hae omnes, exceptis indicis, in numera colorum diversitate ludunt. Note, Pallas, Specileg, Zoologue, Fascia, 4. End of note. A communication has lately been made to the Royal Society of a curious example of variety in sheep springing up de novo and perpetuated in the stock. A ram of the variety was originally produced on a farm in Connecticut in New England in 1791. The ewes impregnated by this animal sometimes produced the new variety, sometimes not. By degrees a considerable number of them were produced and the breed was regularly propagated it was called the ancon sheep from the word Hancon. the name being derived from the characteristic form of the forelegs which were bent like an elbow both hind and forelegs were very short but particularly the latter note the skeleton was compared by sir everett home with that of the smallest Welsh sheep. The bone of the foreleg of an Ancon sheep, weighing 45 pounds, was thicker, but not so long, as that of a Welsh sheep, scarcely one quarter of the weight. The joints of the Ancon sheep were looser knit, and the animal more feeble than usual. This sheep was propagated because it was unable to get over the fences and injure the corn. A letter from Colonel Humphreys of Connecticut to Sir John Banks, see Dr. Thompson's Annals of Philosophy, number two. End of note. The same arguments which were used in the foregoing pages on the subject of diversities in the cranium authorize our drawing a similar inference with respect to other differences of figure. On the whole, we seem to arrive by fair and lawful steps at this general conclusion that none of the varieties of figure hitherto observed among men are of such a kind as to give the least reason for the opinion of specific diversity. End of section 3. Continuation. Other diversities of figure. Part 7 of Researches into the Physical History of Man, read by John Greenman. Section 4, Continuation, Some Curious Instances of Deviation. 
Some curious deviations have occurred in our own time, and among races of men with whose history we are acquainted, which tend to evince that we may have a much greater degree of security in answering our proposed question in the negative than we could acquire in affirming any similar example of diversity to be original. For the instances we allude to are more singular and less analogous to the common deviations of species than any of those which are national, and which have induced some authors to suppose that the people characterized by them must have possessed such peculiarities from the era of their first creation. And if these varieties had occurred in a different period of society, and among circumstances conspiring to favor their distinct propagation, which is obviously possible, we should have found races of men much more different from ourselves than any which now exist, and therefore affording stronger argument for diversity of kind. One example of this description is recorded in the Philosophical Transactions. An account of it was first given in the year 1731, and the subject was resumed twenty-four years afterwards. Note, Philos Transact, number 424. End of note. On the former of these periods, a boy fourteen years of age was brought by Mr. Matchin, one of the secretaries from the neighborhood of Euston Hall in Suffolk, his native place, and exhibited to the Royal Society. His body was covered by a remarkable kind of intentment, which is thus described in the minutes drawn up by Matchin. His skin, if it might be so called, seemed rather like a dusky-colored thick case, exactly fitting every part of his body, made of a rugged bark or hide with bristles in some places which case covering the whole excepting the face the palms of the hands and the soles of the feet caused an appearance as if those alone were naked and the rest clothed it did not bleed when cut or sacrificed being callous and insensible it was said he sheds it once every year about autumn at which time it usually grows to the thickness of three-quarters of an inch, and then is thrust off by a new skin which is coming up underneath. It was not easy to think of any sort of skin or natural integument that exactly resembled it. Some compared it to the bark of a tree, others thought it looked like seal skin, others like the skin of an elephant, or the skin about the legs of the rhinoceros, and some took it to be like a great wart, or number of warts, uniting and overspreading the whole body. The bristly parts, which were chiefly about the belly and flanks, looked and rustled like the bristles or quills of a hedgehog, shorn off within an inch of the skin. The second account of this person was communicated by the Royal Society by H. Baker. He was at that time forty years of age, and had been shown in London by the name of the Porcupine Man. He is described as being a good-looking, well-shaped man of a florid countenance, and when his body and hands are covered, seems nothing different from other people, but except his head and face, the palms of his hands and bottoms of his feet, his skin is all over covered in the same manner as in the year 1731, which, therefore, continues Mr. Baker, I shall trouble you with no other description of than what you will find in Mr. Matchin's account above mentioned, only begging leave to observe that this covering seemed to me most nearly to resemble an innumerable company of warts, of a dark brown color, and a cylindrical figure, rising to a like height, and growing as close as possible to one another but so stiff and elastic that when the hand is drawn over them they make a rustling sound. When I saw this man in the month of September last, they were shedding off in several places and young ones of a paler brown observed succeeding in their room, which he told me happens annually in some of the autumn or winter months, and then he is commonly let blood to prevent some little sickness which he else is subject to, whilst they are falling off. 
At other times he is incommoded by them no otherwise than by the fretting out his linen, which he says they do very quickly, and when they come to their full growth, being then in many places near an inch in length, the pressure of the clothes are troublesome. He has had the smallpox, and been twice salivated, in hopes of getting rid of this disagreeable covering, during which disorders the warting came off, and his skin appeared white and smooth, like that of other people, but on his recovery soon became as it was before. His health at other times has been very good during his whole life. But the most extraordinary circumstance of this man's story, and indeed the only reason for my giving you this trouble, is that he has had six children all with the same rugged covering as himself. The first appearance whereof in them, as well as in him, came on in about nine weeks after birth. Only one of them is living, a very pretty boy, eight years of age, whom I saw and examined with his father, and who is exactly in the same condition. It appears, therefore, past all doubt, says Mr. Baker, that a race of people may be propagated by this man, having such rugged coats or coverings as himself, and if this should ever happen, and the accidental original be forgotten, it is not improbable they might be deemed a different species of man. Note, Phil Transact, Volume 49, Part 1, 5. End of note. Morpertuis has recorded another instance of variety of structure not less remarkable than the example we have mentioned. He assures us that there were two families in Germany who had been distinguished for several generations by six fingers on each hand, and the same number of toes on each foot. Jacob Rue, a surgeon of Berlin, was a member of one of these families, and marked by their peculiarities, which he inherited from his mother and grandmother. His mother was married to a man of the ordinary make. She bore him eight children, of whom four resembled the father, and the other four partook of the mother's confirmation. Jacob Rue transmitted his supernumerary members to his posterity. Note, Maupertuis, Venus Physique. End of note. Raumur mentions a family which had a similar peculiarity, but whether this be another example or one of those recorded by Maupertius, I know not. The grandfather had a supernumerary finger on each hand and an additional toe on each foot. His eldest son had three children with the same peculiarity. The second, who had the usual number of fingers, but in whom the thumb was very thick and appeared as if composed of two united together, had three daughters with the supernumerary members. The third had the natural structure. A daughter with a very thick thumb brought forth a son with the additional finger. Note, this variety has frequently occurred. Instances are recorded among the ancients. Pliny says, Digiti quibus dam in manibus seni, ca horati ex patricie gente filias duas ob it se digitas appellatas accepimus, et vulcatium se digitum illustrem in poetica. Hist nat lib eleven cap ninety nine. The six fingered variety springs up sometimes among the negroes in the West India Islands. Dr. Gibson, author of an inaugural dissertation in which are many curious and original observations, says that he has met with such instances in all the examples which occurred to his notice, except one, the little finger and toe were redundant. In one case a thumb and great toe were supernumerary. Dr. Gibson, Dissert Inog, Edind, 1809, De Forma Cranorium Gentilicia. Mr. Haslam, apothecary to Bethlehem Hospital, in his treatise on insanity, says that he is acquainted with a person in London whose middle and ring fingers are united and act as one. All the children of this man carry the same defect. Haslam on madness. End of note. End of section 4. Continuation. Some curious instances of deviation.
Part eight of Researches into the Physical History of Man. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain, read by John Greenman. Section five of Diversities of Stature. The same reasoning which we have adopted with regard to the varieties of figure are also fully applicable to those of stature. A considerable difference certainly exists in this respect among the several races of men, although there has without doubt been a great mixture of exaggeration in the accounts we have received from some travelers of the prodigious stature of Patagonians, it is ascertained by sufficient testimony that the natives of the southern extremity of the American continent and some of the inhabitants of Terra del Fuego are considerably taller than the generality of men in this country. Commodore Byron seems to have been somewhat terrified by the aspect of these people and probably suffered his imagination, aided by his fears, to pervert the accuracy of his judgment. He tells us that few of the Patagonians, and it appears that he saw and conversed with many hundreds, were much shorter than seven feet high. It must be observed, however, that he did not measure them. Captain Wallace afterwards went to the same part of the coast and saw many of the Indians, he adopted the precaution of accuracy which his predecessor had neglected he tells us accordingly that he saw one man six feet seven inches high several men six feet five or six inches but that the stature of the greater part was from five feet ten to six feet note hawksworth voyages it does not appear that we have well-authenticated accounts of any race of men smaller in stature than the Skrelings or Greenlanders. These are generally under five feet. We have much greater differences than this among the natives of our own country, and even sometimes in the children of the same family. It is not a very rare occurrence to meet with two brothers who differ as widely as the Skrelings and Patagonians. In Ireland, many examples of gigantic stature have appeared, far exceeding that of the latter people, and dwarfs have been well known in every age and in every country. Such varieties, though springing up in a family of opposite character, are generally hereditary, and therefore may, as we have observed before of other diversities, become national a curious proof of the effect which may be produced in consequence of the hereditary nature of great stature is to be found in a fact related by dr r forster it is well known that the kings of prussia have had a capricious partiality for gigantic soldiery their guards have consisted of the tallest men they could procure collected from all quarters a regiment of these huge warriors was stationed as dr forster informs us for fifty years at Potsdam. A great number of the present inhabitants of that place are of a very high stature, which is more especially striking in the numerous gigantic figures of women. This certainly is owing to the connections and intermarriages of the tall men with the females of that town. Note Dr. R. Forster's observations in a voyage round the world with Captain Cook. End of note. Without searching beyond the boundaries of our own country, we find abundant examples of diversity in bulk and stature in the brute species greater than any known among men. Such are furnished by the different breeds of horses and cattle. In foreign countries we find more considerable differences. In the island of Celebes, a variety of the buffalo is said to be found which is of the size of a common sheep. Note, penance hist quadrup. End of note. There is also a variety of the horse in Ceylon, which is not more than thirty inches high. Note, ibid. Therefore we conclude that the diversity of stature is very far from constituting a specific difference. End of section five of diversities of stature. Part nine of Researches into the Physical History of Man. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain, read by John Greenman. Section six of the hair. The short, crisp hair of the negro 
and the long, lank hair of the Americans and Kalmuks are so different from that of Europeans that some writers have hence drawn an argument in favor of the hypothesis we are combating. The hair of the Negro is the greatest anomaly of this kind that presents itself. Its short and curled appearance gives it some resemblance to the covering of the sheep. From this loose analogy it has received the term of wool in common discourse, and as names react upon opinions it has hence been generally considered as a growth of the same sort with the excrescence produced by that animal. But no person who should take the trouble of comparing the hair of an African with the wool of a sheep would hesitate in rejecting this notion. The principal circumstance which distinguishes hair and wool is in the surface of the filament, which in wool is rough, and therefore that substance admits of felting, but in hair it is smooth and polished. The filament of the former is besides unequal in size, and rather larger towards the end. On the contrary, that of the latter is nearly uniform in thickness, tapering a little towards the point. The hair of the African has no resemblance to wool in either of these respects. It consists, indeed, of finer filaments than that of Europeans, which arise from smaller bulbs or roots, but it appears in other particulars to be a production of the same kind. But if the head of the negro were really covered with proper wool, we should not allow it to be a specific difference, since other species of animals exist of which some tribes are clothed with wool and others with hair. Professor Pallas informs us that the sheep of the Kirgus Kaisaks have strong hair intermixed with coarse wool. He adds that, into whatever countries the breed may be removed, its peculiarities continue permanent. Note, Pallas, Voy en Sebiri, Tom 1. End of note. Blumenbach has remarked the contrast of the flocks of Tibet with those of Ethiopia. The climate of these regions is not very different, and the nature of the country in each is pretty much the same. Both abound in mountainous districts. Yet the sheep of the former are covered with very fine wool, and those of the latter with coarse hair. The Argali, or wild Siberian sheep, which is believed by our best naturalists to be the original stock from which all the domestic varieties of the sheep are derived, is covered with hair, which in the summer is close like that of the deer, but in winter becomes rough and curled, resembling a coarse wool intermixed with hair. Note, Pallas, Spicileg, Zoologica. The American bison, which seems to be a variety of the urus, and is believed to be of the stock of our domestic cattle, is covered in the winter with a long shaggy fleece of a woolly nature, which falls down over the head and foreparts of the animal. This fleece sometimes weighs eight pounds, and is so fine in texture that it is spun into cloths, gloves, etc., which have the appearance of these manufactured from the finest wool of the sheep. In summer it is almost naked, particularly on the hindquarters. Note Penance Arctic Zoology. Some varieties of dogs, as the water spaniel, are covered with a short curly texture very much like wool. These observations are sufficient to show that the crisp hair of the African is no sort of proof that he is of different species from the European. It is worth while to remark that the peculiar hair of the Negro is not a permanent variety or distinction of the whole race of Africa. For the Kaffirs and the people of Congo have hair not unlike that of Europeans. Even the Fulas, one of the Negro tribes of Guinea, have, according to Mr. Park, soft, silky hair. Note, Park's travels in Africa. On the other hand, the inhabitants of many other countries resemble the Africans in their hair as the savages of New Guinea, Van Diemen's Land, and Malikolo. And in the same island some of the people are found with crisp and woolly, others with straight hair, as in some of the New Hebrides. In New Holland there are tribes of each character 
though resembling in other particulars. Note, see below, Hist of South Sea Islanders. Some of the finest manufacturers of India are formed of the covering of the goat. End of note. With regard to the texture of the hair in general, it is sufficient to observe that it is much more different in other species than in the several races of men. The breeds of hogs, of goats, and of dogs afford sufficient examples. Therefore, in this circumstance, there can exist no specific diversity. We have thus taken a sufficiently ample view of the principal examples of diversity in physical characters which have been observed in the several races of mankind. Whatever other instances may be found are of inferior importance to those we have mentioned, and less in the degree of their deviation, and the conclusions which we form concerning the greater will hold a fortiori of others which are less. All the varieties to which we have adverted in the foregoing pages appear to be strictly analogous to the changes which other tribes through almost the whole animal creation have a general tendency to assume. We are therefore compelled, in obedience, to the most firmly established laws of philosophical reasoning, to refer these similar phenomena to similar causes, and to consider all the physical diversities of mankind as depending on the principle of natural deviation and as furnishing no specific distinction. One accessory argument tending to the like conclusion which has incidentally appeared in the course of our analogical reasoning has been separately noticed those instances of variety which have been thought to lead most forcibly to the doctrine of distinct species in mankind and to be the most insuperable difficulties on the contrary opinion are the diversities of figure but the varieties of form are less permanent in mankind than those of color, and there is none of them so general in any race of men that it is not in many examples wanting. End of section 6 of The Hare Part 10 of Researches into the Physical History of Man This LibriVox recording is in the public domain, read by John Greenman. Chapter 3. Inquiry Whether All Mankind Are of One Race or Stock. Section 1. Method of Inquiry. If it should appear to be a highly probable conclusion that the whole genus of man contains but one species, none of the diversities of nations being such as to constitute specific characters, it may still appear to be uncertain whether all the races into which the genus is separated derive their origin from one stock or are the progeny of the same first parents. Some persons may withhold their assent from such a proposition as requiring distinct confirmation, and to others the contrary hypothesis may appear more specious. Various parts of the earth may be imagined to have been covered at once with infinite numbers of each individual kind both of animals and vegetables and it may be supposed that the human species was together with the inferior tribes produced primarily and separately in many different regions in support of such a conjecture it has been alleged that islands have been discovered so far distant from all other land that it is difficult to imagine any mode in which they could be provided with plants animals and human inhabitants, unless we suppose all these to be indigenous. For the people who are found in such abodes are, for the most part, rude barbarians, ignorant of navigation, except of the most imperfect kind, who could not therefore have transported themselves to their present seats from far distant shores. Much less could they have conveyed with them the other productions of nature in which these regions abound we must then rest satisfied that such races are aboriginal, or that they sprang into existence together with the forests through which they roam, and the various brutes which share with them the possession of the soil. In order fully to elucidate this subject in the most extensive view, it would be necessary to enter into some discussions 
which belonged to the province of the natural historian. It would be an interesting inquiry to determine whether Providence has confined the existence of every species of living being to the creation of a single stock or family of each in the first instance, and to its subsequent multiplication and dispersion, or has chosen to replenish the earth at once with multitudes of all kinds. To attempt the solution of this problem in its most general statement would lead us very far from our present object. If it were requisite to inquire into the condition of the vegetable world in this particular, there would not be wanting arguments in favor of the former hypothesis, which appears indeed at the first aspect most simple and most comfortable to the general tenor of nature. The fact that regions distantly separated from the rest of the world, as Australasia, are found to be occupied by vegetable creations distinct and peculiar to each, tends to establish this opinion. But to refrain from speculations too extensive, and which might appear to be irrelevant to our present pursuit, we shall avoid entering into any inquiry concerning the history of the vegetable tribes and the inferior classes of animals. Fishes and the cetacea are evidently removed from our scrutiny by their abode in the boundless ocean, which affords them free access to all distant regions, and birds possess so unlimited powers of locomotion that it is scarcely possible to determine anything with regard to their migrations. We shall therefore confine our inquiry for the most part to the mammifera species, which inhabit the land, and shall endeavor to discern the general tendency of facts and observations which relate to their dispersion over the globe. If we are fortunate enough to discover what is the law by which nature has been governed in the production of these, we shall proceed to inquire whether there be any obstacle which may prevent our applying the general inference with conclusive force in the individual case of the human species. Of the two hypotheses above proposed, the former may be considered as established, if we shall observe that every existing species may be traced with probability to a certain point, which appears to have been originally its only abode, and that few or no species have been found in countries separated from their primary seats by barriers which their locomotive powers and peculiar structure do not enable them to surmount. If the contrary hypothesis be true, we shall expect to discover each kind in every region, the temperature of which is suitable to its nature, and to observe that all animals are scattered over all parts of the earth without reference to stocks or families and to the facilities of migration. End of section 1. Methods of Inquiry Part 11 of Researches into the Physical History of Man. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain, read by John Greenman. Section 2 of the Local Relations of Genera. We may remark in the first place that not only particular species, but whole genera seem in a variety of instances to have certain appropriate seats, or to speak more distinctly, that those leading characters in the organization of several species, which, being common to all of them, constitute them a genus or family, are very frequent in some countries, while they are rare or have no existence in other parts of the earth. Of this observation we have many striking proofs in the present state of zoological science, and it is very probable that these will be greatly multiplied, as our own acquaintance with the animal kingdom shall advance, and as we succeed in accommodating our classification to the departments which nature has established. One of the most eminent naturalists of the present age has remarked that when we acquire a sufficiently accurate knowledge of the animals of each order or family to enable us to arrange the species contained in it according to their true generic relations, we almost always find that each genus appropriates to itself some peculiar and distinct abode. Thus the bat tribe presented till lately nothing but confusion, 
and we found species nearly allied in the systems of zoologists scattered indiscriminately through distant parts of the world these animals are however widely distinguished by nature and the enlightened labor of geoffroy has succeeded in arranging them according to their natural affinities note description des roussettes et des cephalotes de nouveaux genres de la famille des chauves souris par m geoffroy saint hilaire annuel du muséum de l'histoire naturelle de paris tome quatorze end of note we now discover that one large genus the terapus and the kindred tribe of cephalotes which are frugivorous and of gentle habits distribute their numerous species to the different islands and shores of the indian ocean while the villostomata a genus consisting of nine species and including the vampires and other sanguinary monsters of this family are confined to the hot parts of the western continent note memoire sur les philostomes et les megadermes par le même ibid End of note. a similar observation may be made concerning the family of lemurs all these animals were formerly confounded under one definition which only applied to a part of them geoffroy has shown that the five distinct genera belong to this tribe which are discriminated by clearly marked generic characters of these the indris and makis consisting together of ten species are natives of madagascar the loris genus contains four species which are found in bengal java and ceylon the galago is peculiar to senegal and the tarsier inhabit Makassar, amboina and the most remote islands of the indian ocean note magasin encyclopedique tome set memoire sur les espèces du genre lori par m geoffroy saint hilaire annal du muse dis nat tome quatorze end of note the fate of the sorex tribe is exactly parallel this name in the linnaean arrangement was made to include several species which belong to other families when such are excluded the remainder distribute themselves naturally into four genera the proper shrews of which there are ten species and the migale are found in different parts of europe and asia the chrysochloris is confined to the cape of good hope and the scallops to north america Note, Mémoire sur les espèces des gendres musaraignes et migales par Geoffroy saint hilaire Annal du Muséum, tome 14. See also Cuvier's Tableau élémentaire d'animaux. End of note. Some leading characters in the nature and constitution of animals appear to distinguish the tribes, which belong respectively to the great eastern and western continents buffon has remarked that all the largest quadrupeds are confined to the eastern hemisphere and are unknown in america such are the elephants rhinoceroses the hippopotamus camelopardalis and camel various animals of huge bulk have indeed been found in america in the fossil state but among those which at present exist there is none of very considerable magnitude in that continent it may also be observed that the more perfect tribes of animals belong chiefly to the old world the quadrupeds of the new continent have in general a character of organization which places them lower in the scale of animated nature the most ferocious species of carnivorous animals are confined to asia and africa those kinds in america which most approximate to these are in general much more feeble in their make and more gentle in their dispositions the most vigorous and active quadrupeds belong chiefly to the old continent as most of the ox and horse kinds the whole tribe of antelopes including upwards of thirty species and the goat kind on the other hand in america we find most of those singular races which are arranged in the department of edentata according to the natural classification and in the linnaean order of bruta thus of the family of tardigrada or sloths two species are yet in existence viz the ai and unau or moradipus tridactylus and didactylus of linnaeus 
Two other creatures of the same family are only known to us by their fossil remains, of which the smaller, or the megalonyx, was of the size of an ox, and the other called the megatherium as large as the rhinoceros. Note, même sur le megalonyx par M. Cuvier, annale du Museume, tome 5, même sur la megatherium par la même, ibid. End of note. It is remarkable, as M. Cuvier observes, that the relics of these animals have only been observed in America, which is also the peculiar region of the living species of the same genus. Note, M. Cuvier observes that the Bradipus ursinus, which was represented as belonging to the Old World, is yet too little known to be considered as an exception. When it becomes better known, there is little doubt that it will appear to be very different from the sloth tribe. Anal du Museum, Tom Sank, page 190. End of note. Buffon characterizes this tribe as defective. Note, tout en eau, says the Count de Buffon, nous rappelle ces monstres par défaut. Ces ébauches imparfaites, mille fois projetées, excutées par la nature, qui ayant à peine la faculté d'exister, n'ont dû subsister qu'un temps et on était depuis effacé de la liste des êtres. Buffon, East Nat. M. Cuvier observes of the species still existing that we find in them so little relation to ordinary animals, the general laws of organized beings at present existing apply so little to them, the different parts of their bodies seem so much in contradiction to the laws of coexistence which we find established through almost the whole animal kingdom, that we might really believe them to be the remains of another order of things, the living relics of that pre-existing nature, the other ruins of which are only discovered in the interior of the earth, and that these have escaped by some miracle the catastrophes which have destroyed their contemporary species. Annal du Museum, Tom Sank End of note. Buffon characterizes this tribe as defective monsters, rude and imperfect attempts of nature. The fossil animals of the last mentioned genus approximate in some particulars to the Myrmecophaga, another tribe of the same order, which recedes from the common characters of quadrupeds in many respects, but particularly in being totally destitute of teeth. These three species are known belonging to this genus, which are only found in America. The armadillos, Dasipus, form another genus belonging to the order of Edentata, and consisting of many species. These have grinding teeth, but want the canine and cutting teeth, and are in other respects a most singular tribe of animals. They also are peculiar to America, but New Holland presents us with a class of animals which form the lowest grade in the scale of warm-blooded quadrupeds. These are the ornithorynchi. Three animals of this family have been discovered in Australasia, and it is not improbable that the same region may contain many kindred races as yet unknown. Two of these creatures have been examined anatomically, and appear to form two genera of a tribe most singularly characterized which, though true quadrupeds, are not mammiferous, and bear a resemblance in some respects to birds, in others to the amphibia. They may be considered as an intermediate link between aves, amphibia, and mammalia. The nearest approach to them is the genus Myrmecophaga, from which, however, they are separated at a very remote distance. Note, home, in Philosophical Transactions, 1802, Lamarck, Zoologie Philosophique, Tome 2, Addenda. End of note. Another very curious example of the separate distribution of animals is found in the regions last mentioned, I mean the numerous tribe which belong to the order Pedimena, or to that class of quadrupeds which differ so remarkably from all the other mammalia in the premature production of their young and in the provision which nature has made for maintaining this anomaly. The first discovered animals with the abdominal pouch were found in South America, and received the descriptive name of Didelfis, 
This genus is known to extend to nine species at least, all of which inhabit the same country. Note Geoffroy Saint Hilaire, Anne du Muséum, Tome Trois. End of note. But the marsupial tribe are not confined to America. Six new genera of the same family have been already seen in New Holland, which contain together more than forty species. All these are possessed by the abdominal pouch. The names affixed to the genera are Dasiurus, Phalangista, Fitaurus, Peralmalis, Canjurus, and Fescolomis. Note. See several memoirs by M. Geoffroy in the Annals of the Museum. End of note. The Daedalfees of America have been confounded by the Dutch and English naturalists with the Dasiuri of Australasia. These two genera differ, however, essentially. The former have four incisor teeth more than the latter, viz. ten in the upper jaw and eight in the lower, while the Dasiuri have only eight above and six below. Note Cuvier sur le squelette du Sarigne, Anne du Muséum, tome V. End of note. The tails of the former are long, scaly, and prehensile, answering the purpose of a fifth limb in enabling the animal to climb trees. The tails of the surai are soft and hairy. The hind feet also differ. The thumb is long and separate in the didelphis, so that opposing the fingers it may convert the foot into a true hand, which conformation affords a great degree of agility. The desuri have only the rudiments of this structure. Note, the habitudes of these genera are elegantly contrasted by M. Geoffroy. Les didelphes, says he, se tiennent le plus souvent sur la cime des plus grands arbres. Il y trouve plus de sûreté pour leur famille et de facilité pour poursuivre et atteindre leur proie. La nature de leur cul leur en fournit les moyens. Elle est fortement préhensile, nue et couverte de petites écailles. Leurs pieds des derniers, munis d'un pouce long, Écarté et susceptible de s'épouser aux autres doigts, couvertis enfin en véritable main, sont aussi employés au même usage. Tant de facilité pour grimper aux arbres, s'y si suspender et s'y si balancer, réglant leur habitude, en font des animaux légers et sauteurs, et les place au milieu des oiseaux, qui deviennent ainsi la proie pour laquelle ils ont le plus de goût. Les dacieurs, au contraire, sont condamnés à toujours rester sur la surface de la terre. Je n'ai rien appris touchant leur moire, mais je n'en suis pas moins fondé à la croire, puisque c'est un fait qui résulte nécessairement de leur organisation. Leur cul est en effet lâche et aussi couverte de longs poils que celles des moufettes, et ils n'ont eau pied de dernière qu'un rudiment de pouce, ce qui les constitue sans moyen pour les prédictions de sorte que placés dans un autre sphère que les didelphes, leurs murs ne pouvant manquer de se reventir de cette autre position. End of note. The last example is a very striking proof of the remark made in the foregoing pages that the peculiar characters of genera, or families, are confined to or particularly abundant in certain regions. We may further observe that the structure of the didelphes is such as to render them most appropriate inhabitants of countries covered as the warm parts of America are with high forests. This last relation would lead us to suspect that there may be in general some peculiar adaptation of the structure of animals to the physical circumstances of the regions where they are indigenous. This idea is confirmed by the distribution of the monkey tribe. According to the most accurate enumeration of the species belonging to this family, they amount nearly to a hundred. The apes are distinguished from their kindred genera by many particulars. They inhabit Africa and India. But the proper monkeys of the old continent differ also remarkably from the sapajus or American species of this tribe in several striking points. The former have pouches within their jaws for the reception of their food, 
and naked callous buttocks the latter have no maxillary pouches and their buttocks are hairy their nostrils are open on each side and divided by a large septum their limbs are peculiarly slender and their form spider-like rendering them agile and very expert in climbing trees most of them have long prehensile tails like those of the didelfes the true monkeys are all found in africa and asia the sapages are confined to the hot parts of america note cuvier tableau d'élémentaire penant east quad memoire sur les atelles par m geoffrey saint hilaire anu du muséum tome sept also tome treize tableau de quadruman par m geoffrey saint hilaire anu du muséum tome dix neuf end of note we have here a curious instance of utility in the distribution of species the prehensile tails and peculiar forms of the sapages would be of no advantage to them if they were inhabitants of the woods of africa which consists for the most part of copse or short brushwood but in the lofty and immense forests of guinea they are of the greatest importance by enabling these animals to climb the high trees which would otherwise shut them out perpetually from the light of day several other genera have the prehensile tail as the myrmecophagi the kinkajou and the hystrix prehensilis all these inhabit the same countries as the didelfes and suppajus it is easy to find other examples which evince the same sort of relation between countries and the structure of the quadrupeds appropriated to them the horse genus of the linnaean arrangement contains six species five of these have solid hoofs and inhabit the plain countries of asia and africa a single species is said to have divided hoofs and is therefore the only one which is able to exist in a mountainous and craggy region the latter is a native of the precipitous cordilleras of peru and chile note molina historia natural del chile End of note. the south of africa is spread out into fine level plains from about twenty five degrees of the south latitude to the country bordering upon the cape of good hope in this region pennant has observed that africa opens at once vast treasures of hoofed quadrupeds animals of this kind are particularly abundant in those districts in which their structure has evident advantage the remarkable fitness of the reindeer for the frozen regions of the north and the power which the camel derives from its peculiar organization of enduring the inconveniences of its native climates have been the theme of every traveler it would be as easy as it is needless to multiply examples of a similar tendency it is manifest that animals though possessing locomotive powers are not tenants of the globe at large through which they were left by providence to wander fortuitously but that the several kinds have particular local relations and were placed by the creator in certain regions for which they are in their nature peculiarly adapted End of section two of the local relations of genera part twelve of researches into the physical history of man this librivox recording is in the public domain read by john greenman section three of particular species each species a single race segment one the history of particular species confirms the foregoing observations and will authorize us in drawing with a high degree of probability the conclusion that quadrupeds of every tribe had originally one determinate seat on the earth from which they have migrated in different directions and that each kind is only found in places to which it was possible for it to find a passage from its primitive abode we find evidence in support of this observation in the zoological history of the more extensive portions of the earth which are distantly separated from each other the count de buffon observed that the animals which inhabit the old world are in general different from those of the new and that whatever species are found to be common to both are such as are able to endure the extreme cold of the arctic regions 
and may therefore be supposed to have found a way from one continent to the other where they approach very near together and may probably have been formally joined this opinion of buffon has been repeatedly contradicted by naturalists of later date many of the objections however which have been urged against it have been proved to have taken their rise in the inaccuracy of travelers and in the want of attention to characters of animals which though not so striking as to be observed on a superficial review are yet sufficiently important to be considered as specific differences at the period when buffon compiled his work the science of natural history was yet far from the degree of accuracy which it has since acquired comparative anatomy was scarcely beginning in his time to be acknowledged as the basis on which all the distinctions of zoologists must be founded some progress was indeed made in this study by dobenton the coadjutor of our author but a wide field still remained unexplored in which much ground has been gained by more recent investigations we shall therefore attempt with the guidance of later researches to correct the enumeration given by buffon of the genera and species common to the two continents or peculiar to either we shall also as we proceed through the catalogue of animals remark whether the facts which present themselves tend in other points to support our general doctrine of the single creation of each kind the hypothesis in question asserts that the quadrupeds which are confined to warm and temperate climates are to be found only in one of the two great continents and that those which inhabit very cold regions are generally common to both we begin with the order quadrumana the quadrumanous animals have been mentioned above their distribution entirely agrees with the hypothesis the whole family of simai are confined to hot climates they inhabit either continent separately of the numerous species which belong to the old world some are peculiar to africa and others to india not one appears to be common to both these countries the individual species have in general no very extensive range Note, the most complete enumeration of the quadruminous animals is given by M. Geoffroy saint hilaire in the nineteenth volume of the Annals of the Museum of Natural History at Paris. End of note. The species belonging to the five genera of lemurs are still more confined in their abodes. Of the order Chiroptera The principal family of this order is the bat tribe, some species of which have already been noticed. 1. The most numerous genus of bats are the proper Vespertilianes, of which an excellent account has been given by M. Geoffroy saint hilaire Note. Memoire sur le genre et les espèces de Vespertillon, l'un des genres de la famille des chauves-souris, par M. Geoffroy saint hilaire Annales du Muséum d'Histoire Naturelle de Paris, tome 8. End of note there are eighteen species of them some of these are extensively dispersed over the old world but the greater part occupy a confined sphere either in american or in the eastern continent no one species being common to both note the generic character of the vespertilians is thus given by m geoffroy dans incisive quatre supérieurs cinq inférieurs ne simple oreille avec oreille ibid end of note two the rhinolophi are less numerous a few species are found in europe others in africa and in india note m geoffrey saint hilaire and du museum tom quinze page one sixty two this genus is characterized by two very small incisive teeth in the upper and four in the lower jaw c cuvier tableau élémentaire d'animaux end of note three the phyllostomata inhabit the hot parts of america they are nine species note sur les phyllostomes et les megadermes par m geoffroy saint hilaire and muse tom quinze end of note four the megadermata approach most nearly to the last mentioned genus but they differ in many particulars 
and especially in the structure of the lips and tongue, which do not enable them to suck. Four species of this genus are described which are found in the hot parts of India and Africa, having individually a limited abode as far as is yet known. Note. Ibid. For the molossus is another genus of bat, containing nine species which are all American. Note. Memoire sur quelques chauves souris d'Amérique, formant une petite famille sous le nom Molossus, par le même Anne Muse, tome 6. The character of the genus is dans incisive à chaque mâchoire, le nez simple, l'orion, en dehors de la concu. Ibid, page 154. End of note. 5. The noctilio, or leporine bat inhabited in peru six of the terapus or rousette note description de rousette et de cephalot par la même and du muse tome quinze end of note there are eleven species and of the seven cephalot two these are distributed as before mentioned to the neighborhood of the indian ocean and to the austral countries. No one species seems to have any extensive range. Note Ibid. 2. The second family of Chiropterous animals consists, according to our present knowledge of one genus, the Galeopithecus, or flying Macuoco, of which there are two species, the Rufus and Variegatus. They are found in the Molucca Isles. Note Cuvier ubi supra of the order plantigrada note i have ventured to denominate these departments orders though it is not perhaps strictly according to the principles of the system of arrangement which i follow without such a precaution there would be too much confusion in the number of subdivisions see blumenbach's manuel d'histoire naturelle end of note the family of erinaceae or hedgehogs belongs to the plantigrade tribe. Of these there are two departments or subgenera, viz. the proper hedgehogs and the tenrex. Note Ibid. 1. The first are widely dispersed. The Erinaceus europaeus is found in most of the temperate parts of Europe and Asia. The Oritus inhabits the banks of the Volga. The Noris and Malaxentis are natives to Suriname and Malacca, respectively. Note. Linné system nat. Lin sist nat. Gmelin. 2. The genus Setiger, or Tenrec, consists of three species which are peculiar to Madagascar. Note. Cuvier ubi supra. 2. The next family is that of Sorex, of which we have already mentioned the distribution. 3. The talpa is only one genus. Several species of moles are peculiar to North America and one to Europe and Siberia. Note Penant East Quad Lin Sist Nat Gmelin. The talpa and surises were formerly inaccurately distinguished. See M. Geoffroy Saint Hilaire's Sur les espèces des genres Migal et Musaraigne. An Muse Tom Dissette. End of note. 4. The family of Ursi is a very extensive one, containing seven subgenera. First, of the proper bears. The Ursus maritimus, or great white bear, affords us the first example of an animal capable of enduring the extreme rigor of the northern climate. It wanders over the shores of the Arctic seas and is found in the most northern tracts of both continents. Note. Penant East Quad Blank Arctic Zoology End of Note The species of land bears belonging to Europe and Asia are not well ascertained. M. Cuvier observes that there are as many opinions as writers on this subject, but that all the European bears, of which he has been able to obtain any knowledge, may be referred to two species, differing in form, especially in the bones of the cranium. Note Sur les ossements du genre de l'ours qui se trouve dans certaines cavernes de Hongrie et d'Allemagne. 
par Monsieur Cuvier, an muse tom set. End of note. The common badger cannot endure a very rigorous climate. It inhabits the temperate parts of Europe and Asia. The American badger is a distinct species. It is found as far northward as Hudson's Bay. Note. Penant ist quad, lin sist nat melin. End of note. 3. The gluttons are arranged among the ursi by their feet, but they are mustelae in the structure of their teeth. Note cuvier ubi supra the wolverine is supposed to be a variety of the glutton note ibid it is found in north america the grisson or grand fourine de la guyane of buffon the mustela barbara of gmelin are also plantigrade animals they are confined to warm countries and peculiar to america note penant ubi supra the ursus mellivorus or rattle vivera mellivora lin is peculiar to the cape of good hope note cuvier tableau elementaire sparman act stockholm seventeen seventy seven end of note the lutriola or lesser otter is found in scandinavia poland and in siberia along the banks of the yake ibid e lin sist nat gmilin End of note. It is uncertain whether the vison or minx of North America is a distinct species or a variety of the last mentioned. Note Penant ubi supra. The Saricovienne and other species of otter are peculiar to South America. Note Ibid and Buffon East Noir. End of note. Two. The weasels and polecats form another subdivision of this family, which is more extensively dispersed than the others. Note Cuvier ubi supra. The M. Erminea and Zebelina are capable of enduring intensely cold climates. These are found in the northern extremities of Europe and Asia, in the Carilion Islands, and in the Arctic regions of the New World. Note Ibid and Buffon. East nut. The M. vulgaris, or common weasel, the Putorius, or polecat, the Sarmatica, Sibirica, and etc., inhabit temperate climates in Europe and Asia. Note Ibid. The furo, or ferret, is from Africa, and another species is found in Cafraria and near the Cape, to which Buffon mistaking it for an American animal of the subgenus Mephitis erroneously gave the name Zoril. Note, the animal called Zoril by Buffon resembles the European polecats in its teeth, its form, and its structure of its feet. It is the most fetid of all the mustelae, exceeding the mephitis. Buffon, seeing the skin of this animal without designation, and having no means of determining the characters of the true mephitis, mistook it for that animal and therefore called it Zoril. Zorillo is the term given by the Spaniards to the Mephitis, or American Mustela. Sparman discovered the Zoril in its native country, near the Cape of Good Hope, and a more accurate acquaintance with the department of this family, which is found in the New World, has enabled Cuvier to correct the error of Buffon. See Cuvier ubi supra. 3. The Martins are another branch of this family, differing in some points from the foregoing and in others from the succeeding subgenus note the martins differ sensibly from the weasels in the form of the head and teeth cuvier end of note the martin proper is found in various parts of europe and in russia the foina or pine martin takes a more extensive range through the coldest countries of the north and is accordingly common to both continents note Penant ubi supra. 4. The Mephitis, Mufet, or American polecats, have been erroneously placed among the Viverne. Note Gamelian ubi supra, etc. The Mephitis have been considered as belonging to the Viverne. It is, however, certain that they have not the characters of that genus which have been erroneously attributed to them, viz., the pouch full of fetid matter and the rough tegument of the tongue 
Their odor arises from the glands placed similarly to those of the polecats. Their tongue is soft, and their teeth are those of mustele. Cuvier, end of note. They belong to the mustele, but are a distinct branch of them. Note. They differ from the weasels in the form of the head and from the martens in the structure of the teeth and in the number of the molars, the marten having five on each side of the upper jaw, while the mephitis has only four. The latter are further distinguished by long and strong talons on the four feet, well contrived for digging. Pedes fossari, ibid. End of note. Fifteen species have been enumerated by authors, but it is uncertain how many may have served for foundation to so numerous a catalogue. Note. The Mapurito, Conepati, Coas, Chinch, etc., are not distinguished by any characters which ascertain which of them are species and which varieties, and it is probable, as Cuvier observes, that they are all variations of one species. Ibid. End of note. Cuvier suspects that they are all varieties of one species. They are peculiar to the temperate and hot parts of America. 2. Of the Vivera family. The civet family are confined to warm climates. Accordingly, they are not found in any instance to be common to the two continents. They exist only in the warm parts of the old world. The Vivera civeta is a native of Africa, the Sibeta of India. Note, Cuvier, Tablo Elem, Gmelin Ubi Supra. The Geneta is found in the western parts of Asia and in the south of Europe. Note, Gmelin Ubi Supra. Three of the Felis family. The most accurate enumeration of the species belonging to this family extends them to twenty-seven or twenty-eight. Of these, twenty-six species are peculiar to temperate or, for the most part, to hot countries. Note, the memoir on the cat kind, published by M. Cuvier in the sixteenth volume of the Annals of the Museum, contains the best account of this genus and the most accurate enumeration of the species belonging to it, with the places where each of them has been found, which the knowledge at present obtained concerning them affords. End of note. The lynx is found in cold climates. The common lynx is distinguished by some trifling difference of color from the lynx of Canada, but they are considered as varieties of the same species. Thus we find that one species, namely that which endures the rigor of northern climates, is common to both continents. The remaining twenty-six are divided between America and the Old World, without any intercommunity. 4. Of the Canis family. 1. Of the common dog. It is still a matter of doubt among naturalists whether the domestic dog be a distinct species or a variety of the wolf or jackal. The want of any osteological character which might distinguish the wolf from the common shepherd's dog was long ago remarked. Dobenton observed it, and was hence induced to believe these animals to be of the same species. Cuvier has confirmed the fact, and is inclined to adopt the opinion of his predecessor. Note, Mémoire sur les espèces des animaux carnassières dont on trouve les eaux dans les cavernes d'Allemande et d'Hongrie, par M. Cuvier, Anne de Museum, tome 9. M. Cuvier says that all the differences he has been able to discover between the skull of the wolf and that of the dog is that the triangular part of the forehead behind the orbits is a little narrower and flatter in the former, the sagatooccipital crest longer and more raised, and the teeth, especially the canines, larger in proportion. But these differences are much slighter than what often occur in individuals of the same species. Our author adds that one can scarcely fail to adopt the opinion of Dobinton. End of note. The anatomical coincidence of the dog and jackal is said to be still more strict. Professor Gildenstead of Petersburg has found them to agree in some points of internal structure in which the wolf and dog differ. If the dog be a distinct species, 
it probably originated in Africa, for in that quarter of the world it is found wild. Note, Pennant East Quad. Though possibly in this instance it may have returned to its natural state, having undergone the modifying influence of domestication, there are no wild dogs in America. Several species of the dog kind inhabit very cold climates and are common in the northern regions of Europe, Asia, and America, viz. the Lagupos, Lupus, Lycaon, Vulpus. Note, Pennant, East Quod, Melin Ubi Supra, Shaw's Zoology. End of note. Some of these are much more extensively spread than others. The Lagupas, or Asatia, is found at Spitsbergen, through the north of Asia to Kamchatka, in some of the islands between that country and the shore of America, at Hudson's Bay, and in Greenland. The wolf, on the other hand, is a very general inhabitant of the old continent, and in the New World is common from Hudson's Bay to Mexico. The Cinereo argentuus is a species peculiar to North America. The remaining species of this genus subsist only in warm and temperate climates. The Mesomelus, the Hyena, the Crocuta, and the Scherdo, if this truly be a canis, are African. The Aureus, or Jackal, is found in the temperate parts of Europe, Asia, and Africa. The Corsac and Caracan in the south of Tartary. Note, Ibid. The Taos, Mexicanus, Virgianus, note, Gemelin, and the Calpreus, note, Molin, Historia, Natural del Chile, are American. The Canis Antarcticus, if this be not a variety of the last named, is peculiar to the Falkland Islands. Note, Shaw's Zoology, Monsieur Bougainville's Voyage Round the World. End of note. Of the order Pedimana. This tribe has been mentioned in a former page. It will be sufficient here to observe that the distribution of it is strongly in our favor. One genus, consisting of nine species, is peculiar to the warm parts of America, and the other six genera, including more than forty species, to Australasia. Of the order Rodentia, one, the family of porcupines, except the Hydrix dorsata, note, Gmelin ubi supra, of Canada, is confined to warm climates. The remaining five species are the Cristata, note, Ibid, the Prehensilis, note, Ibid, the Mexicana, note, Pennant ubi supra, or iridescent, and the Brush-tailed, note, Shaw ubi supra. The first inhabits India, Persia, Palestine, the Caspian districts, Africa, and is wild in Italy, but not originally a native of Europe. Note, Pennant ubi supra. The two next are of the warm parts of America, and the two last peculiar to India. Two, of the hare genus. One species of hare, viz. the Lepus variabilis, is peculiar to cold and wintry regions. It extends through the most northern countries of Europe and Asia to Kamchatka, and is also common in Canada and in Greenland. In the latter countries it no longer varies, but remains white during the whole year. The common hare is a very general inhabitant of the old continent. Whether it existed aboriginally in the new is doubtful. Note Shaw's Zoology. The rabbit is a native of the warm parts of Europe, and is neither indigenous in the British Isles nor in America. Note Pennant. Some other species of this genus are peculiar to South America. Note Gmelin Molina. Three lagomys, or tailless hares, are found in Siberia. The Alpinus inhabits the Altaic chain, a little below the region of perpetual snow, beginning in the province of Coliuan and extending to the extreme of Asia. The Ogotona is found to the eastward of Lake Baikal. The Pusilus inhabits the south of the Oral Mountains. Note. Cuvier sur les brèches au sous qui remplissent les fonds des rochers. Anne de Muse, tome 13. 3. The Cavai are all South American. 4. 
The common beaver is a tenant of cold abodes. Note Gmelin. It is found in the northern extremes of both continents. Another species is peculiar to Chile. Note Molina. 5. The Scurious, or Squirrel genus, is divided into two departments, the proper Scurai and the Termais, Polatouche, or Flying Squirrels. Note Cuvier Tableau Elementaire. 1. Of the Scurai. One species only of squirrel seems to be common to the old and new world. It is the striped squirrel of Shaw, and the ground squirrel of the American zoologists. This animal is a native of the most northern regions of Asia and the colder parts of North America. It has been rarely found in Europe. The Scurus vulgaris inhabits Europe and the most of Asia. The Scurus maximus, ocruros, bicolor, Anomalous, Erythrice, Indicus, Persicus, Cinchicus are peculiar to the warmer and hotter parts of Asia. The Cynerius, Niger, Hudsonius, Estorius, or Brazilian, Verigatus, or Cocalan, Mexicanus, Degus, or Chilean, belong to America. The Scirius, Getulus, and Palmarum are African. Note. Compare Gmelin pennant and shaw two the tormise the scurius volans inhabits the north of europe the hudsonius the north of america the petuarista and sagita the isles of india note ditto six the chimeris or squirrel of madagascar form a separate genus peculiar to that country note cuvier ubisupra seven the mures or the most numerous family in mammalia. They are divided into nine genera, Actumis, Limnus, Fiber, Meoserus, Christitus, Spalax, Dipus, Meoxus, and Hydromis. 1. Arctomis, Marmots. One species, the Arctomis Silitus, Eros Marmot or Zizel, inhabits the middle parts of Europe and the north of Russia. Kamchatka is found in some of the intervening isles, and even on the American continent. Note, Pennant Eastquad, Gmelin. The Marmota, Bobak, and Gundi are found in the warm and temperate climates of the eastern, and the Monax, Empetra, Prinosa, Note, Gmelin, and Maulina, Note, Molina, in the western continent, some of them in the colder parts. 2. Lemmy, Campagnols, or Field Rats. C. Teeth furrowed like those of the cavies, hares, and elephant. Tails hairy, moderate in length or short. The Mus arvalis and the Amphibious are found in the temperate parts of both continents. The Aspalax, note, the Aspalax belongs to this tribe, though reckoned by some naturalists among the mole rats, Cuvier Tableau. Saxatilis, Limus, Torquatus, Lagurus, Reinomus, Aliorus, Reitilus, Grigalis, Socialis, inhabit regions of moderate extent in Europe and northern Asia, and the Maolinus, Cyanus, Laginer, Hudsonius are American. Note. Compare Gmelin ceased not with Penance East Quad. End of note. 3. Miasuri, proper rats. The Moose ratus, or black rat, and the Demonatus, or Norway rat, are said to be natives of India and Persia. Note. The generic character is three molar teeth in each jaw, slightly notched, inferior, incisive teeth, pointed, tail, long and scaly. Cuvier. End of note. It is difficult to imagine what country has the best claim to the musculus or common mouse. These animals are the most multitudinous of all quadrupeds. By their adherence to the habitation and migration of the human species, they have found their way into many countries inaccessible to other kinds. It has been remarked that wherever ships go, rats and mice go with them, 
and it may almost be said that these animals exist wherever man exists. They have indeed been found in uninhabited islands, but not in any place which has not in all probability been visited by men. Note, in two desert islands in the Pacific, viz. Norfolk Isle and another small island seen by Cook, rats were observed at the first discovery by Europeans but vestiges of human visitants were found in both places cook's last voyages collins new south wales end of note the black rat was imported to south america by europeans and now infests the whole continent the mouse is very abundant in the blue mountains but whether this animal existed in america before its discovery by europeans is unknown note gmelin pennant shaw End of note. Besides these, Caraco, Silvaticus, Agrarius, Minitus, Soricinus, Vagus, Petulinus, Straitus, note, Gmelin, and the harvest mouse of Pennant, note, Pennant, are natives of Europe or Asia, principally of the temperate parts. The Barbarus and Pumilio are African, note, Gmelin. In America there are a few species not well determined. The Mus pylorides inhabits the Indian islands, and in the Antilles there is a very similar animal, which is supposed by some to be of the same species. These creatures are not, however, sufficiently known to authorize our determining on their diversity or identity, and analogy leads us to the former. 4. Crescitae, Hamsters one species of hamster has been discovered in Canada. Six or more are natives of the temperate parts of Europe and Asia. Note, Camillion, Shaw. Five, Spalaces, mole rats. Two of them are found in the warm parts of Russia and Siberia, and two at the Cape of Good Hope. Note, compare Camillion with Cuvier's tableau élémentaire. End of note. Six, Dipus, Gerboas. Of the six Jerboas, one belongs to Canada, the rest to the hot and temperate parts of the eastern continent. Note Shaw and Gmelin. 7. Meoxus, Dormice. The several species of Dormice inhabit woody districts in the northern parts of Europe and Asia. Note Gmelin. 8. The Fiber, Ondatra, or Muskrat, is a Canadian animal. Note Cuvier Gmelin ubi supra. 9. The Hydromus is a new genus, of which three species are known, viz. the Hydromus coipu of Paraguay and Chile, the Chrysogaster and Leucogaster, both newly discovered species of Australasia. Note, même sur au nouveau genre de mammifères nommé Hydromis par M. Geoffroy saint hilaire and du Museum Tom Cis. End of note. Of the order Endentada. It has been remarked above that the Myrmecopagi are peculiar to America. They are found in the warm parts of that continent. Note Cuvier ubi supra pennant. The Manus genus, or the scaly anteaters, inhabit Africa. Note Ibid. And perhaps also the Indian Isles. Note Histoire naturelle des Andes de Bontius. End of note. The Octeropus is an animal of distinct genus from the Myrmecophaga. It inhabits the south of Africa. Note. The Octeropus is the Myrmecophaga capensis of Gmelin, erroneously placed among the Myrmecophaga, since it differs from that genus in having molar teeth. End of note. The Ornithorhynchi of Australasia must be placed next to the foregoing genera in the natural arrangement. The remaining genera of Endentata, viz. the Bradipus and Dasipus, are, as before remarked, found solely in America. The hoofed animals remain to complete the catalogue of land quadrupeds. Of these the order Pachydermata contains six genera now existing. End of section 3. Of particular species, each species a single race. Segment 1.
Part 13 of Researches into the Physical History of Man. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by John Greenman. Chapter 3, Section 3. Of Particular Species, Each Species a Single Race. Segment 2. Of the Order Pachydermata. 1. Genus Elephas. Two species of elephant exist at present. One of them has only been found in Africa. Note. Elephant à crâne arrondi, à large oreille, à machelier marqué de losange sur leur couronne. This is certainly the elephant of Guinea and the Cape, and probably of Mozambique and the east of Africa. But it is not certain that there are no individuals of the Indian species in the latter district. Mémoire sur les éléphants vivants et fossiles par Cuvier, Anne du Muséum, tome 8. End of note. The other is not known to inhabit any country westward of the Indus. Note. Elephant à crâne allongé, à front concave, à très longue alvéole de défense, à mâchoire inférieure obtuse, à malchior de plus large, parallé marqué de rubans plus serré. Ibid. End of note. 2 genus rhinoceros three living species of rhinoceros are known first the bicorn rhinoceros with a smooth skin destitute of folds without incisive teeth this animal is peculiar to africa note sparmanu voy au cap même sur les rhinoceros fossiles par cuvier an muse tom set end of note second the unicorn rhinoceros with folds in its skin and incisive teeth inhabits india note parsons philosophe transact forty two number five twenty three dobenton east nat cuvier ubi supra end of note third a third species is found in sumatra and perhaps on the asiatic continent which is bicorn but has incisors and a smooth skin Note, William Bell, Philos Transact, 1793, Cuvier, Ibid. End of note. Fourth, a fourth species is found fossil in Europe and Siberia. Note, Palas, Commentarii de Acomedie Imperialis de Petropolitanae, tome 13 et 17, Cuvier, Ubi Supra. End of note. Three, genus Tapir peculiar in the living state to south america note two fossil species of tapir have been found in europe cuvier anne du muse tome trois four genus hippopotamus found in the rivers of africa note mr marsden says that the hippopotamus is found in sumatra but it is not known whether the animal which he thus denominated was accurately named and still less whether it was the same species as the African. M. Cuvier conjectures that it may be the same animal which Newhoff described as inhabiting Java under the name of Sucotiro. Cuvier sur l'hippopotame, Anne Muse, tome 4. End of note. 5. Hyrax. It is uncertain whether the hyrax of the cape and the daemon or hyrax of Syria are of the same species or distinct. Note, Cuvier inclines to the latter opinion. Descrite osteologique de Daman, an mus tom trois. End of note. These include the whole kind. 6. Sus, the hog tribe. The hog tribe presents a similar observation to that which we have so often repeated the whole genus is confined to warm and temperate climates and therefore each species appropriated to either continent the wild boar wanders further towards the north than any of his congeners he is found in various parts of europe but has never been seen to the northward of the baltic or in the british isles note pennant etc the warm parts of america seem to be highly congenial to this race for the domesticated hogs have run wild there and have greatly multiplied of the order ruminantia one 
camelus. The proper camel is confined to a limited abode in Asia and Africa. Several species of llamas are peculiar to South America. 2. Marshes. This genus, like the former, is only found in warm climates. Five species belong to the hot parts of the Old World and one to South America. Note. Melin, etc. 3. Servus. Two species of Servus belong to very cold climates. These are common to both continents. The Alsace, elk or moose deer is found in Sweden, Norway, the Siberian forests, and in Canada. The Tarandus or reindeer take a still more northern range. It inhabits Lapland and the coast of the frozen ocean to Kamchatka. In America it is found in Greenland and Canada. The Alphus, stag or red deer, is spread through most parts of Europe and inhabits the Siberian forests. It is not found in Kamchatka, that country being destitute of wood. Some naturalists suppose the European stag and the American to be the same species. They differ, however, in their horns, which are simply forked in the American, and with antlers palmated in a crown in the European. M. Cuvier is inclined to consider them as distinct species. Note, Mémoire sur les os fossiles de ruminants trouvés dans les terrains meubles par M. Cuvier. Anne de Musée, tome 2. End of note. The more southerly species of Servi are distributed distinctively to the two continents. In the temperate or hot part of the Old World, we find the Dama or fallow deer, the Pagurgus, Axis, Porcinus, Ganinsis, Munchai, note, Gemelin, and Capriolus, note, Shaw, etc., which last, however, wanders as far toward the north as Norway. In the warmer districts of America we have the Virginian and Mexican, note, Cuvier ubi supra, of pennant, and some other species, both with and without antlers, mentioned by Azara. The Camilo pardalis, antelopes, and capre belong to warm climates and are peculiar to the old continent. 7. Ovis one species of sheep is spread over the old continent in a state of domestication. Note. Palace, Spielig, Zual de Argali. End of note. In its natural condition it is confined to temperate climates. Two species are said to have been found in America, viz. the Pudu of Chile, note, Molius ubisupra, and a new animal of North America, note, M. E. Geoffroy, Anne de Museum, Tome de. 8. Boss. Of the ox kind, one species is supposed to be common to the two continents. The Arox, or Urus, was formerly numerous through the north of Europe. It is still found in Poland and Lithuania about Mount Caucasus. Note. Penance East Quad, Arctic Zual. End of note. And in other parts of Asia, but not in Siberia or Kamchatka. The wild oxen of America are believed to be a variety of this species, but this point has not been fully ascertained by anatomical comparison. Note. Cuvier sur les os fossiles de ruminants, en muse tome douze. End of note. The latter abound in Canada and in the country six hundred miles west of Hudson's Bay. Note. Pennant. The mush ox is now proper to Canada but it appears to have been once common to the two continents. Skulls have been found in the beds of the Siberian rivers, which Pennant, note, Pennant ubi supra, and Cuvier, note, Cuvier ubi supra, refer to this species. The remaining species are peculiar to hot climates and to the old continent. The Bos Arni, the primitive stock whence the domesticated buffaloes originated, note, Cuvier ubi supra, is Indian. The bee grunion, or yak tartarian, and the cape, ox, African, of the order Solipeda. All the horse kind are animals of warm climates, 
and none is found in America except the cloven-hoofed species mentioned by Molina. Note, if this species properly belong to the genus, the designation of the order is obviously improper. End of note. Of the amphibious mammalia. The history of the amphibious races, as it may be collected from zoological writers, is very much at variance with the conclusions which we draw from surveying the abodes and dispersion of the proper land quadrupeds. Several tribes of foci are said to be cosmopolites, or to be found equally on all shores of the ocean. Such is the account given of the foci ursina, and we have still more astonishing relations concerning the vitulina, which is said not only to be universal in the salt sea, but having undergone some singular change in its nature to have become fitted for an abode in freshwater lakes such as those of Baikal, La Doga, Onega. Various conjectures have been formed in order to invent more probable means by which these animals might penetrate into such recesses. Subterraneous siphons have been supposed to exist, communicating between the Euxine and Caspian, note, Zimmermann, Zwoll Geograph, page 148, end of note. And although the seal is obliged in the sea to rise perpetually to the surface for respiration, it has been supposed possible for it to traverse some hundreds of leagues through the depths of the earth. But the truth is that these anomalous relations are founded on the inaccuracy of travelers and ill-informed reporters. M. M. Perron and Lesieur, who have enjoyed rare opportunities of investigating the natural history of these tribes in the most distant regions, assure us that under the name of Foca Ursina more than twenty species are included differing not only in form, in the position of the fins, etc., but even in the number of teeth and in the presence or absence of ears. Note, notice sur l'habitation des phoques par m m perron et les sieurs anne du muse tom quinze end of note the same authors observe that no less confusion prevails with respect to other species of phoci the specific identity of the animals which pass under the common name of phoca vitulina rests on the most questionable authority and it is certain that tribes quite distinct have been described as sea lions and have been put down as forming the single species of leonina wherever an opportunity has occurred of comparing accurately the characters of animals so improbably associated they have been found to be clearly distinguished probably the time is not far distant when this branch of zoology shall be explored and when the foci shall be found to have like all other quadrupeds certain appropriate abodes such has been the result of inquiry as far as it has extended no species accurately known is common to the arctic and antarctic regions the trichichus rosmarus or walrus which has been most absurdly connected with the manatee is much more allied to the foci note cuvier sur l'ostéologie du malentin etc Anne de Musée, tome 13, end of note. The walrus inhabits the Arctic shores of both continents. Note, the Indian walrus of Pennant is the Dugong. That excellent naturalist was imperfectly acquainted with this animal. See Cuvier Ubi Supra, end of note. A second department of amphibious mammalia approached more to the cetacea. Note, Cuvier Ubi Supra. Of these there are three genera, the manatee, dugong, and the animal described by Steller. Two species of manatee are found respectively in the rivers of South America and in those of Guinea. The dugong abounds in the Indian and Austral seas, and the animal of Steller in the northern parts of the Pacific Ocean. This enumeration, although defective in many respects, appears to establish the fact in question many species of animals in both continents are very imperfectly known and this circumstance necessarily introduces a degree of doubt into our conclusions but as far as accurate knowledge extends 
the opinion of buffon and his followers seems to be well founded it does not appear that any one animal was originally common to the warm parts of the old and new world scarcely any european species is aboriginal in america which is not a native of the countries northward of the baltic in one division of the earth and of canada in the other no asiatic species reappear on the western continent except such as are found in the northern parts of the russian empire most of these exist in the districts of asia which approximate to america and some tribes which are now extinct in those tracts have left proofs of their former abode there in their fossil remains a considerable number are even traced through the intervening islands again scarcely any animal has an extensive range in the northern regions of either continent which is not common to both of them from all these considerations we draw a highly probable inference that the tribes in question derive their extension through the two continents from a communication in some manner affected and the only manner by which we can account for such intercourse is by supposing that the opposite points of asia and america were formerly joined Note, it is possible that some animals may have been carried across the strait on drift ice arctic bears and foxes are continually found floating on ice islands in the northern seas bears are thus brought every year to iceland at the breaking up of the wintry frosts it is said also that wolves resort in immense droves to islands of ice in order to prey on young seals which they catch asleep and that they are often heard howling dreadfully at sea having been carried away by the detachment of the ice to a great distance from the land in this manner some animals might be communicated from one land to another but such accidents are not sufficient to account for the extent and generality of the interchange in the present instance the two continents are so near together in one direction that both may be seen from one intermediate point and the sea is often entirely frozen over between them this might afford a greater facility but on the whole when we advert to the changes which the superficial strata of the globe have undergone and consider that many channels have undoubtedly been found which separate lands formerly united and when we take into the account that similar zoological phenomena to those which we have been contemplating are found in many parts of the world where the sea can never afford a passage by its conjugation we are much inclined to resort to the hypothesis above adopted End of note. therefore we accept those species which appear to have been rendered common by some interchange the whole stocks of mammiferous animals found respectively in the two continents are peculiar to either of them similar facts are observed in reviewing the zoological circumstances of other countries separated at remote distances from the rest of the world the islands and continents situated in the great southern ocean afford some striking examples of this kind the indian isles even those which are at no great distance from new guinea abound with oxen buffaloes goats deer hogs dogs cats and rats in new guinea however none of these note according to captain forrest there are not even rats on the main land of new guinea at least there were none at the places where he landed if this be the case generally it is a remarkable fact since this animal is found in most of the adjacent countries and has been dispersed through the most remote islands of the pacific in new guinea however none of these quadrupeds are found except the hog and the dog the hogs of new guinea are of the chinese variety and were probably brought from the indian isles this animal is in chief request among savage nations in general on account of its prolific nature and usefulness for food it has run wild in new guinea the papua race or tribes very nearly connected with them furnished population to the islands of the eastern ocean and they have carried the hog with them into many of their settlements 
It has been conveyed to the New Hebrides, Society Isles, Friendly Isles, Marquesas, but is still wanting in the islands further eastward and even in New Caledonia, a little to the south. Dogs have arrived in New Guinea, probably with the first colonists. They have been communicated thence to many of the clusters of islands in the Pacific, though somewhat in a different direction from the hogs. We trace them through the New Hebrides to the Fiji Islands, to New Caledonia, New Zealand. Thence to the Society Isles, following the track of human colonists, and to the Sandwich Islands. Note, it is curious that though the friendly isles are separated from the Fiji islands by a very short space, no dogs are to be found in the former. The natives of the friendly and Fiji islands have but recently discovered each other and are now beginning to have communication. This circumstance accounts for the fact stated above and confirms the idea of which indeed there can be no doubt that the quadrupeds which are scattered through the islands of the Pacific owe their dispersion to their connection with man, whose migrations they have accompanied. End of note. Rats also exist in most of the islands of this ocean. These, if not communicated through New Guinea, were probably introduced into the isles by ships of Europeans. These three animals, together with some peculiar bats, form the whole catalogue of mammiferous land quadrupeds which are found scattered through the numerous islands of the great southern ocean. New Holland probably derived its stock of dogs from New Guinea. Note that the natives of these countries have had much intercourse, or rather that they are branches of one nation, is evident from various circumstances which will be mentioned in the following pages. See Hist of South Sea Islanders. End of note. The dog of New South Wales somewhat resembles that of Papua's. Probably this animal has run wild since its introduction into New Holland, and the race now found with the natives of that country is but half domesticated. With the exception of the dog thus communicated from without, the whole stock of Australasian quadrupeds as yet discovered, note, it appears, however, that some animals exist in this country which are yet unknown to us, M. Labillatier mentions that he saw the impressions of a large cloven hoof on the shore in a desert part of New Holland, and that he found a spinal vertebra, four inches in diameter, in the woods of Van Diemen's Land. Voyer à la recherche de la Perouse. End of note. The whole stock of Australasian quadrupeds as just discovered is peculiar and strikingly different from anything known in other parts of the earth. The whole number consists of about forty species, belonging to the six marsupial genera above mentioned, of three animals of the family Ornithorhynchus, which may probably be found hereafter to be a more considerable tribe of some indigenous species of Teropus, and of two species of Hydromus, one other animal of the same genus being found in America. It is then sufficiently evident in general that each insulated region had originally a separate stock of animals. Note, it may appear to some persons on a superficial view that this position is at variance with the mosaic record of the universal deluge, according to which all the animals on the earth were collected together in one spot. But this event, being altogether miraculous and out of the course of nature, we are not to expect that the circumstances and consequences of it should follow in a natural connection. The collecting of animals from all distant parts of the world into one point was a work as miraculous as the deluge itself. The miracle, or the suspension of natural laws, must have been maintained as long as beings of such opposite characters continued in one place, for it is obvious that without a total subversion of the peculiar nature of every species, scarcely any of them could exist in such circumstances. If the miracle had terminated here, and on the subsiding of the waters of the flood, the individual nature of each animal had been restored to it, together with its peculiar wants and power of subsisting only in certain situations, 
and if all animals including beast of prey had been then set at large in our country without doubt most of them must have perished and the design of the miracle would have been frustrated but they certainly were conveyed by the same supernatural means which had collected them into their former abodes or into those situations for which their structure was originally contrived any other account of this event is inconsistent with the wisdom of providence and if we adopt the above necessary hypothesis we shall find no difficulty in receiving the doctrine supported in the text which is certainly established on well-authenticated facts End of note. no species being common to several countries so divided except such as have been in all probability transferred from one to the other hence we infer that each kind exists only in places accessible to it from one primary center of dispersion besides the principal fact which has conducted us to this inference we may remark on reviewing the foregoing enumeration of genera and species many circumstances tending to confirm the same general conclusion of the animals which inhabit either of the two great continents some are more widely scattered but the greater number exist only in a contracted sphere not being disposed by their habits to extensive migration some species prevail through limited districts of africa some in india others in different regions very few being common to similar climates and situations in distant parts of the same great continent which are not also discovered more or less frequently in the intervening countries a curious and extensive question here arises how islands in general became supplied with land animals it seems difficult to account for the introduction of wild quadrupeds into islands and the difficulty seems to afford an argument for the distinct creation of many stocks in each kind on this subject we shall make two remarks first that islands situated at great distances from continents though many of them are abundant in vegetable productions are in general altogether destitute of land quadrupeds except such as appear to have been conveyed to them by men thus in distant uninhabited islands we find no animals of this description as in kirgilin's land in juan fernandez in the galapagos and the isles de lobos or if any quadrupeds are seen in such places they are animals which appear to be of distinct species and are found in no other part of the world as in the falkland islands there is only one species of quadruped which is of the dog kind and is peculiar to those solitary abodes and in islands which are inhabited but situated at remote distances in the ocean whatever quadrupeds are found are small and such as evidently appear to have been carried thither this we have seen to be the case with the species found in the islands scattered through the south seas if the opinion we are contending against were true it seems probable enough that we should find many of these islands which are wonderfully luxuriant in vegetation abounding with cattle and other large quadrupeds equally with the continents we may observe secondly that the quadrupeds found on islands which are situated near to continents always form a part of the stock of animals belonging to the nearest main land this is the case with the animals of the british isles of the mediterranean isles of madagascar and the east and west indian islands if any quadrupeds are found in some of these places which do not inhabit the adjacent continents they are peculiar to the islands respectively being distinct species found in no other spot and such as appear always to have had confined and local existence from these considerations we are led to infer as highly probable that islands in general derived the stock of quadrupeds which are found in them from the continents adjacent to them unless where the former have been the seat of a particular creation in order to account for the communication between islands and continents we must have recourse to the changes which we have reason to believe the surface of the earth to have undergone in different ages when geology shall have assumed the character of a science 
it may assist in illustrating some obscure points in the geological history of the world and animal topography as was observed by the first writer who expressly undertook the investigation of it may in return aid the geologist in ascertaining the former connections of countries now disjoined note zimmermann geograph zoologica end of note we have reason to believe that many islands now separated from continents by narrow straits were formerly connected the correspondence of strata on opposite shores evinces in various instances that such was the primitive condition of these places and that they acquired their insular state by some violent disruption this has been particularly observed of the approaching coast of britain and france traditions have been preserved in many examples of such events having taken place as in those of sicily cyprus eubea etc Note, Clare iam pridem insule delos et rodos memorie produntur enate, postea minores ultra melon anafe, inter lemnum et hellespontum nea, inter lebedum et leon halone, inter cucladas thera et therasia, etc. Namque et hoc modo insula sererum natura fecit, Avellit Sicilia Italia, Cyprum Syria, Eubeum Beotie, Euboe Atalantem et Merin, Pesbucum Bituniae, Leucococosiae Sirenum Promontorio. Pliny, Hist. Nat. 2. Several traditions of this sort are mentioned by the ancient writers, and must occur to the memory of every classical reader. Ovid reports some examples of this kind. Sic totius versa es fortuna locorum. Vidi ego quod fuerat quondam solidissima matellus esse fretum. Vidi factas ex equore terras. Fluctibus ambite fuerant antissa farosque, et fenis saturos quarum nunc insula nulla est leucada continuum vetere saboere coloni nunc freta circueunt zancle quoque juncta fuisse dicitur italiae done confini a pontus abstulit et media tellurem repulit unda si queras helicen et burina caides urbes Invenies sub aquis, et adhuc ostendere naute inclinata solent cum menibus oppida mersis. Metaph 15, 2, 6, 1. And Virgil also mentions the current tradition of the origin of the Sicilian strait. Hec loca vi quondam et vasta convolsa ruina, tantum evi longinqua valet mutare vitustas, disluisse ferunt cum protenus utraque tellus una foret, venit medio vi pontus et undis hesperium siculo latus abscidit, arvaque et urbes litose diductas angusto interlo et estu. Ein, three, four, one, five. Also Valerius Flaccus alludes to it, Argonaut one five nine zero. Cum flens siculos e notrie fines perderet et medis intrarent montibus unde. It might be supposed that these islands acquired their form before they became the seat of animate beings. A proof that this was not the case is afforded by the fact that quadrupeds of the greatest bulk as elephants have been found fossil in islands of so small extent that such an animal could scarcely subsist in them for a single week fortis mem pour list nat d'italie cuvier sur les éléphants fossiles annal de musée tom huit end of note a fact of considerable weight and of the same general tendency with those which we have been considering is found in the comparison of the arctic and antarctic regions 
if species of animals were produced everywhere according to the agreement of climates with their natures without reference to stocks or to the possibility of migration from one quarter to another we should find the same quadrupeds in the tracts encircling the two poles but it is worthy of observation that not one of the numerous tribes which inhabit the inclement districts of the north and are unable to bear a passage through the warm and torrid zones is found to exist in the antarctic regions Note, this remark is not only true with respect to the land animals but has a more extensive application to the maritime tribes m m perron and le sieur observe that there is not a single animal of the northern ocean the specific characters of which are well known that is also found in the antarctic seas the species which most nearly resemble in these two opposite regions are yet clearly distinguished and this is the case not more remarkably among the tribes of complex structure than with those genera which have a more simple organization seem to admit of less variety in their nature qu'on examine say the above-mentioned naturalists nous ne disons pas le dori les aplicics les salpas les nerides les amphinodes les amphitrites et cette foule de mollusques et de vers qui se sont suscitement offerts à notre observation qu'on descende jusqu'au ilotrul au actini au berwell au medus qu'on s'abaisse même si l'on veut jusqu'à ces époges informes que tout le monde s'accorde à regarder comme le dernier terme de la dégradation ou plutôt de la simplicité de l'organisation animale dans cette multitude pour ainsi dire effrayante d'animaux antarctiques on verra qu'il n'est pas un seul qui se retrouve dans les mers boréales moreover the maritime animals which possess little power of self-extension prevail within narrow bounds in their respective latitudes the numerous animals which compose the family of medusae are evidently confined to a very limited extent each species is found in particular districts in astonishing abundance and is seen in no other place histoire du tous les animaux qui composent la famille des méduses par m m perron et le verseur and du museum tom quatorze the multitudes of testacea which adorn the shores of the austral seas obey the same law the haliotis gigantea and the facianelli which are so abundant on certain spots of the coast of van diemen's land that no one might load a vessel with them decrease towards the west are scarcely found at the land of Nuitz, and at king george's sound no longer exist the shores of timor pre-present an immense multitude of various and beautiful testacea not one of these extends so far as the southern coast of new holland m perron et lesieur sur les habitations des animaux marius annale du musée tome quinze many more arguments of similar effect might be collected from an accurate scrutiny of zoological history we find as m cuvier observes in many parts of the earth species which seem to be confined to the primary seats of their existence by seas which they have not been able to swim through or to fly over or by temperatures which they cannot endure or by tracts of mountains which they have been unable to pass on the whole it appears that it has not been the scheme of nature to cover distant parts of the earth with many animals of every kind at once but that a single stock of each species was first produced which was left to extend itself according as facilities of migration lay open to it or to find a passage by various accidents into countries removed at greater or less distances from the original point of propagation End of chapter three section three of particular species each species a single race segment two part fourteen of researches into the physical history of man this librivox recording is in the public domain read by john greenman section four of the peopling of distant regions 
holding therefore the primary production of one family in each kind to be the general law according to which providence has ordained the animal creation we shall proceed to consider some of the facts which relate to the migration of man into distant countries and to inquire whether any obstacles of considerable moment prevent our applying the general inference which we have drawn above to the particular instance of our own species the numerous islands which are scattered over the pacific ocean are inhabited by barbarous people who have a very imperfect navigation and seldom venture purposely out of sight of their own shores having no vessels but canoes of rude construction which are very unfit for making long voyages moreover the natives of many of these insular countries have no knowledge of any land beyond their own clusters of islands if but few opportunities had occurred to europeans of becoming acquainted with the nations of the south sea it would be thought very difficult to account for the population of these islands and this might be deemed an argument of great weight in favor of the notion of indigenous races accurate observations however on the manners and languages of these people have put it beyond doubt that they are all of one stock the languages of the new zealanders the natives of the society islands and the sandwich islands so nearly resemble some of the dialects spoken in the indian seas and in the neighborhood of new guinea that individuals from these various quarters mutually understand each other we are even informed on good authority that there is a marked and even in some instances a close affinity between the languages spoken in madagascar and in easter island the latter is about thirty four degrees distant from the coast of peru and seems to be the most remote settlement to which this widely scattered nation has reached all the islands which are situated more distantly in the pacific ocean are uninhabited a curious incident occurred in the last voyage of our celebrated navigator cook which serves to explain as that sensible writer has observed better than a thousand conjectures how detached parts of the earth especially those which lie far remote in the ocean may have been first peopled on this voyage captain cook was accompanied by omai a native of one of the society isles who had been brought to england the circumstance alluded to occurred at the discovery of the island watiu we shall insert the author's own account of it scarcely had he omai been landed upon the beach when he found among the crowd there assembled three of his own countrymen natives of the society isles at the distance of about two hundred leagues from these islands an immense unknown ocean intervening with such wretched sea-boats as their inhabitants are known to make use of and fit only for a passage where sight of land is scarcely ever lost such a meeting at such a place so accidentally visited by us may well be looked upon as one of those unexpected situations with which the writers of feigned adventures love to surprise their readers and which when they really happen in common life deserve to be recorded for their singularity it may well be guessed with what mutual surprise and satisfaction omai and his countrymen engaged in conversation their story as related by them is an affecting one about twenty persons in number of both sexes had embarked on board a canoe at otaheite to cross over to the neighboring island ulietia a violent contrary wind arising they could neither reach the latter nor get back to the former their intended passage being a very short one their stock of provision was scanty and soon exhausted the hardships they suffered while driven along by the storm they knew not whither are not to be conceived they passed many days without having anything to eat or drink their numbers gradually diminished worn out by famine and fatigue four men only survived when the canoe overset and then 
the perdition of this small remnant seemed inevitable. However, they kept hanging by the side of their vessel during some of the last days, till Providence brought them in sight of the people of this land, who immediately sent out canoes, took them off the wreck, and brought them ashore. One of the four were thus saved, one was since dead. Note. Cook's Voyages. An instance, perhaps still more extraordinary, is related in the Lettres Edifiantes et Curieuses of the arrival of thirty persons of both sexes in two canoes in the Isle of Samal, one of the Philippines. These people had been driven by storms from an island at three hundred leagues distance, and had been at sea seventy days. Note. Lettres Edifiantes et Curieuses Écrite des missions étrangères, tome 15. As the relation is very curious, and the work which contains it not generally accessible, I shall insert the most remarkable part of it. Nous arrivons, say the missionaries, à l'île de Samal, la dernière et la plus méridionale île de l'Indato Oriento. Nous y trouvons vingt neuf palaos nus habitants de ces îles nouvellement découvertes. Le vent d'Est, qui réguant sur ces murs depuis le mois de décembre jusqu'au mois de mai, les avoyant jetés à trois cents lieues de leur île, dans cette bourgade de l'île de Samal. Ils étaient venus sur deux petits vaisseaux. Voici comme ils racontent leur aventure. Ils s'étaient embarqués au nombre de trente-cinq personnes pour passer à une île voisine, lorsqu'il s'éleva un vent si violent que ne pouvant gagner l'île où ils voulaient aller, ni aucune autre du voisinage, ils furent emportés en haute mer. Ils firent plusieurs efforts pour aborder à quelque rivage ou à quelque île de leur connaissance, mais ce fut inutilement. Ils vogueront ainsi au gré des vents pendant soixante-dix jours sans pouvoir prendre terre. Enfin, perdant toute espérance de retourner en leur pays et se voyant un demi mort de faim, sans eau et sans vivre, ils résolurent de s'abandonner à la merci des vents et d'aborder à la première île qu'ils trouveraient du côté d'Occident. À peine eurent-ils pris cette résolution qu'ils se trouveront à la vue de l'île de Samal. Etc. Des trente-cinq qu'il était d'abord, il n'en restait plus que trente. End of note. Similar accidents are probably not uncommon in these seas, and we may thus account for many curious facts. It may thus have happened that the Sandwich Islands derived their stock of inhabitants from New Zealand. This fact appears to be clearly proved by the observations of Captain Cook and his companions on his last voyage. We have an instance of the migration of a race of savages still more surprising than those above related, since the inclemencies of climate were in the latter case added to other difficulties. The coast of Greenland is said to have been discovered by one Gunbeyen, who sailed from Iceland. The first colony which settled in the latter country was led thither by Thorwald, a Norwegian chieftain who fled on account of a murder he had committed. His son Eric, the red-headed, having perpetrated a similar crime, was expelled from the Ultime Thule and forced to seek refuge in some more distant region. He retired to Greenland, and, having spent some time there, returned and gave the Icelanders such alluring accounts of the country that he induced a numerous colony to follow him. Great numbers came afterwards both from Iceland and Norway, and stocked the country on the east and west side so extensively that they were computed to be a third part as numerous as a Danish Episcopal diocese. The settlement of Greenland happened about the year 982. At the period of the discovery of Greenland by the Norwegians, it was entirely uninhabited. The new settlers occupied the country from latitude 65 degrees on the east side of, to the same degree on the western shore. Many years after the era of these transactions, Leif, 
son of the red-headed eric being ambitious of becoming like his father a settler of colonies sailed in a ship with thirty-five men in a southwesterly direction from old greenland and in latitude forty-nine degrees he discovered a fertile country abounding with grapes which he denominated from that circumstance vinland from the situation of the latter place it must have been either newfoundland or canada and was most probably the latter for we know that wild grapes are found there and they have not been seen in the former country but the most curious circumstance in this story and the reason of our citing it is the discovery which was made in vinland of a nation of savages of diminutive stature who received on that account the name of skrolinger cuttings or dwarfs these people were described as pygmies two cubits in height and perfect savages they had however little boats covered with skins and arrows with which they assaulted the strangers it is surprising that this race of men were able notwithstanding the inclemencies of the climate and the extent of sea they had to traverse to make their appearance afterwards on the west shore of greenland they soon increased to such numbers that they gave much trouble by their hostility to the norwegian inhabitants and they are believed with the aid of a pestilential disease to have finally destroyed the european settlement in old greenland which was entirely lost sight of during the middle ages after it had subsisted some centuries and had become powerful and populous that the skrolings of greenland are really descended from the eskimo or savages of canada is put beyond question by the discovery of the danish missionaries that the languages spoken by the two nations are closely allied note Kranz, history of greenland dr reinhold forster's account of northern discoveries end of note with such examples as these offering themselves to our view we need not hesitate to conclude that the imagined difficulties of migration can never afford any argument in support of the opinion which supposes many nations to have sprung originally like the rats of the nile from the soil in which they now exist the greatest difficulty in the population of the world was long believed to be the introduction of inhabitants into america and many curious hypotheses were framed on this subject no doubt any longer subsists on this ground since the discovery of the near approach of the asiatic and american continents the inhabitants of the opposite shores appear to have some knowledge of each other at this day and even to carry on a sort of commercial intercourse note cook's last voyage from this quarter we may with probability derive the population of america and we find historical arguments to countenance such an hypothesis the ancient hieroglyphic tables of the aztecas record the principal epochs of the history of that nation note clavigero's history of mexico they state that the first colonists of mexico arrived after a long migratory march from a country far to the northeast which they denominate Aztlan. Ruins are found on the river Gila, which attest the truth of this narration, and further to the north, on the western coast of America, between Cook and Nootka River, the natives preserve still the taste for hieroglyphic paintings and decided characters of Aztec origin. Note Humboldt's Political Essay on New Spain, Volume 1 a short vocabulary of the language spoken on this remote coast collected by mr anderson who accompanied cook in his last voyage so clearly resembles the mexican that the affinity cannot be mistaken in the northwestern parts of asia the chutski and some other tribes are said to be similar in their persons and manners to the natives of america perhaps they are a remnant of the nation who have not migrated many curious traits in the character of the aztecs their hieroglyphics their pyramidical buildings some of their religious dogmas and their advancement in astronomical science point to an asiatic origin note ibid dr barton of pennsylvania has an elaborate comparison of the languages of america with those of eastern asia discovered many strongly marked traces of affinity between them note 
New Views on the Origin of the Tribes and Nations of America by B. Smith Barton, M.D., Philadelphia, 1798. And the same notion receives confirmation from the resemblance which subsists in the osteological characters of the skull between the Native American and Mongolic tribes. The Asiatic origin of the Aztecas cannot be denied to stand attested by many historical arguments, but it is supposed by some that, though this was a foreign colony, the rest of the American tribes were indigenous. This notion is refuted by observing, first, that the Aztecas were a whole nation which migrated, and not an army which came to subdue countries already settled. Note, Clavillero ubi supra and secondly that the physical characters of the aztecas as described in ancient paintings and as exhibited in the persons of their descendants the present mexicans are precisely of the same description with those of the other native american races note ibid et humboldt ubi supra who have so remarkable a resemblance to each other hence we must conclude that the aztecas were a tribe of the same family or a nation of kindred origin with the Indians, as they are called of the western continent, and that the whole stock came from the same quarter. On the whole it appears that we may, with a high degree of probability, draw the inference that all the different races into which the human species is divided originated from one family. End of section 4. Of the Peopling of Distant Regions Part 15 of Researches into the Physical History of Man. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain, read by John Greenman. Chapter 4 On the Structure of the Parts in Which the Variety of Color Subsists, and on the Nature of This Diversity. Section 1 General Anatomical Observations. Before we proceed to inquire into the causes which produce the varieties of color in mankind, it will be necessary to examine with attention the organization of the parts in which the diversity subsists. The only anatomist who has made any accurate researches into the structure of these parts is the late Xavier Bichat. We shall abstract the most remarkable of his observations on this subject. On the organization of the skin. The skin, considered anatomically, consists of two principal parts, viz the true skin, or chorion, as Bichat has denominated it, and the epidermis, cuticle, or scarf skin, the cutaneous reticle, or rete mucosum, of Malfighi, is situated between the chorion and the cuticle. It is on this substance that the variety of color depends. 1. The chorion is very remarkable in thickness being on the anterior part of the body scarcely half as thick as on the posterior. Its texture also varies in different parts of the body. On the sole of the foot and on the palm of the hand, the interior surface of the chorion, when accurately detached from the cellular substance, exhibits an infinite number of white fibers, shining like aponeurotic fibers, which, rising from the said surface, cross each other in different directions, leaving innumerable interstices between them, and becoming more detached, are lost in the cellular substance. The interstices are filled with fat, the chorion, which covers the breast, abdomen, back, the limbs, etc., differs from the above portion in the appearance of the fibers, which are much less distinct and less connected with the cellular substance and in the extent of the interstices which are much smaller. On the back of the hands, on the upper part of the feet, and on the forehead, the interior surface of the chorion is smooth, white, and of dense texture. When the skin has been macerated some time, the fibers of the chorion become more distinct, and the interstices are more nearly marked. We then perceive that the latter exist not only on the internal surface, but extend themselves into the texture, which appears truly cribriform through its whole substance. When the cuticle is carefully separated by a maceration from the external surface of the chorion, we perceive on the latter a number of minute foramina, which enter obliquely into its texture, 
and have communication with the interstices of the inner surface and interior structure. Through these openings the hairs, the exhalant, absorbent, and sanguineous vessels, and the nerves pass to the external surface of the chorion. Thus, in order to have a true conception of this body, we must consider it as a reticulated or porous texture, of which the cells are more extensive internally and diminish towards the exterior surface. The substance of the interstitial texture which constitutes the chorion is in many respects similar to the fibers of the ligaments. The sensibility of the skin and its other functions do not reside in the portion of it, which we have been describing, but in the vascular and nervous structures. For the sensitive and morbid phenomena of the skin have but little relation to the texture of the chorion or cutis vera, but are manifestly exterior to it. The sensibility of the skin is the property of the nervous papillae, which arise from the exterior surface of the chorion, and are probably prolongations of nervous fibers which pass through the interstices. The functions of the skin, which have reference to the circulation, reside principally in the cutaneous reticle, or rete mucosum. 2. The cutaneous reticle. The idea which physiologists have entertained of the rete mucosum since the time of Malpighi, who first described it, has been that of a layer of mucous substance poured out by vessels on the surface of the chorion and there remaining stagnant in a fluid state. Bichat has shown that there is no ground for this opinion of its nature. The mucous substance can never be collected or exhibited by the most accurate anatomical processes, which seems to prove that it does not exist. If a piece of skin be cut longitudinally, we discover very distinctly the line which separates the chorion from the epidermis, and nothing like an extravasated substance is found between them. It appears that the cutaneous reticle consists in reality of a very fine texture of vessels which passing through the numerous foramina of the chorion extend themselves in a very attenuated form over its external surface. The existence of this vascular network, says Bichat, is proved by very fine injections which change entirely the color of the skin externally, while they have but little effect on it within. This reticle, as I have already remarked, is the principal seat of the numerous eruptions which are for the most part foreign to the chorion itself. We may therefore conceive the reticular fabric as a general capillary system surrounding the cutaneous organ and forming together with the papillae an intermediate layer between the chorion and the cuticle. This system of vessels contains fluids of different shades in black and tawny people. The coloring of the skin is therefore similar to that of the hair, which manifestly depends on a fluid contained in capillary tubes. It is also analogous in its nature to neva materni, or the dark spots which exist upon the skins of white people from the period of birth. In the latter no fluid has been discovered to be deposited between the chorion and cuticle. 3. The epidermis, or cuticle, is the external covering of the body, endowed with scarcely any characters of life. It consists of a single lamina, throughout the greater part of its extent, but in the palms of the hands and soles of the feet there are more than one. It is perforated by holes for the transmission of hairs and the exhalant and absorbent vessels. The cuticle and the chorion are of the same color in the European and in the Negro. Of the Organization of the Hair All the hairs originate in the cellular substance beneath the skin. Each hair is enclosed at its origin in a small membranous canal which is transparent, and through which, when nicely dissected, the body of the hair is distinctly seen. This cylindrical canal accompanies the hair to the corresponding pore in the skin, passes through it, and goes on to the cuticle. It proceeds no further, but is lost in the texture of this membrane. The length of the canal is about five lines for the hairs of the head. 
The internal surface of the canal is not adherent to the filament, except at the base of the latter, where the hair appears to receive its nourishment. If this adhesion be destroyed, the hair may be drawn out of the canal, as through a sheath, being nowhere connected. The hair at its base, where it adheres to the canal, is somewhat fuller than through the rest of its course. The adhesion is probably produced by vessels, which here enter into the filament. Possibly nerves are also extended to the hairs. It has been commonly said that the hair does not pierce the cuticle, but raises it and is accompanied by a prolongation of it in the form of a sheath. This is not the fact. The cuticle imparts nothing additional to the hair, which is as large before its exit from the cutaneous pore as it is beyond. The exterior cylinder of the hair resembles the cuticle in its nature, though it differs from it in some respects, as in offering greater resistance to the effect of maceration and boiling. This external portion of the hair has none of the properties of vitality. The internal portion of the hair consists apparently of two systems of minute vessels. In one of these, the coloring matter remains in the form of a stagnant fluid. The other has the functions of the vascular system in general, and affords a passage to excreted fluids. The vascular and vital nature of this portion of the hair is proved by various phenomena. Passions of the mind have remarkable effect on the color of the hair. Excessive grief has been known to render it white in a very short space of time, producing evidently an absorption of the fluid contained in the vascular fabric. Some authors have doubted these facts, but Bichat assures us that he has observed at least five or six examples in which such a discoloration has taken place in less than eight days. The hair of one person known to our author became almost entirely white in the course of one night after the receipt of some intelligence which affected him with poignant grief. The plica polonica, in which the hairs transude blood, is a proof of their ordinary vascularity and vitality. Note, see Bichat's Anatomie Générale sur le système dermoide, épidermoide et pile. End of note. That there is a connection between the hue of the hair and the complexion has been always a matter of common observation, but it appears by the anatomical observations detailed above that the peculiar structure in which the color of each resides is very exactly similar. The matter which imparts the tint to both is contained in a minute transparent vascular texture in a fluid state. It is a peculiar secretion produced without doubt in an appropriate glandular apparatus. It is an interesting inquiry what and where are the organs which secrete this fluid. Some curious observations have lately been published on the organization of the skin and on the causes of its color by M. Gautier of the Faculty of Medicine in Paris, which appear to have been accurately made. Note, Recherche sur l'organisation de la peau de l'homme et sur les causes de sa coloration par M. Gautier de la Faculté de Médecine à Paris. End of note. They tend to establish the fact that the secretion which imparts color to the hair and to the skin is identical, and that the fluid contained in both sets of vessels is secreted in the bulbs or roots of the hairs. This opinion was formed from an attentive observation of the phenomena which occur after the black reticular texture in the skin of the negro has been destroyed by vesication and on the process of its reproduction. The black matter first appears at the pores through which the hairs make their exit. From these points, as from centers, it is gradually seen radiating in different directions, and it insensibly proceeds to cover the whole space which had lost its color. It appears indeed highly probable that the hairy bulbs are the principal seats of this secretion. Some parts of the body which are most completely devoid of hair as the soles of the feet and the palms of the hands, are in the negro of a much lighter shade than the rest of the body. Still it is not possible that the bulbs can be the only seat of the secretions of this substance, 
for the skin of the negro is black in parts which have no hair, as on the lips. The glandular fabric which secretes the color for the hair is apparently spread to a certain degree over the whole of the corian. End of Part 15 Section 1 General Anatomical Observations Part 16 of Researches into the Physical History of Man. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain, read by John Greenman. Section 2 Comparison of Different Races. The color of the skin is always the same with that of the hair. In the Negro, both are of a deep black. In the Mongol Tartar, and in very swarthy Europeans, the hair is of the above color, and the skin has a tinge of black, though more dilute or of a much lighter shade than in the negro. In fair people with black hair the skin is nearly colorless, the secretion becoming very faint, but still the complexion is materially different from that of persons who have light or red hair. In the latter the skin has a reddish cast and is often more or less beset with reddish patches and freckles. The coloring matter or pigment of the eye, which bears a constant relation in its hue to that of the hair and skin, must be considered as a secretion probably analogous to that above mentioned. These secretions depend on vital action for their production, and a certain degree of energy is required in the secreting action for the formation of the coloring matter when by a great diminution of the powers of life the vascular action becomes destroyed or suspended a defect of color is the consequence thus in the weakness of old age the color of the hair fails there is an uniform connection between the shade of color and the density and firmness in the texture of the parts of which the color depends in the albino the cutaneous reticle is very thin if not altogether deficient, and the complexion is formed by the white corion or cutis. A similar appearance is produced in animals when the skin has been destroyed, for the reticle is not readily reproduced. We see on horses spots of white hair growing on any part which has suffered injury. The pigment of the eye also is defective in the albino, and from this cause arises the excessive sensibility to light for which such persons are remarkable. Note, Blumenbach, Hunter on the Animal Oconomy. End of note. The blood in the vessels of the choroid imparts a tint to the light which passes through the iris, hence this assumes a reddish hue, and the pupil has a much deeper shade of the same color. The hair of the albino is quite white, or very slightly inclined to the flaxen color, and is remarkably soft and firm in its texture. In the second, or yellow-haired variety, the same general modification prevails in a less degree. The cutaneous reticle and the pigment of the eye are thinner than they are in the black-haired race. The hair is in general much finer, note Haller, Elementa Physiology, and smaller in the filament, even in the European, when it is light in color, than when black. The shades in the color of the reticle, the pigment, and the hair bear an evident relation to the degree of tenuity. This variety holds therefore a middle place between the albino and the black-haired European, and the latter variety again seems to be intermediate between the yellow-haired races and those of complexion still darker than its own color. The Mongols, and the Americans have remarkably thick and strong hair, which is always quite black, and their eyes and complexions are dark. Lastly, in the negro the cutaneous reticle is much more firm and dense than in any other race. Note Ibid. End of section 2. Comparison of different races. Part 17 of Researches into the Physical History of Man. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain, read by John Greenman. Section 3 Physiological Observations. It therefore appears that a part of the difference between the light colored varieties and the dark 
consists in the greater laxity of fiber and fineness of texture in these parts in the former races and in their increased firmness and density in the latter it is probable that a strong secretive action produces the black substance which gives color to the negro and that as the strength of the secretive action diminishes the complexion is proportionably lighter till in the lowest stage of action when it is nearly defective or when it altogether fails we have the colorless skin of the albino or the white hair of old age this idea of the nature of the diversity receives confirmation from the fact that the general character of the constitution is more delicate or less robust in proportion to the lightness of the complexion the lighter the color the greater is the delicacy and laxity of the fiber and the more exquisite is the sensibility of the nervous system albinos though healthy have a weaker fabric of body than individuals of a different complexion and various debilitating causes sometimes produce phenomena which approach to the peculiar character of albinos the hoariness of old age has been mentioned white spots have sometimes appeared on the skins of negroes after fevers or other debilitating distempers the oxen of hungary become white after emasculation the change in this case being evidently the effect of laxity and debility note blumenbach de l'unité du genre humain traduit en francois End of note. white rabbits are more delicate and weaker than those of darker color and the black are the most robust of all the feet of horses are well known to be weak and subject to disease from slight injury when they are white near the joints from such observations lord bacon called white the color of defect the second variety of color in the human species mentioned in the foregoing pages includes those constitutions which are designated as the sanguineous and phlegmatic temperaments the external marks which distinguish them are a very fair complexion with red flaxen or light sandy hair and blue or gray eyes the common character of these constitutions according to medical and physiological writers is a relaxed and delicate note gregory's conspectus medicae theoretica volume one hoffman de temperamento fundamento morborum etc haller ubi supra this division of temperaments is by no means a fanciful distinction the connection of external characters of body with certain peculiarities in the internal organization on which are founded predispositions to various morbid states and to particular mental habits and passions has been remarked in very early times medical and physiological writers have on this principle agreed to divide the constitutions of person which prevail in europe into four classes which are designated as sanguine phlegmatic choleric and melancholic temperaments the sanguine is characterized by red or flaxen hair blue eyes a fair booming complexion the arteries and veins large and situated near the surface and the pulse full and frequent the skin soft thin and delicate and the stature often considerable the phlegmatic is distinguished by pale sandy or whitish hair light gray eyes a pallid unhealthy white skin almost bereft of hair small blood vessels and a weak slow pulse these are the external characters of sanguine and phlegmatic temperaments and the constitution or habit of body which is connected with the former class is possessed of a full and free circulation of blood with a perfect and vigorous condition of those functions which depend on it as copious and healthy secretions and excretions and great sensibility and irritability of the nervous system this temperament is predisposed to all those diseases which consist in excess in its peculiar habitudes as distempers of an inflammatory nature and of too great excitement the moral or mental constitution connected with this habit of body consists of an acute and highly irritable mind 
which receives quick and strong sensations, possesses rapid and lively associations of ideas and feelings, is subject to vehement emotions and passions, and naturally prone to excess in the indulgence of them. Persons of the sanguine temperament are reputed to have a high enjoyment of the pleasure of life and to be constitutionally generous, ardent, and voluptuous. The peculiar habit which is found to be conjoined with the external marks of the phlegmatic temperament consists of a slow and languid circulation of blood with the other circumstances which are dependent on this defect, viz. scanty and imperfect secretions, torpor and insensibility of the nervous system, and muscular inactivity. The morbid affections to which this constitution is predisposed are the numerous diseases of direct debility or deficient excitement, obstructions of the glandular systems, scruffles, tubes, etc. The mental character is dull and insensible, without that flaw of ideas and cheerful alacrity which the sanguine enjoy, but at the same time the phlegmatic are capable of more fixed and intense thought. It is said that they are more prone to superstition, avarice, cowardice, etc., than persons of an opposite temperament, but it is difficult to believe that these vices can be connected with any peculiar constitution of the body. The external characters of the choleric temperament are black and curling hair, dark eyes, the complexion swarthy and at the same time ruddy, a thick, rough, hairy skin, a strong and full pulse. The melancholic temperament is also noted for black hair and eyes, and a dark complexion. But the hair is straight and lank, and the skin inclined to a yellowish cast. The pulse is slow. In the internal habit of body and in the mental constitution, the choleric temperament borders very closely on the sanguine and the melancholic on the phlegmatic. It is said that the temperaments of dark complexion possess stronger corporeal fabric and greater fortitude of mind than the corresponding temperaments of light color, that the choleric is more prone to anger and the melancholic to insanity. Some difference results from the laxity or density of fiber. If this peculiarity be set out of the question, there are only two temperaments, viz. the irritable and the torpid. When a full evolution of the sanguiferous system and great sensibility of the nervous system occur in the light-haired or dark-haired race, they constitute in the former the sanguineous, in the latter the choleric temperament. Torpor of the nervous system and defective circulation of blood produce in the light-haired variety the phlegmatic constitution, and in the other that which is denominated melancholic. End of note. The common character of these constitutions, according to medical and physiological writers, is a relaxed and delicate fiber and a fine texture, though without that degree of tenuity and debility which is found in the albino. The third variety, to which the black-haired European belongs, contains the choleric and melancholic temperaments. These are noted to possess more strength and vigor, and to be endowed with a firmer and denser fiber. But all the races of men of white or light complexion are less robust and less capable of enduring fatigue and the inclemencies of climate than those of more sable hue. The fortitude with which the North American savage sustains the hardships of toilsome marches, of excessive cold and want, and the tortures which the malice of his enemies inflict upon him is proverbial. The negro exceeds all other races in the firmness and density of his fabric. Europeans become debilitated and subject to a variety of fatal diseases in hot countries, which the negro entirely escapes. The relaxation of a hot climate is intolerable to European females, while the negro women bear it without injury. Nor does the difference depend upon habit for white people born in tropical countries are subject in a great degree to the same infirmities with their ancestors, and a similar diversity of constitution appears to prevail in races which have inhabited the same climate 
from an immemorial period. May we, therefore, venture to compare the lighter varieties in the human race to the finer and more delicate specimens in other kinds, which are often endowed with variegated tints, with symmetrical forms, and a more beautiful appearance than the ruder stock from which they sprang, while we find in the latter an analogy to the darker races of men, to the hardy children of nature, whose rigid fiber endures the inclement influence of the seasons? End of section 3. Physiological Observations Part 18 of Researches into the Physical History of Man. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain, read by John Greenman. Chapter 5 of the Causes Which Have Produced the Diversities of the Human Species. Section 1 of the Opinion of Buffon and His Followers. The first persons who began to reason concerning the difference in the color and aspect of Europeans and Africans or at least the oldest writers whose remarks on this subject have reached our times, attributed the dark complexion of the latter people to the burning of their skins by the intense heat of the sun, and the crisp texture of their hair to the dissipation of moisture produced by the same cause. We find this opinion delivered in some verses of Theodectus, preserved by Strabo. Hois an hitermon helios di frelaton scote non anthos exechros e lignuos, e somatandron, cae sunetreps en comas morphais anauxetois i syntexas puros. Note, Strabo, Lib. 14. The other ancient writers in general held the same notion with little variation, among whom we reckon Herodotus, Posidonius, and Strabo. Tibullus has expressed it in these verses, Illicint comites fusci quos india torret solis, et ad motis inficit ignis equis. Note, Tibullus, Lib. 2, Clay 3. End of note. It was very natural for the Greeks, who were accustomed to consider their own nation as the most ancient of mankind, and as the immediate offspring of the gods, to take themselves as the model of the human species, and to proceed to account for the peculiarities of foreign people from any circumstances connected with their situation. They had no knowledge of any black races of men, except such as inhabited the hot countries of Ethiopia and India. They entertained a very exaggerated idea of the solar heat in the torrid zone, and fancied it sufficient to burn up and destroy all animal and vegetable productions. Moreover, they observed that the effect of fire is to incinerate and blacken whatever substances are touched by it. Hence, being much addicted to loose analogical reasonings on all physical subjects, they were induced to believe that the dark color of the southern people is produced by the scorching effect of a hot climate. But the moderns have in general adopted implicitly the sentiments of the ancients on this matter, and a writer of the last age of justly acquired celebrity has labored to systematize the facts which he considered as leading to the opinion above mentioned, and to deduce a similar conclusion in a logical and inductive manner. After giving a general view of the condition of the human race, and of the variations of their aspect in different countries, as far as the hitherto inaccurate descriptions of travelers enabled him to estimate them, he draws the general inference that the heat of the climate is the chief cause of the black complexion in the human species. Where the heat is excessive, says he, as in Senegal and Guinea, the men are perfectly black. Where it is less violent, the blackness is not so deep. Where it becomes somewhat temperate, as in Barbary, Mogul, Arabia, etc., the men are only brown. And lastly, where it is altogether temperate, as in Europe and Asia, the men are white. Note, Buffon, Ibist, not translated by Smelly. End of note. 
If this description were universally or even in general accurate, there would be no doubt that the Count de Buffon was right in his grand conclusion, although he might have erred in explaining the rationale of the effect. But even in his time some very wide deviations from this regular gradation were known, and several tribes of very dark-colored people had been found to be aboriginal possessors of cold countries, as the Greenlanders, Samoyeds, and Laplanders, the former of whom, as the Count tells us, are some of them as black as the Africans. This exception, however, he made to agree with his hypothesis by assuming that it is not the heat by itself, but the aridity of the air which blackens the skin, and that the frozen atmosphere of Greenland is equally dry with the torrid air of Guinea. Buffon has great merit in discarding the absurd attempts of some of his predecessors to explain the phenomena in question by blackness of the bile, or by supposing the negro to be affected with a permanent jaundice. He trusted entirely to the power of the sun, and held that the same cause which makes our complexions brown after much exposure to the heat and air renders the negroes black. No unknown cause is here assumed, although a more than adequate effect may be attributed to one that is known. The acquired hue is supposed to increase in every generation through a long course of time till the shade of color becomes such as we see it in the negro. Later writers have thought differently from Buffon on the extent of the influence of the sun, and it is remarkable that they have resorted again to the same resource which that author considered as unavailable. Dr. S. S. Smith, a respectable writer of America, in an essay on the complexion and figure of the human species, builds a considerable part of his theory on the changes of the bile supposed to be occasioned by heat. He tells us that the principle of color is not to be derived solely from the action of the sun upon the skin. Heat produces relaxation. The bile in consequence, is augmented and shed through the whole mass of the body. This liquor tinges the complexion of a yellow color, which assumes by time a darker hue. Bile exposed to the sun and air is known to change its color to black. Black is therefore the tropical hue. Note, Dr. S. S. Smith on the causes of the variety in the complexion and figure of the human species. End of note. Dr. Smith may be excused for falling into an absurd theory on a subject of physiology, but it is really astonishing to find such a writer as Blumenbach adopting a similar mode of reasoning. He seems to consider the black complexion of Negroes as depending in a great degree on a superabundant secretion of bile occasioned by heat. Carbonaceous matter, according to him, abounds in the atrabilious temperament, and a sympathy subsisting between the liver and the skin, that substances thrown out by the action of the vessels of the cutis, precipitated by the oxygen of the atmosphere, and fixed in the rete mucosum. Note. Blumenbach, De l'unité de du genre humain, page 149. End of note. If this theory is to be understood, it refers the effect upon the skin to the liver as the primary seat, the increased function of which produces in the negro a kind of hereditary icterus or cholera morbus. Our author endeavors to render this notion less improbable by telling us that nature in the course of generations has a wonderful power of accommodating herself to the action of hereditary distempers so that they become continually less troublesome, and at length scarcely occasion any disturbance. Note, Ibid, page 132. End of note. Thus it seems that these writers would have us believe that all black people labor under an inveterate hereditary jaundice, which has subsisted so long that they have lost all feeling of their distempered state and fancy themselves in perfect health. A man of so much judgment as Blumenbach possesses must be in great want of resources 
before he would adopt such as these. It is scarcely necessary to observe that the negro, in his usual state, has no symptom whatever of any excess in the secretion of bile, but on the contrary exhibits more vigor of constitution, especially in warm climates, than Europeans. It is absurd to suppose that the essence of disease remains, while nothing appears but the phenomena of health. These authors have deteriorated the theory of Buffon. They perceived that the cause assigned by him was insufficient for explaining the appearances, and chose to call in the aid of other means, from the adoption of which the Count judiciously abstained. The theory of the French naturalist must stand or fall by its own deserts, and receives no assistance from this subsidiary hypothesis. The fact which is the basis of it is true, viz., that the skin of the fairest European is very much darkened by exposure to the air and sun. Our rustics, and especially our seafaring people, acquire a hue very different from the delicate complexion of females who are constantly protected from the influence of the weather, and this effect is much greater in hotter countries. But the offspring of individuals so embrowned are born with the original color, not with the acquired hue of their parents. At least it is certain that there is no perceptible difference in the descendants of persons who have sustained the effect of exposure to a hot climate during several generations and we very fairly infer that the same observation would apply in any repeated succession. Here, then, the question should be laid at rest according to the common rules of reasoning, and it should be concluded that the cause assigned for the black color of the negro is wholly inadequate. But the authors who support a contrary opinion have recourse to a subtitle method of argument, they tell us that the progeny of parents exposed to hot climates are really somewhat darker in consequence, though the difference is so slight as to escape our most accurate observation, and they contend that the effect increasing in every generation has, in a long course of ages, been sufficient to produce a black color of the deepest tint. This is like an appeal from experience to supposed probability but they attempt to defend it by two sorts of arguments, first by producing examples in which the change imagined is said actually to have taken place in tribes of white people who have removed to a hot climate, and secondly by showing that the complexion prevalent in each country is darker or lighter in proportion to its proximity to or distance from the equator due allowance being made for other causes which produce variety in the climates, and for the modifying effect of the manners of the inhabitants. Among the examples adduced, that of the Jewish nation is one which has been much insisted upon. These people are descended from one stock, and are prevented by their religious institutions from intermarrying with other nations. Yet it is said that they have acquired the complexion prevalent in every country into which they have been dispersed, being fair in Britain and Germany, brown in France and in Turkey, swarthy in Portugal and in Spain, olive in Syria and in Chaldez, tawny or copper-colored in Arabia and Egypt. Note Dr. S. S. Smith, page 24. End of note. This is an inaccurate statement of facts, for if the subject be examined, it will be found that the Jews, where they have not mixed their stock by intermarriages with the indigenous people, have in no place varied considerably from their primitive complexion. It is not easy to ascertain precisely the physical characters of ancient nations, but from some passages in the scriptures it would appear that the Jews in the time of their monarchs of the house of David resembled the inhabitants of the south of Europe in their complexion. Note, many passages in the Old Testament, and particularly Solomon's song, Cap 5, ver. 10, My beloved is white and ruddy, the chiefest among ten thousand. His head is as the most fine gold. His locks are bushy and black as a raven. The sense of the Hebrew word, Sash, translated white, is very definite. 
it is applied elsewhere to milk and is rendered in this place deukoch by the septuagint see also lament jeremiah cap four v seven end of note they had black bushy hair and a white skin with some variety probably as we see in all races and acquiring a darker hue in consequence of exposure to heat and air and this is the natural complexion of the arabs whether in syria or in the deserts of arabia and of the inhabitants of the northern coast of africa the natural or hereditary color of any race of people is to be determined by the complexion of the women and children who are not subject to be tanned or scorched by the sun that the complexion of the nations above mentioned is such as we have stated it to be is declared by all travelers into the countries referred to dr shaw and mr bruce inform us that the children born on the barbary coast are in their infancy very white and that the girls remain so but the boys being early exposed to the sun become brown Note, dr shaw's travels monsieur bruce assure says buffon que non seulement les enfants des barbaresques sont fort blancs en naissant mais il ajoute un fait que je ne trouvais nulle part c'est que les femmes qui habitent dans les villes de barbarie sont d'une blancheur presque rebutante d'un blanc de marbre qui tranche trop avec le rouge très vif de leurs joues buffon East Nat Tom Sank. End of note. Bruce says the women have a complexion so white that it forms too strong a contrast with the red of their lips and cheeks. Buffon has given other authorities for the same fact, and I have repeatedly heard the account confirmed by judicious travelers who have had much intercourse with the natives of the African coast. Note. See several authorities quoted by Buffon. End of note. Poiret tells us that the Moors are not naturally black in spite of the proverb and the opinion of many writers, but that they are born white and remain so all their lives when their labors do not cause them to be exposed to the heat of the sun. In the cities the women have a complexion of so clear a white that they would eclipse the greater number of our Europeans but the moorish women of the mountains continually scorched by the sun and almost always half naked acquire from their infancy a brown cast note blumenbach de l'unité du genre humain end of note similar accounts are given by travelers in the turkish provinces of asia la boulay informs us that the arabian women of the desert are born fair but that their complexions are spoiled by being continually exposed to the sun, that the young girls are very agreeable. Note, Voyage de la Bouaille Lagou, quoted by Buffon. End of note. Mr. Bruce gives the same account of the Southern Arabians. Note, Bruce's Travels, Book One, Chapter Twelve. End of note. Monsieur de la Roque, in his travels in Arabia, gives testimony to the same fact the arabian princes and ladies says he whom i have seen through the corners of the tents appeared to me very beautiful and well made it may be judged by these and by the accounts which i have received that others are not less handsome they are white because they are always protected from the sun the women of the common people are extremely tawny Note, voyage dans la panistine par M. de la Roque, Paris, 1717. End of note. M. Bellon says, There is not a woman in Asia, however mean her condition, who has not a complexion fresh as a rose, and whose skin is not as fair, delicate, and smooth as velvet. Note. Observation de Pierre Bellon, cited by Buffon. End of note. Volney informs us that the complexion of the Druze in Syria and of the people near mount lebanon is not different from that of the french in the middle provinces the women of damascus and tripoli he adds are greatly celebrated on account of their fair complexions note, voyage en syrie par m volney end of note. now since the natural complexion of all the nations above mentioned is white it cannot be supposed that the jews who reside among them 
have received an impression from the climate of which the other inhabitants of the same countries are insusceptible, and that they are brown in some districts and tawny or olive or copper-colored in others. The complexion of the ancient Hebrew race was similar to that of the nations of Syria, Arabia, and Barbary, and the Jews who are scattered through these countries are equally with the other inhabitants born white, and remain so until they sustain the influence of a hot climate, from which they acquire a deeper hue. In England the Jews commonly retain their black hair, and the characters which are ascribed to the choleric and melancholic temperaments, so that they have in general a shade of complexion somewhat darker than that of the English people, who are for the most part of the sanguine constitution. It is therefore evident that Dr. Smith's assertion concerning the Jews affords no countenance to his hypothesis, since it refers to the complexion acquired by external causes, and not to the natural or hereditary color. The most curious facts we have concerning the complexion of this nation are those which are related of the Jews settled at Cochin on the Malabar coast, with whom we have become better acquainted since the visit lately paid to them by that excellent apostle of the East, Dr. Claudius Buchanan. He informs us that there are two sorts of them, the white or Jerusalem Jews and the black Jews. The former have kept their race distinct. It appears by their records, which Dr. Buchanan considers as authentic, that they migrated to India soon after the destruction of the temple by Titus Vespasian, and that they afterwards obtained grants of territory and privileges of which they have documents bearing date in the year A.M. 4250 or A.D. 490. They resemble the European Jews in complexion and features. But the black Jews are a mixed race and are looked upon as an inferior caste. Their ancestors having intermarried with the natives, they have acquired the Hindu complexion and features. Note Dr. Claudius Buchanan's Christian Researches in Asia. End of note. Dr. Francis Buchanan also mentions a tribe of Nazarene Christians whom he visited on the Malabar coast. Their papa, he says, though his family had been settled in the country for many generations, was very fair, with high Jewish features. The greater part of his flock resembled the aborigines of the country, from whom indeed they were descended. Note, Dr. Francis Buchanan's journey through Mysore, Kanara, and Malabar. End of note. Hence it sufficiently appears that the instance of the Jews, instead of affording so triumphant a proof of Dr. Smith's opinion, has very considerable weight in the contrary scale, and might be almost sufficient to show that the white complexion will be permanent during any length of time for we find it subsisting perfect in the midst of the blacks of Malabar, though exposed to the darkening effect of an Indian climate during almost the whole Christian era. The story of some Portuguese who settled in the year 1500 on the coast of Guinea, and whose descendants have now the complexion and features of Negroes, has been held up as a signal proof of this theory. Blumenbach has, however, very properly remarked that these colonists were not accompanied by any women of their own country, and that the change in their offspring is to be attributed to intermarriages with the natives of Africa. It would be very surprising if this cause had not produced a complete assimilation in the course of three hundred years. Note, Blumenbach de Gen Hume Var Nat. End of note. The Anglo-Americans are mentioned by Dr. Smith, as affording an example of a similar change affected by climate. The people of all the southern states have acquired a sickly and sallow aspect, which is very striking to a stranger who lands on their shores. The lowlanders, as he informs us, of the Carolinas and of Georgia degenerate to a complexion that is but a few shades lighter than that of the Iroquois. I speak of the poor and laborious classes of the people. Note, Dr. S. S. Smith, Ubi Supra. The effect of the solar heat in these countries 
in deepening the complexion of those who are exposed to it in the labors of agriculture together with the influence of bilious diseases which are here very prevalent among the white people must produce a considerable change in the aspect of the inhabitants it would be ridiculous to refuse assent to this part of the statement before us since it is analogous to facts which we receive from all quarters a similar alteration would probably be produced in europeans who should go to the marshes of carolina and betake themselves to the labors of the natives especially if they were removed thither in their infancy so that the future growth of the body might be subjected to the influence of the relaxing and nauseous causes which are prevalent there but that the race of anglo-americans has in any part of their settlements undergone unequivocally an approximation to the characters of the indians is an assertion quite contrary to the testimony which i have repeatedly received from unprejudiced and well-informed natives of america and from travelers in that country it is apparent that dr smith has not discriminated between the native complexion of the people and the hue acquired by exposure to the sun by hard labor and by the influence of local diseases m g Eriot, a respectable writer whose opinion on this subject is of weight since he had no favorite opinion to support expressly assures us that the anglo-americans have not made the least approach towards the complexion of the indians he is induced by this circumstance to infer that the color of the latter does not depend on climate note harriet hist of canada if the climate of north america exerts so powerful an agency on the settlers in that country a similar effect should a fortiori be produced in the west indies but i have been assured by many natives of these islands that there is no perceptible difference in color between the inhabitants of them and the english people except what arises from exposure to a hotter sun the women and children are equally fair with those born in britain persons who are descended from ancestors of the sanguine temperament have still the blue eyes and light hair which characterize that constitution though their forefathers were among the earliest settlers in the country west indians who have resided some years in england become as fair as any of the natives of our island mr long in his history of jamaica affirms that the children born in england have not in general lovelier or more transparent skins than the offspring of white parents in jamaica note long's hist of jamaica end of note at the time of the grand rebellion a hundred and forty years ago says mr white many families went from england to jamaica whose descendants are in the predicament above mentioned note white on the gradation of the human species end of note the same author assures us on good authority that spanish families which have resided in south america and have avoided intermarriages with people of india or of mixed race remain as white as any europeans it would be very easy to add a number of examples tending to prove the permanency of the white complexion in races of people who reside under the influence of a hot climate i shall mention only two instances of this kind which occur to my memory at present one of them is the race of fair people who inhabit the neighborhood of jibel aures or mons arusius in africa and who have been visited and described by dr shaw and dr bruce the last writer says that if they are not as fair as the english they are of a shade lighter than that of any inhabitants to the southward of britain their hair also was red and their eyes blue these authors suppose them to be the descendants of the vandals who are mentioned by procopius to have been defeated in this neighborhood note shaw's travels bruce's travels introduction end of note the navayettes or moslem settlers of concan afford another instance of similar effect these people migrated from iraq in the first century of the hegira they systematically avoided intermarriages with the natives even with mohammedan families for many centuries after the establishment of the latter in the deccan 
consequently they have preserved their complexion and there are even now some never yet whose countenances approach the european freshness note major wilkes history of mysore End of note. had they persisted in maintaining the purity of their stock the same would probably have been their universal character to the present day i have recited the principal examples adduced by the votaries of the opinion i am contending against as direct proofs of their assertion that the color which the skin of a white man acquires on exposure to the heat of the sun becomes hereditary and may therefore form a basis for the gradual appearance of the deepest black it is hardly necessary to remark that these instances turn out to be extremely deficient that they by no means prove the position questioned and that their testimony seems to be conclusively in the negative for if there was any truth in the hypothesis the jews would have acquired generally in britain the sanguine complexion and it is very obvious that in india they must long ago have been assimilated to the native hindus a like change would doubtless have been effected in the other examples adduced in which we see striking proofs of the permanent nature of the white complexion moreover if the acquired color of the skin were hereditary the children in the north of africa in the arabian desert and in asiatic turkey would certainly be born of that complexion which is produced by the climate their parents inhabit the contrary is however universally the fact and therefore the hypothesis of which this is the consequence must be without foundation we may therefore assert in general terms that the result of historical inquiry confirms the observation made in the foregoing pages that the color acquired by the parent on exposure to heat is not imparted to his offspring and has consequently no share in producing natural varieties it will hereafter appear what foundation there is for the assertion that the complexions of nations are darker or lighter in proportion to the temperature of the countries they inhabit but it will first be necessary to make a few observations which may tend to throw light on some subjects connected with our inquiry it is not my intention to assert that climates can only produce an effect on individuals who removing from another situation come to abide under their influence it cannot be denied that they have some power also of exhibiting certain changes in the progeny but i am disposed to believe that the most important diversities of mankind the difference for example between the white european and the negro depend on another principle and that no change of climate however great or for whatever period of time its influence might be exerted could transform a race of the former people into one of the latter or even make them approximate in any considerable degree it is very improbable that climates can influence the human species more than the inferior tribes of animals which are placed by many circumstances so much more fully under their control yet we nowhere find that the colors of these bear any evident relation to the gradations of temperature and latitude End of section one of the opinion of buffon and his followers part nineteen of researches into the physical history of man this LibriVox recording is in the public domain, read by John Greenman. Chapter 5, Section 2 of the Production of Varieties in the Race It appears that the principle in the animal economy on which the production of varieties in the race depends is entirely distinct from that which regards the changes produced by external causes on the individual. These two classes of phenomena are governed by very different laws in the former instance certain external powers acting on the parents influence them to produce an offspring possessing some peculiarities of form color or organization and it seems to be the law of nature that whatever characters thus originate become hereditary and are transmitted to the race perhaps in perpetuity on the contrary 
the changes produced by external causes in the appearance or constitution of the individual are temporary and in general acquired characters are transient and have no influence on the progeny we have observed in a former part of this essay the tendency which all animals exhibit to the hereditary transmission of congenital characters of body it is not necessary to repeat proofs of a fact which has never been called in question but the extent of the influence of this principle has not been fully considered we have before alluded to the well-known fact that the form of features which constitutes what is called a family likeness and other similar varieties have been transmitted for many generations the most minute peculiarities have been traced through repeated successions there is not a family of men or a stock of animals which cannot produce something in conformation a spot on a quadruped of variegated color often becomes almost perpetual the general rule equally applies to those more obvious instances which can be discovered by our senses and to the minute varieties of organization which give rise to peculiar constitutions and to every different morbid affection thus defects in the organs of sense and imperfections in all the bodily functions as deafness insanity asthmas palsies are hereditary or at least the predisposition which lead to these distempers when the exciting causes are applied Note, i have observed that the liability to be more than commonly acted upon by any particular medicine is often prevalent through a family as in one particular instance of a mother and daughter who very strongly resembled in person and who were both thrown into salivation by a very small quantity of mercury i have reason to believe that a much more accurate attention than what is commonly paid to peculiarities and resemblances of person would very often be advantageous to medical practitioners in leading them to an acquaintance with many varieties of constitution which are not easily made obvious the interval peculiarities of organization are generally connected with the external and if a son resembles his father very accurately in features form and complexion he has generally the same habit of body in other particulars and will probably be subject more or less in each successive period of his life to the same distempers End of note. the truth of the other proposition advanced that no acquired characters are ever transmitted is not so immediately evident although it appears to be universally confirmed by experience it may be stated as a general fact that the organization of the offspring allowing still a certain range for the springing up of new varieties is always formed on the model of the natural and original constitution of the parent and is not affected by any change the latter may have undergone or influenced by any new state it may have acquired a contrary opinion has indeed been maintained by some physiologists and diverse facts have been related in testimony we have been told for example that dogs and cats are sometimes produced without tails the defect arising from the circumstance that the parents of the animals so marked had suffered amputation of the same member the authors who have brought such examples as these in defense of their opinions would not probably have thought them worth recording or indeed deserving of the smallest notice if they had not happened to coincide with the systems they were advocating it is surely much more reasonable to attribute defects of this nature to accidental occurrence than thus to account for them individuals are occasionally produced in every species sometimes with a natural mutilation or defect of some member at others with an excessive growth we see such examples almost daily in the human kind and similar instances occur in the lower tribes yet if a child be born without a foot or hand or arm it would not occur to any person to impute the want of the limb to any amputation which either of its parents might have undergone and if the latter should have been found to have been thus mutilated the coincidence would be justly imputed to accident 
and no connection would be imagined to subsist between the two facts. The opinion we are opposing has taken its rise rather from some absurd theory of generation than from any facts which have appeared well established. Note, Buffon deduces it from the doctrine of molecules. End of note. But our knowledge of the processes of nature is so slender that we are not authorized to reason from any hypothesis on this subject. We know not by what means any of the facts we remark are affected. Our object should be simply to observe and generalize them, and to deduce thence analogical rules to guide us in our future researches. In the present instance we form our observations with such an abundant range of experiment before us that we are entitled to a considerable degree of confidence in the general results. All nations are subject to accidental injuries, and amputations and other operations of surgery have been practiced in every country from immemorial time. Yet who ever heard of any effect produced on the race? Our horses and other domestic animals are continually mutilated in their ears and tails from our caprice. An infinite number of decisive experiments are performed every day with the same results. It has been said that after any operation has been repeated during many generations, a sort of habit may be acquired by which the new state becomes, as it were, natural, and may thus affect the race. But the principle of habit cannot be called into existence in this case, where the violence committed and the injury suffered in every successive generation is not less than it was at first. But if an instance be wanting to prove that repetition affects no difference in the results, we have one in the Jews, and in the other nations who have practiced circumcision invariably during many thousand years, yet the artificial state has not become natural. The utility of this law of nature is very evident. If it were not for it, the evils of all past ages would be perpetuated, and the human race would in every succeeding generation exhibit more abundant examples of accumulated misery. Every species would have become at this day mutilated and defective, and we should see nothing but men and animals destitute of eyes, arms, legs, etc. The whole creation which now displays a spectacle of beauty and happiness would present to our view a picture of universal decrepitude and hideous deformity. We cannot discern any essential circumstance in which changes produced by art or by casual injury differ from those which are affected by other external causes. Neither do the latter appear to be communicable to the offspring, which is always formed according to the natural constitution of the parent. Thus we know that the change, whatever it may be, which is produced in the constitution by the application of certain contagions, as those of the smallpox, cowpox, measles, whooping cough, and others, is a permanent state and renders the persons who have once undergone these distempers incapable of being affected by the same maladies during the remainder of their lives. Yet this acquired condition is not communicated to their children, who are born, on the contrary, with the original constitutions and predispositions of their parents. These are probably analogous cases to those of the changes produced by external injuries the secret modifications of bodily structure which defend the constitution against the attacks of any distemper are governed by the same laws as far as regards hereditary descent as the sensible changes of form or even the want of parts which is the consequence of mutilation the phenomena of predisposition to diseases may be supposed to be adverse to the universal prevalence of this law but on closer examination they will appear rather to confirm it. It has been said by medical writers, and the notion has generally been received without scrutiny, that any morbid predisposition may be formed in almost any constitution, that what is called the gouty diathesis, for example, may be acquired by long habits of intemperance and transmitted to posterity, that the 
remote causes of other diseases render the offspring of persons addicted to them obnoxious to various distempers that the children of dissolute parents thus generally suffer punishment for the vices of their progenitors and it may be added that we have here a clear proof of the hereditary nature of acquired states of the constitution if the antecedent circumstances which are said to lay the foundation for each morbid predisposition were distinct from the exciting causes and different from each other the facts would appear to countenance the inference but we may remark in the first place that the remote and exciting causes of distempers are very generally the same so that it is difficult to say how far the noxious powers have produced their effect by laying the foundation of disease and how far by only calling a natural predisposition into action and secondly that the series of hurtful causes which are said to form the predisposition to one disease thus supposed to become hereditary are often exactly similar to those which are imagined to lay the foundation for another set of morbid symptoms altogether distinct the same course of intemperate living and of excesses of various kinds is supposed first to predispose to and afterwards to excite gout in one person in another apoplectic maladies in a third dropsy or complaints of the liver in another insanity now since the difference is not in the external causes it must be in the natural peculiarities of the constitutions on which they act these therefore are previously prepared by original organization to take on them one form of morbid affection rather than another it is then clear that the predisposition is laid by natural variety in the first instance the causes which are called predisposing are in reality exciting causes though perhaps acting gradually and through a long course of time every individual is probably weaker in some particular organ or part of his constitution than in others and this naturally and previously to the action of any hurtful powers if he avoids the excitements of disease he may escape but when these are applied his natural weakness shows itself the same defect being a part of the original bodily structure is common to a family the first individual who exposes himself to the morbid causes first betrays the peculiar defect of the race and is thus erroneously supposed to lay the foundation of it syphilis appears indeed to form a sort of exception to this observation for in that instance the disease itself is transmitted but hereditary syphilis is i believe only known to occur when the mother has been laboring under the infection during the interval between the periods of conception and parturition note facts tending to prove the contrary are indeed related but they are all of dubious authority End of note. it must be supposed that the fetus in utero becomes contaminated with the peculiar poison of the disease with which the humors of the mother are infected and that after its birth the additional exciting causes such as cold air acting upon it the contagion begins to show its customary effects the child in this case may be considered as having taken the disease by a peculiar mode of infection rather than as deriving it from hereditary resemblance of constitution this is a phenomenon of a very different kind from the similarity of structure which the law of nature ordains between children and their parents if the above arguments are stated in a manner sufficiently clear and explicit to convey their full force they will i believe authorize the inference that the phenomena of predisposition to diseases rather confirms than invalidates our former position and we may be allowed to conclude with a considerable degree of confidence that no acquired varieties of constitution become hereditary or in any manner affect the race the uniform preservation of the natural complexion of white races of men who reside in hot climates and are continually acquiring a darker hue is a fact analogous to those which we have lately mentioned and conformable to the general law the adventitious color has no influence on the offspring if there were any truth in the above reasonings 
we must not, in inquiring into the nature of the varieties in the human complexion and figure, direct our attention to the class of external powers which produce changes on individuals in their own persons, but to those more important causes which, acting on the parents, influence them to produce an offspring endowed with certain peculiar characters, which characters, according to the law of nature, become hereditary, and thus modify the race. It will be useful in this place to extend our views again to the other departments of nature, and to endeavor to acquire an idea of the causes in general which chiefly predispose to the production of varieties. It is to be regretted that physiologists have not directed their attention to this view of the subject. If they had pursued this path, we should probably at the present time have been possessed of an instructive accumulation of facts in the place of abundance of vague reasonings. End of chapter 5, section 2 of the production of varieties in the race. Part 20 of Researches into the Physical History of Man. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by John Greenman. Chapter 5, Section 3 of the Circumstances Which Promote the Disposition to Variation. It is well known that in the vegetable kingdom, the seeds of plants in various circumstances produce new varieties of form, color, and quality. Thus all the different kinds of apples are varieties of the common crab tree, which have been produced by planting the seeds indiscriminately, and seedling plants continually exhibit a disposition to almost infinite variations. In some vegetable races, as in the varieties of the pea, note T. A. Knight, on the fecundation of vegetables in Hunter's Georgical Essays, Volume 6. End of note. The characters thus constituted are very uniformly hereditary. In others, they are very capricious, and in not a few examples, as in the apple and pear, the offspring scarcely receives any determination from the peculiar character of the parent stock. The circumstances which promote the evolution of varieties, and especially of the finer and more luxuriant forms, and of the more beautiful tints in the vegetable kingdom, are culture, richness, and frequent change of soil, an abundant supply of all the wants of the individual, and a cautious guarding against all causes which have a tendency to weaken the vigor of its growth and lessen the energies of its peculiar life. The principle of cultivation, or rather of this part of it, for a great portion of the art insists in the judicious mixture of varieties, seems to be the supplying to every plant in abundance the stimuli adapted by nature to its particular species. In the animal kingdom it is probable that a greater number of causes would be found to contribute to the evolving of varieties if sufficient observation were made of all the antecedent circumstances which are connected with these appearances. If a pair of the common brown mice are kept constantly in a dark cellar, or anywhere wholly excluded from the light, their offspring will be produced with white hair and red eyes. It is not an uncommon thing to find this variety in the foundations of old cathedrals and in other places which abound in dark subterraneous recesses. The white variety of the field mouse is found in woody places. These characters are hereditary, and the animals possessing them frequently form races. The appearance of the white variety is very common in several species of animals which inhabit the Arctic countries. I do not speak of the races which are originally white, as the Arctic bear and fox, nor of the varying tribes which acquire a white hue in the winter, for these are distinct species but the common species of bears, foxes, and other animals in those countries frequently produce offspring of the description above mentioned. This phenomenon, and that of the variety of mice in our own country, may be considered as analogous. There is no reason to doubt that several of the species of wild beasts, which are generally of dark colors in the south of Europe, would, if they were transported within the Arctic Circle, soon exhibit the same deviations in their progeny. 
We have here an example of the antecedent circumstances connected with the origin of variety tolerably well defined. It is scarcely to be imagined that climates have no effect in exciting these variations, for whatever are the circumstances or combinations of them which conduce to the appearance of such phenomena, these must be supposed more likely to occur in one climate than another. The breeds of goats, rabbits, and cats of Anatolia are remarkable for soft, long, white hair. The concurrence of this character in different species found in the same local situation leads to the inference that the variety must arise from a local cause. Yet this variety is permanent when the animals are carried into other countries. Note Blumenbach ubi supra. But by far the most powerful cause of the evolution of varieties in the animal kingdom is domestication, or the artificial and unnatural condition into which those tribes are brought which are subservient to the uses of man. To be convinced of the truth of this fact, we need only look at the phenomena which surround us on every side. In all our stocks of domesticated animals we see profuse and infinite variety, and in the races of wild animals, from which they originally descended, we find a uniform color and figure for the most part to prevail. Domestication is to animals what cultivation is to vegetables, and the former probably differs from the natural state of the one class of beings in the same circumstances which distinguish the latter from the natural condition of the other class. The most apparent of these is the abundant supply of the peculiar stimuli of such kind. Animals in a wild state procure a simple and unvaried food in precarious and deficient quantities, and are exposed to the inclemencies of the seasons. Their young are produced in similar circumstances to the state of seedlings, which spring uncultivated in a poor soil. But in the improved state, all the stimuli of various food, of warmth, etc., are afforded in abundance, and the consequence is a luxurious growth, the evolution of varieties, and the exhibition of all the perfections of which each species is capable. Civilized life holds the same relation to the condition of savages in the human race which the domesticated state holds to the natural or wild condition among the inferior animals. Man is defended by so many arts against the influence of the elements. He appears, when we compare him with the greater part of the brute creation, to be so secure against the efficacy of natural causes, and this not only in countries where the improved condition of life has been carried to great advancement, but with a great majority of the species that the effect of climates must be expected to be less on the human than on the inferior kinds. On the other hand, the difference between the artificial state of mankind and their natural or savage condition is so much more important and extensive than any which intervenes between the domesticated and wild races of animals that we must, reasoning from probability, expect the effect of this change on the human species to be more strongly marked than on the inferior kinds. We shall now proceed to consider what effect climates have in predisposing to varieties in the human species by comparing the native people of distant regions of the earth. We shall pursue this inquiry in a method somewhat different from that heretofore followed. The influence of moral causes in modifying the efficacy of natural causes is allowed on all hands to be very considerable moreover we have seen reason to impute a priori to civilization at least as great power in the production of varieties as climates can be supposed to exert and we shall afterwards produce examples of its effects which will show that they have not in this view been overrated with these preliminaries it appears necessary that we should, in proceeding to compare the inhabitants of different climates, consider those nations only as the proper subjects of this comparison, which are in a similar state with respect to barbarism and civilization. We shall compare savages with other barbarous tribes, 
and civilized races with people in a similar state, and shall endeavor, in general, to include in the same comparison nations as nearly as possible on a level with each other in a moral point of view. The indigenous nations of America afford us one very ample field for this sort of comparison. Though divided into a great number of tribes, which are completely independent of each other, and have no mutual intercourse, and which have been thus discriminated from the earliest period of our acquaintance with them, and though scattered at immense distances over a vast continent of a most diversified surface, which extends itself through every habitable climate, these people preserve everywhere a strong resemblance in all the leading points of their manners and habits. Since the researches of Humboldt in the New World, we have become better informed concerning various particulars of its natural and political state. His observations lead to some conclusions concerning the physical history of the aboriginal people, which are very much to our present purpose. As the weight of his testimony would be lessened by any attempt to condense it, we shall insert it in the author's own statement. Note, Humboldt, Political Essay on N. Spain, translated by Mr. Black. End of note. The Indians of New Spain, says Humboldt, have a more swarthy complexion than the inhabitants of the warmest climates of South America. The influence of climate appears to have almost no effect on the Americans and Negroes. There are no doubt tribes of a color by no means deep among the Indians of the new continent whose complexion approaches to that of the Arabs or Moors. We found the people of the Rio Negro swarthier than those of the lower Orinoco, and yet the banks of the first of these rivers enjoy a much cooler climate than the more northern regions. In the forests of Guiana, especially near the sources of the Orinoco, are several tribes of a whitish complexion. The Guacas, Guajaribs, and Arikas, of whom several robust individuals, exhibiting no symptom of the asthenical malady which characterizes albinos, have the appearance of true mestizos. Yet these tribes have never mingled with Europeans, and are surrounded with other tribes of a dark brown hue. The Indians in the torrid zone who inhabit the most elevated plains of the Cordilleras, of the Andes, and those who under the forty-fifth degree of south latitude live by fishing among the islands of the archipelago of Chonos, have as coppery a complexion as those who under a burning climate cultivate banana in the narrowest and deepest valleys of the equinoctial region. We must add that the Indians of the mountains are clothed and were so long before the conquest, while the aborigines who wander over the plains go quite naked, and are consequently always exposed to the perpendicular rays of the sun. I could never observe that in the same individual those parts of the body which were covered were less dark than those in contact with a warm and humid air. We everywhere perceive that the color of the American depends very little on the local position in which we see him. The Mexicans, as we have already observed, are more swarthy than the Indians of Quito and New Grenada, who inhabit a climate completely analogous, and we even see that the tribes dispersed to the north of the Rio Gila are less brown than those in the neighborhood of the kingdom of Guatemala. This deep color continues to the coast nearest to Asia, but under the 54 degrees 10 minutes of north latitude at Cloak Bay, in the midst of copper-colored Indians with small long eyes, there is a tribe with large eyes, European features, and a skin less dark than that of our peasantry. All these facts tend to prove that notwithstanding the variety of climates and elevations inhabited by the different races of men, nature never deviates from the model of which she made selection thousands of years ago. Note, this last observation of our author is curiously at variance with the facts stated immediately before, which evince a remarkable deviation 
though not apparently produced by climate. End of note. All the other travelers of credit coincide in a similar testimony with that of Humboldt concerning the complexion of the Native Americans. Herrera, note, Herrera says, after describing the complexion of the Mexican albinos, Toda la demás gente tiene color de membrillos corridos. And again, Es cosa notable que todas las gentes de las Indias, del norte y del mediodía son de una misma inclinación y calidad porque según la mejor opinión procedieron de una misma parte historia de las indias End of note. Ulloa and other spanish writers some of whom are cited by dr robertson note hist of america give the same account Ulloa's authority is of weight because he had personally opportunities of making observations on the Indians in North America as well as in the South. He reported that there was no discoverable difference of complexion which had any relation to climate. Harriet makes a similar remark. Note Harriet's Hist of Canada. Stedman relates that the Indians near Surinam, note Stedman's expeditions to Surinam, are of a copper color, and Mackenzie, note, Mackenzie's journey to the Pacific Ocean, and Hearn, note, Hearn's journey to the Copper River, give the same account of the Canistano and other tribes who inhabit the region contiguous to the Arctic Circle. I have received a similar relation from several persons of credit who have seen the natives of Canada and of South America. The general statement is that the people of the tropics are fairer than those of the north. Wallace reports that the people of Patagonia and Tierra del Fuego are of the same color with the Indians of North America. Note Hawksworth's Voyages. Cook describes the natives of Tierra del Fuego as having the color of rust of iron mixed with oil. Note Cook's Voyage, Apud Hawksworth. End of note. From all these testimonies it appears to be fully established that the native people of America exhibit no proofs of the effect of climate in producing varieties of complexion. The Negro race affords us another example of a stock of people spread over regions which extend themselves into almost every habitable climate, and preserving, like the tribes of American Indians, that general likeness which gives a presumptive proof of connection in race and origin. Under the term of the Negro race I mean to include not only the natives of Africa, but the tribes of savages who inhabit New Guinea, New Holland, and many islands in the Pacific Ocean. All these nations resemble in many points of their physical structure the genuine Ethiopians. There is at least that general analogy between them which authorizes our arranging them all in the same class as we shall hereafter more distinctly trace, when we proceed to consider the history of particular nations. In this class, indeed, we very fairly include all the savage or absolutely uncivilized people of the southern hemisphere, with the exception of the tribes of Americans already mentioned. Most of these nations are completely in the natural state, that is to say, almost entirely destitute of the improvements of life. Some tribes, however, are more advanced than others, and in a few instances they have made considerable progress in the more simple arts. It is much to be regretted that our knowledge of the inhabitants of the African continent is very slender. Few travelers have penetrated far into the interior, and the observations of those who have made some progress have been necessarily superficial from their confined opportunities of inquiry and afford us little information of the history of the inhabitants. The tribes who inhabit the countries bordering on the Senegal and Gambia rivers have been described by Mr. Park. He divides them into four principal nations, the Mandingos, Feloups, Jalofs, and Fulavs. The two former have the negro characters in the greatest degree. The Jalofs are of the deepest shade, or of a jet black in their complexion, but their features approach more to the European model than the rest of these nations. 
but the fulas are distinguished in several respects from the other natives in this part of africa they are not black but of a tawny color which is lighter and more yellow in some states than in others they have small features and soft silky hair without either the thick lips or the crisp wool which are common to the other tribes they are much more civilized than the rest of the african nations their manners are pastoral and agricultural and their dispositions remarkably gentle they speak a different language from the neighboring nations and look down on these as inferiors ranking themselves among the white people Note, parks travels in africa these tribes inhabit the same latitudes and are indeed interspersed through the same territories the variety which subsists among them must therefore depend on some other influence than that of climate the natives of the cape de verde islands where the temperature of the air is moderated by sea breezes are negroes in all respects similar to those on the african continent note dambier's voyages people who inhabit elevated and mountainous situations and those who abide in low places as on the shores of the sea or of great rivers are said in general to derive as strong marks of the distinction from this circumstance as any which are imagined to result from great differences of latitude and there is no doubt some truth in the observation it is however well known that the negroes of the mountainous tracts in upper guinea are as black as those who inhabit the sea coast note see humboldt ubi supra etc if we advance from the equator towards the cape of good hope on either shore we find no difference in the shade of complexion at least such is the account we receive from the most intelligent travelers the color of the people of congo is black though not in the same degree some being of a much deeper dye than others their hair is in general black and finely curled but some have it of a dark sandy color their eyes are mostly of a fine lively black but in some of a dark sea green they have neither flat noses nor thick lips like other negroes their stature is mostly of the middle size and except their black complexion they resemble the portuguese Note, Relation de l'Ethiopie occidentale trad de l'Italien d'Antonio Cavazzi par Labat. End of note. The natives of the eastern shore have a better form and more graceful features in general than those of the western coast. The people of Sofala are black, but taller and stouter than the other Kafris. Note, Pegafeta ind oriental par 1. End of note the natives of monomatapa according to the dutch travelers are tall handsome and very black note see buffon hist nat the island of madagascar is by no means to be considered as a country of intemperate heat for the air is perpetually cooled by winds blowing across the indian ocean this island is inhabited by races of people who differ considerably in their physical characters some tribes are of a deep black color with crisp or woolly hair in short true negroes these are stout people about the middle stature they have large eyes and fine countenances other tribes have lank and smooth hair and are tawny some are copper colored the affinity in their languages proves the inhabitants of madagascar to be connected in region with some of the natives of the indian archipelago whether the whole population of the island have so remote a descent or only part of them is uncertain note m l'abbe rochon voyage à madagascar à maroc et aux indes de page voyage autour du monde end of note the people of natal on the eastern shore of africa have been visited and described by dampier they are of a middle stature and well made with oval faces and noses neither flat nor high but well proportioned the color of their skins is black and their hair crisped their teeth are white and their aspect altogether graceful note dampier's voyages 
The Hottentots, indeed, would seem to form an exception to the general observation made above, for they appear to be of the negro race from their woolly hair and other circumstances, and their skin is of a yellowish-brown hue, which something resembles that of an European who has the jaundice to a high degree. The whites of their eyes are entirely free from this color. Note Sparman's Voyage au Cap but it seems impossible to refer the light complexion of the Hottentots to climate when we consider that the Kaffirs, who are their immediate neighbors and are found in the vicinity of Sunday and Fish Rivers, 31 degrees from the line, are of the deepest black. Lieutenant W. Patterson has observed and described these people. The climate of Kaffiria is subject to great varieties and occasionally to sharp frosts. The country is well watered and abounds with fine woods, yet the color of the natives is a jet black. Note Patterson's Travels in Africa. Thus it appears that in Africa and the neighboring islands there is no appearance which would lead us to imagine that climate has any power of producing deviations in the complexion of races of men. There are indeed variations from the deep black as the tawny color of the Fulas and Hottentots, but the lighter people live either among or in the vicinity of others who are perfectly black, and the variety cannot therefore be imputed to local situation. The eastern Negroes, or Papuas, are as black as those of Africa, and have woolly hair. They inhabit the interior and mountainous parts of most of the Indian islands, and the continent of New Guinea. There are also found in the same islands with them other races of people, rude in their manners, though not so devoid of civilization as the Papuas, who are called Haraforas, or by the Dutch writers Alfors. The latter are tawny. The continent of New Holland is inhabited by tribes of the most miserable and destitute savages who resemble the Negroes of Africa considerably in their anatomical structure. Some of these tribes are said to have woolly hair, others certainly have straight hair like that of Europeans. The general complexion of these people is black, but individuals are found among them mixed with the rest, who are of the Malay tawny or copper color. Note. See below Hist of S. S. Islanders. End of note. The climate of New Holland is very various. The description of the people chiefly refers to the inhabitants of the vicinity of Port Jackson, or Botany Bay, where the temperature is very moderate. The inhabitants of Van Diemen's Land are in the most truly savage and unimproved state of all men. They have indeed scarcely any idea of making houses to protect themselves from the rigor of the climate, but live principally in hollow trees. These people are quite black and have woolly hair. The country extends itself to 45 degrees south latitude, which is equivalent in temperature to a much greater distance on the northern side of the equator. Perhaps the climate may be compared to that of Scandinavia. The natives of the New Hebrides and some other clusters in the Pacific Ocean are naked and completely savage. They are black and have in general woolly hair though in some places straight hair. Individuals are found among them in all the islands visited by European navigators of a lighter complexion. Note Ibid. From this comparison of the different tribes of savages, scattered through all varieties of situation and of latitude, we are certainly authorized to draw the conclusion that climates have very inconsiderable and doubtful effect in exciting variations of complexion. The general complexion of savages is black, or a dark hue, and among the nations which continue in that state, whatever climates they inhabit, though deviations occur in individuals as varieties casually spring up in other species, both in the animal and in the vegetable world, yet these do not go to any great extent, nor are they frequent enough to produce any general effect. They indeed appear to occur more often in moderate than in very hot climates. It is not improbable that the effect of climate, when conjoined with other causes, as in nations advancing towards a state of civilization, would be more considerable. 
if i think it is evident that a nation of savages a tribe of new hollanders for example would never be changed materially in complexion by the influence of climate alone the inhabitants of van diemen's land afford a full proof of this truth it might be imagined that they have not resided in their present abode during a space of time sufficient for the production of the appearances which are supposed to be the effect of such a climate but this assertion would be wholly gratuitous and hypothetical for their race may have been fixed for anything that appears on the soil where they now abide as early as the negro tribes in africa and there is reason to believe that they are by no means recent colonists for they have lost all knowledge of their migration and have even no idea of the use of canoes which is an art which if once possessed cannot readily be lost can it be supposed that they arrived in van diemen's land before the separation of that island from new holland by some convulsion of the earth which produced the interjacent strait they differ in many particulars from the new hollanders and more closely resemble the papuas of new guinea we now proceed to inquire what effects cultivation or civilization may produce on the human race and how far it may be considered as predisposing to variations of complexion the difficulty in this part of our subject is to find an example of a race of people of which one tribe is savage and the other civilized by such instances if many were to be found we might ascertain what effects civilization is calculated to produce the natives of the south sea islands afford us an example of a race of people scattered through a wide extent of space in which they occupy insulated and divided points and are thus cut off from all communication with each other we shall enter more fully hereafter into the history of these tribes it is sufficient to say at present that there is great reason to believe them all to be branches of one stock their affinity is clearly proved in many instances by identity of language and manners now of these nations some are absolute savages living on the precarious sustenance which is afforded them by the spontaneous fruits of the earth and altogether destitute of clothing absolutely in the natural and unimproved state others on the contrary have made considerable advancement in the arts of life and inhabit a country which by its extraordinary fertility and abundant supply of the most nutritious food gives them all the advantages of a perfect agriculture and they use clothing manufactured from the bark of the mulberry tree the people are here divided into different ranks and the higher class are very much in the same circumstances with the better orders of society in the civilized communities of europe the savage tribes are all of them completely negroes quite black and the greater number have woolly hair and resemble the africans in their anatomical structure some of them have black complexions with hair crisp and curled but not woolly of this precise description are the major part of the people of new zealand now the inhabitants of the latter country are incontestably a tribe of the same identical race which furnished the population of the society isles these are the most civilized of the whole stock the lower people among them nearly resemble the new zealanders in their complexion and appearance but the better rank have a skin which is at least as fair as that of our brunettes in europe but what is most directly to our purpose some individuals in this luxurious community of the society isles have been born with all the characters of the sanguine temperament with a florid white complexion and hair of a light brown flaxen or red color in short with the precise characters of the german or teutonic race note hist of south sea islands below End of note. here then we have a fair example of the greatest diversity of the human species depending on the condition of society and on the mode of life the influence of climate would here have a contrary tendency for the white people are much nearer the equator than many of the black tribes there is no reason to doubt that 
if a whole nation were placed in the same circumstances with the better part of people in the society isles their offspring would become similarly transmuted the chief points in which they differ from the lower class in the same country and from the cognate branches which still preserve their barbarous manners and negro characters in other islands are the abundance of sustenance and clothing and the comparative luxury and delicacy of life which they enjoy in a similar manner civilized nations in general are distinguished from savage ones this view of the causes of varieties in our species is confirmed by considering the analogous phenomena in other kinds we have seen reason to believe that cultivation and domestication are the chief causes of deviation from the primitive color and form in the vegetable and animal tribes it derives confirmation also from other facts in the history of mankind it was mentioned above that in the hottest parts of africa there is one nation of negroes the fulas who are not black nor have woolly hair but are of a tawny complexion and have hair of a soft silky texture approaching to the european characters these people it may be remembered were observed to be more civilized than the other tribes and the generally prevalent idea of their superiority over the more savage races makes it probable that the moral difference between them has been of long standing dr s s smith has given us an example of similar diversity produced in a short time in the negroes settled in the southern districts of the united states of america and although we do not consent to all the reasonings of this author yet his observation of the fact is not the less valuable he remarks that the field slaves live on the plantations and retain pretty nearly the rude manners of their african progenitors the third generation in consequence preserve much of their original structure though their features are not so strongly marked as those of imported slaves but the domestic servants of the same race are treated with lenity and their condition is little different from that of the lower class of white people the effect is that in the third generation they have the nose raised the mouth and lips of moderate size the eyes lively and sparkling and often the whole composition of features extremely agreeable the hair grows sensibly longer in each succeeding race it extends to three four and sometimes to six or eight inches note i have been assured by persons who have resided in the west indies that a similar change is very visible among the negro slaves of the third and fourth generation in those islands and that even the first generation differs considerably from the natives of africa End of note. the people of hindostan afford us examples of diversities depending on moral causes and distinct propagation the different tribes into which this singular nation is divided have each a peculiar physiognomy the higher class the brahmins who live in a state of ease and affluence differ widely from the rest not only in a distinct cast of features but in their complexion also which is of a much lighter shade than that of the inferior orders and this diversity is universal through the country and is equally conspicuous in the northern and in the southern provinces of india note mackenzie on the ceylonese antiquities asiatic researches volume six End of note particular local or moral causes may doubtless retard the effect of the improved state of society in the race among the hindus for example the very abstinent manners of the people who scarcely take enough food to support health and their sparing use of clothing place them nearly in similar circumstances with respect to many of those causes which influence the physical growth with savages when the disposition to variation is excited by civilization it is probable that it may proceed more rapidly in producing its effects in some climates than in others there are not wanting facts which prove that local situation and moderate temperature promote the tendency to the production of light varieties in countries inhabited by the european race the tribes that reside in hilly tracts are fairer 
than the people of the plains and valleys. I am informed on good authority that the mountaineers of Sicily are remarkable for light hair and blue eyes, whereas these characters are not seen in the low country on the coast. Mr. Bruce relates that the natives of the mountains of Rudus near Yambo, on the Arabian coast, where the climate is cool and the water freezes in winter, have red hair and blue eyes. A thing he adds scarcely ever seen but in the coldest mountains in the east. Note Bruce's Travels, Book One, Chapter Two. Here is no diversity of race to account for the difference. The inhabitants of Caucasus and other high mountains have remarkably red hair and blue eyes. Note Palias's Travels in Crim Tartary. The general complexion of the Scottish Celts, or Highlanders, is dark. Dark brown or black hair and eyes are very prevalent among them. But in some spots in the northern highlands, red hair is almost universal, and the difference is observable at a very short distance. The sanguine temperament prevails in the moderately cold countries of Europe and Asia among people who belong to races which are generally and originally of opposite characters. Thus among the northern Russians, who are of the Slavonian race, light brown and red hair is prevalent. Note, Duke's Hist of Russia, Volume 1. Slavonian tribes in general have black hair and dark complexions. Note, Dr. Forster's Observations in a Voyage Round the World. End of note. The Tartars of Tobolsk are similar to the Russians. Note, Palace Voy en Siberie. The Manchurs, or Tungusians, are a dark race generally, but on the north of China they are sometimes fair and have blue eyes. Note Barrow's Travels in China. Abundance of examples may be adduced to the same purpose, but it is not necessary to extend them since they are matters of common observation. It will be proper to recapitulate in this place our inference concerning the effects of climate and of civilization on human species. We endeavored in the first instance to show that there is no foundation for the common opinion which supposes the black races of men to have acquired their color by exposure to the heat of a tropical climate during many ages. On the contrary, the fact appears to be fully established that white races of people migrating to a hot climate do preserve their native complexion unchanged, and have so preserved it in all the examples of such migration which we know to have happened. And this fact is only an instance of the prevalence of the general law, which has ordained that the offspring shall always be constructed according to the natural and primitive constitution of the parents, and therefore shall inherit only their connate peculiarities, and not any of their acquired qualities. It follows that we must direct our inquiry to the connate varieties and to the causes which influence the parent to produce an offspring deviating in some particulars of its organization from the established character of the stock. What these causes are seems to be a question which must be determined by an extensive comparison of the phenomena of vegetable and animal propagation. It appears that in the vegetable world cultivation is the chief exciting cause of variation. In animals, climate certainly lays the foundation of some varieties, but domestication or cultivation is the great principle which everywhere calls them forth in abundance. In the human species we endeavored to ascertain what comparative effect these two principles may produce, and first to determine whether climate alone can furnish any considerable variation in tribes of men uncultivated or uncivilized. We compared the appearances of two great races of uncivilized people, each of which is scattered through a great portion of the world, and which, taken collectively, constitute nearly all the savage tenants of the globe. It resulted, from this comparison, that little effect is produced by the agency of climate alone on savage tribes, Varieties indeed appear more ready to spring up in moderate than in intensely hot climates, but they are not sufficient to produce any considerable change on the race. 
Civilization, however, has more extensive powers, and we have examples of the greatest variation in the human complexion produced by it, or at least which can scarcely be referred to any other cause, viz. the appearance of the sanguine constitution in a race generally black. Lastly, it appears that in races which are experiencing the effect of civilization, a temperate climate increases the tendency to the light varieties, and therefore may be the means of promoting and rendering the effect of that important principle more general and more conspicuous. End of chapter 5, section 3 Of the Circumstances Which Promote the Disposition to Variation Part 21 of Researches into the Physical History of Man. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain, read by John Greenman. Part 21, Chapter 5, Section 4 Primitive Stock of Men Negroes. If there be any truth in the above remarks, it must be concluded that the process of nature in the human species is the transmutation of the characters of the Negro into those of the European or the evolution of white varieties in black races of men. We have seen that there are causes existing which are capable of producing such an alteration, but we have no facts which induce us to suppose that the reverse of this change could in any circumstances be effected. This leads us to the inference that the primitive stock of men were negroes, which has every appearance of truth. Since, however, it is a conclusion which may be questioned, it will be proper to state more at length the arguments which offer themselves in its support. First, the analogy of other species leads to this conclusion. It has been remarked by the celebrated physiologist John Hunter that the changes of color in all kinds of animals is from the darker to the lighter tints. Whence it is inferred that in all animals subject to such variations, the darkest of the species should be reckoned nearest to the original. Now, though there may be some doubt of the universality of this law, there can be none of its general prevalence. The lighter and more beautiful colors with which our domestic animals are variegated are the effect of cultivation, and are not seen in the wild races from which they have been bred. Note, several species which are not perfectly domesticated are almost uniformly black, as the elephant, buffalo, etc., yet even in those varieties of color as red, bay, white, appear, though rarely. If these animals were brought as completely into domestication as our oxen, probably we should find an equal variety in their color. The color of the ox species seems to have been black originally. Such is the hue of those races of oxen which are most rude in their appearance, and which, inhabiting wild and mountainous districts, have never undergone fully the effect of cultivation. The wild boar is of a blackish color, while our domestic pigs are commonly white or spotted. Other species which have no black races vary regularly in domestication towards a lighter hue than the natural and original one, as the stag, fallow deer, etc. End of note. If there were no facts applying to the particular instance of the human species, it would appear probable, from this general analogy, that the original stock was black. But, secondly, we have examples in the human species of the light varieties appearing in dark races. Some instances of this fact we have addressed above, and we shall endeavor to trace others when we proceed to consider the history of particular nations. On the other hand, we have no example of the characters of the Negro or of any considerable approach to them ever appearing in a race of light complexion. If these observations are established on a cautious induction, as I think they appear to be, they may be considered as affording a proof that the original stock of men were black. Some confirmation is afforded by considering, thirdly, that the dark races are best adapted by their organization to the condition of rude and 
uncivilized nations, which we must conceive to have been the primitive state of mankind, and that the structure of the European is best fitted for the habits of improved life. All the laws of nature have a beneficial tendency, and among others this law of deviation in the species of animals. It is a principle of amelioration and adaptation. We find that the conformation and the disposition or instinct of animals varies in domestication in such a way as to render them more fitted for their new condition. The negro is particularly adapted to the wild or natural state of life. His dense and firm fiber renders him much more able to endure fatigue and the inclemencies of the seasons than the European with his lax fiber and delicate constitution. The easy parturition of the female negro is a facility which could not be dispensed with in uncultivated life. The senses are more perfect in negroes than in Europeans, especially those which are of most importance to the savage and less necessary to the civilized man, viz. the smell, taste, and hearing and a particular provision is made in the anatomical structure of the head for the perfect evolution of them. This perfection of the ruder faculties of sense is not required in a civilized state, and it therefore gives way to a more capacious form of the skull, affording space for a more ample conformation of the brain, on which an increase of intellectual power is probably dependent. Fourthly, the question whether the primeval stock were similar to the negro or to the european race seems little different from this whether the first of our species the children of nature qui erupto robore nati compositive luto nullos habuere parentes were such beings as we find savage men to be or were created at once adorned with all the improvements of civilization for we find that all nations who have never emerged from the savage state are negroes, or very similar to negroes. Such are all the savages scattered through the distant islands of the southern hemisphere. Wherever we find the people naked, destitute barbarians, running wild in the woods, there we also observe them to be black, and to partake considerably of the negro form and character. Wherever we see any progress towards civilization, there we also find deviation towards a lighter color and a different form, nearly in the same proportion. The American race are much less rude and destitute than the New Hollanders, and though they retain a considerable share of the structure and complexion of the savage, yet they differ much from the latter people. Note, there are some reasons which induce us to believe that the Americans have gone retrograde in their condition. End of note. There is no example of a race of savages with the European constitution and characters. Note, perhaps it may be objected that the ancient nations of the North were of fair complexion, though barbarians, and this may seem an exception to our general assertion sufficient to invalidate its force. But it must be remarked that the Greeks and Romans called all people barbarians whose speech was unintelligible to them, and in this sense only they applied the term with propriety to the nations who long resisted and finally subverted the Roman power. I denominate those tribes savages who live on casual sustenance without cultivating the earth or feeding cattle. The change from this miserable condition to the agricultural and pastoral state is the greatest alteration which the character of man is susceptible of. All the additional arts and circumstances of civilized society are trivial matters compared with this. Let any one read the accounts given by Caesar and others of the Gauls and Britons of their fortified towns, armed chariots, cavalry, public stores, merchandise, etc., and say whether these people were savages. Even the ancient barbarians of Italy, the Sicilii, Opici, etc., who appear to have been Celtic tribes, 
had fortified towns when first attacked by the earliest colonies of Pulaski. The only people of Europe who seem to have made the least approach in any period of their history to the savage state are the Laplanders, and they differ equally from all other Europeans in their physical characters and approximate in the like proportion to the negro complexion. End of note. The Eskimo, or Greenland tribes, are the nearest approach to such an instance, but these people are very different from our race. They are not white in complexion, nor do they resemble us in form. They have a depressed forehead, and other characters of opposite description. Besides, these tribes are not savages. They have arts, though not civilized, without which they could not subsist in their present dreary abodes. They came to Greenland from the west, and are found as far in the same direction as the islands on the coast of Asia. They emigrated in all probability from the Asiatic continent, and there are not wanting reasons which induce us to suppose that the Kamchatkans and other tribes in that extremity of Asia, who bear a general resemblance to the Eskimo and to each other, are descended from a wandering tribe of Mongols. Note, see Stralenberg and Cook's Last Voyage, account of the Kamchadals, also de Guin's Histoire Générale de Une, etc. End of note. Hence it is probable that this curious race of people who have been driven by various accidents into such a remote and scarcely habitable recess are a tribe once half civilized and reduced again to a state of barbarism. On the whole there are many reasons which lead us to adopt the conclusion that the primitive stock of men were probably negroes, and I know of no argument to be set on the other side. It may be inquired whether there are any facts to be found in history which tend to confirm this opinion and to make it probable that the fairest races of white people in Europe are descended from or have any affinity with Negroes. The uncertainty of the history of remote ages and the scanty information we can glean concerning the physical characters of ancient tribes do not admit of any close reasoning on this subject but we shall hereafter see that there are reasons for concluding this opinion to be probable. We shall endeavor, in the sequel, to trace in the field of history the vestiges of the nations who first attained civilization, and who in their origin possessed the characters in question, though these have long since disappeared. From these nations it may perhaps be made to appear that the European tribes derived the first rudiments of civil society, and that they are in all probability descended from them. End of chapter 5, section 4, Primitive Stock of Men Negroes. Part 22 of Researches into the Physical History of Man. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain, read by John Greenman. Chapter 5, section 5, of the causes of varieties of form. The foregoing observations on the causes of varieties apply with nearly as much force to the diversities of figure as to those of color. The latter are indeed connected with the former to a great degree. It is surprising to reflect on the absurd theories which are still current even among philosophers on the subject of the various forms of different nations. Some persist in attributing the peculiarities in the features of the negro to the contracted form into which the countenance is thrown by the effect of a strong light falling on the face. Note, Volney, Voyage en Syrie et en Egypte. End of note. Others derive the varieties in the visage of the Australasian savage from the attempts which he is constantly making to prevent insects from getting into his eyes. Note, Bonpierre first proposed this absurd hypothesis, and Blumenbach has given it his sanction. Dompierre, Voy, Volume 2, Blumenbach, De Gen, H. Var, Nat. End of note. We still find the characteristic physiognomy of one half of mankind ascribed to the custom of flattening the noses of infants, which is said to prevail on the coast of Guinea. Note, viz. 
by Dr. S. S. Smith and the other writers. End of note. When such notions as these are advanced or sanctioned by Blumenbach, Bolny, and Smith, what are we to expect from inferior reasoners? Note, Leibniz has advanced an idea on this subject, which is not less ingenious than absurd. He fancied that a certain analogy subsists between the native animals of every country and the indigenous human inhabitants. The Laplanders, according to him, resemble the bear in their visage, and the features of the negroes of Africa and of remote countries in the east have some relation to those of the numerous species of monkeys which there abound. See Blumenbach, de gen hum var nat. End of note. It would appear that local causes must have a certain influence in occasioning the appearance of varieties in the form. We have examples of races of people descended from the same stock who have acquired considerable diversity in this respect. These causes, however, do not seem to be very powerful, for we find them in many instances existing without any corresponding effect. Various tribes, resembling the Mongols in form, are scattered through all the northern and eastern parts of Asia, of which regions they are almost the sole inhabitants. The difference of climate and situation, which is extreme in the distant parts of this extensive continent, has not produced a corresponding diversity in the figure of the people. A parallel observation may be made of the American, Negro, and European races. In the historical inquiries which follow, we shall trace various instances of great modification in the national figure which have accompanied the progressive improvement of many tribes in civilization, and seem to be closely connected with such a change in the moral condition. Note, see remarks on the South Sea Islanders and on the physical characters of the Hindus and Egyptians below. End of note. We shall now go on to consider the physical history of particular nations and to inquire whether the phenomena that present themselves are comfortable or not with the foregoing reasonings. End of chapter 5, section 5 of the causes and varieties of form. Part 23 of Researches into the Physical History of Man. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain, read by John Greenman. Chapter 6 On the Physical History of the Most Remarkable Races of Men, of the South Sea and Indian Islanders, Section 1 general observations. In this part of our inquiry, since the chief design is to investigate the physical history of nations, and by collecting all the data we have on this subject, to establish or refute certain physiological opinions, we shall only enter into questions purely historical when the discussion of them is indispensable to the attainment of our principal object but we shall occasionally find it necessary to undertake long disquisitions on subjects of little moment in a general view which happen to bear with greater weight on our particular pursuit whenever the testimony of historians affords any information we shall avail ourselves of this resource but the direct authority of history furnishes but a very imperfect insight into the origins of nations we must therefore often depend on the reflected light which is obtained by the comparison of languages, by the analysis of civil and religious institutions and mythological fables, or by tracing clearly marked affinities in the manners and customs of different tribes. The most important of these aids is the comparison of languages. When two nations ever so distantly separated, or however widely distinguished in all other points, are found to speak the same language, or to use dialects which, though differing in pronunciation and otherwise variously modified, can yet be traced to the same radicals or elements, so as to prove that an essential affinity existed in their primitive structure, it is certain that such nations have descended in great part from the same stock. 
for languages have never been communicated from one nation to another by intercourse or even by conquest unless when the vanquished people have remained long under subjection to their conquerors nor indeed in that case except in some rare examples where colonization has been carried to such an extent as to change the mass of the population note thus although britain was subject to the power of rome almost as long as gaul the latin language was not communicated to the native inhabitants of the former country and the welsh of this day contains no very great number of latin vocables few roman colonies were settled in britain but in gaul which abounded with them the old language was nearly exterminated and the french at present speak a dialect derived almost entirely from the latin End of note. this argument is certainly liable to be abused many words may be introduced in the speech of any tribe by their immediate neighbors if frequent communications subsist between them works of art or discoveries of any kind commonly retain when carried into foreign parts the names which they received from their first inventors a variety of terms is brought in with the adoption of a new religion new laws or a different state of manners from what before prevailed but it is always possible to discover by proper discrimination what parts of the vocabulary are thus adventitious and what are radical elementary or original the permanency of languages is a remarkable fact in the history of mankind and it appears to be more constant in proportion to the advancement of society among civilized nations who have arrived at the knowledge of letters the variation of dialect is very slow popular compositions or national records soon form a standard or model by which future writers regulate their style and the idiom becomes fixed thus the verses of homer are still in some degree intelligible to the modern greeks and the syriac spoken in judea at the christian era retained much affinity to the language of the pentateuch oral dialects are much more variable than written ones yet among nations which have made some progress in the arts of life and have become pastoral or agricultural we have remarkable instances of the preservation of languages during a great length of time a considerable population is found in states of this description and frequent intercourse preserves the identity of speech the use of popular songs and recitations attracts the attention of the people to the elegance and accuracy of pronunciation the idiom thus becomes modeled and established without the use of letters in this state of society were all the nations of northern europe who were called by the greeks and romans barbarians and the natives of many of the indian and south sea islands are found to be in many respects in a similar condition but miserable destitute savages who lead a wandering life in pursuit of the scanty sustenance which they can procure by gathering wild fruits or by fishing along the sea coasts always go necessarily in small companies which seldom or never meet the few ideas they have require but a short vocabulary and their solitary mode of existence makes the faculty of speech almost useless to them where there is so little intercourse we find that there are few conventional terms and these vary at short distances the hunting tribes of north america have a variety of languages which differ extremely from each other but the new hollanders are the nearest of all men to the description alluded to accordingly we are told that in new south wales in districts separated by a few leagues even the sun and moon and the most striking and universal objects of nature are called by perfectly different names note collins new south wales among nations therefore of this character and condition discrepancy of language is no proof whatever of diversity of origin it is obvious that the analysis of mythological systems may afford evidence of connection between distant nations and that much information may be acquired by a diligent comparison of civil and religious institutions other indications of scarcely less importance 
may be drawn from the resemblance of habits and peculiar customs, but in this inquiry caution and accuracy are requisite. Those shades of character and manners which have their origin in the general principles of human nature, or arise from circumstances and situations likely to occur to all men, may be found to prevail more or less among tribes which have had no intercourse. But if we find clear coincidences in such peculiar habits and customs as are purely arbitrary and casual, we cannot suppose these instances to have been of separate production, but are compelled to acknowledge that they evince a common origin or a connection at some former period between the nations who continue to be marked by such traits. In addition to many arguments drawn from the languages and moral history of different tribes, we derive a degree of evidence from their physical characters, for although the latter are subject to great diversities and very generally deviate more or less in the course of time, yet there will be found, for the most part in the divided branches of the same nation, some considerable remains of the original type, some general characters which resemble and may be regarded as the stock on which the varieties have been engrafted. We shall meet with many illustrations of these remarks in the following pages. End of chapter 6, section 1, General Observations Part 24 of Researches into the Physical History of Man This LibriVox recording is in the public domain, read by John Greenman. Chapter 6, Section 2, General View of the Nations Inhabiting the South Sea Islands and the Austral Countries The islands of the Great Southern Sea, comprising those which are in the neighborhood of the Indian continent, and the clusters which extend into more distant spaces in the ocean, present a field of inquiry extremely interesting to the natural historian of mankind. These insular countries are distributed through almost every variety of climate, and contain abundant diversity of local situation. Therefore they afford us an opportunity of observing whatever influence physical causes may be supposed to exert over our species. In this point of view we also derive advantage from the remote distances which separate the islands, and from the imperfect knowledge of navigation which the natives possess for these circumstances prevent intercourse among the different tribes, and preclude those frequent changes or intermixtures of population which perplex our inquiries into the history of continental nations. An equal diversity characterizes the moral condition of these people. Some tribes are the rudest and most destitute savages found on the face of the globe, while others have gained a considerable advancement in the arts of society and if they have not made much progress in true civilization, have at least proceeded far in luxury and delicacy of life, and in those particular circumstances of the moral state by which the physical character of the race may be supposed to be most influenced. The regions above mentioned are inhabited by races of people who bear strong indications of a near connection in their history, if indeed their affinity be not so clear as to justify the opinion of the best informed voyagers that they are all propagated from one original. They may be divided into two principal classes. The tribes which belong to the first of these are, strictly speaking, savages. They are universally in that rude, unimproved state which precedes all division of professions and employments. Consequently, their political condition is that of perfect equality, without any difference of ranks. Their physical character is of the rudest kind. Their form and complexion approximate those of the Negro. The nations of the second division have greatly the advantage of the former in the condition of society and manners. Among these we find an elevated rank of people who are distinguished in many respects from the lower orders and particularly in the physical description of their persons. Their form and complexion approach considerably towards those of Europeans, while the aspect of the inferior class borders closely on the rude and uncultivated constitution of the races arranged in the first division. 
the different voyagers who preceded Captain Cook in exploring the Pacific Ocean had given us many curious notices concerning the natives of the islands, but we have derived more extensive information from the marks of that celebrated navigator and the naturalists who accompanied him, among whom Dr. Forster holds a distinguished place. For the most judicious and accurate accounts we possess, we are indebted to Mr. Anderson, who seems to have combined more of the qualities of a philosophical observer than almost any other individual who has traversed the regions in question. Note, the premature death of this young man was a serious misfortune to the scientific world, as we have doubtless been deprived by it of much interesting knowledge. Many parts of his journal and his observations on diverse countries and their inhabitants have been incorporated by the editor of Cook's last narrative in the body of that work. End of note. As far as his observations extend, we shall form our opinions on his testimony, and whenever his statements differ from the more careless or superficial remarks of others, we shall rely on the former with a well-authorized confidence. Mr. Anderson was well aware of the importance of a comparison of languages in tracing the history and connection of different tribes. He never omitted any opportunities which occurred of collecting vocabularies in order to institute an investigation of this kind. The general opinion which he was led to form in these inquiries, and which was assisted by the tenor of various observations, he has given us in these words. If we may depend upon the affinity of languages as a clue to guide us in the origin of nations, I have no doubt but we shall find on a diligent inquiry, and when opportunities offer to collect accurately a sufficient number of these words, and to compare them, that all the people from New Holland eastward to Easter Island have been derived from the same common root. Note. Cook's Last Voyage. End of note. The learned and judicious author of the history of Sumatra declares the same opinion in still more general terms. He was convinced that one general language prevailed, however mutilated and changed in the course of time, throughout all this portion of the world, from Madagascar to the most distant discoveries eastward, of which the Malay is a dialect much corrupted or refined by a mixture of other tongues. This very extensive similarity of language, says our author, indicates a common origin of the inhabitants, but the circumstances and progress of their separation are wrapped in the darkest veils of obscurity. Note, Marsden's Hist of Sumatra. In another place he says that the general language which prevails through all the islands of this ocean, although in different places it has been more or less mixed and corrupted, yet between the most dissimilar branches an evident sameness of many radical words is apparent, and in some very distant from each other in point of situation the deviation of the words is scarcely more than is observed in the dialects of neighboring provinces of the same kingdom. Hist Sumat, page 165. End of note. The opinions of these writers, which were founded principally on affinities in language and on some moral peculiarities, receive strong confirmation from resemblances in the physical structure of the people for although the latter branches out into considerable varieties, there are found everywhere traces of general similitude, and we may fairly look on the diversities as particular deviations from one common model, or as new impressions superadded on the original type. The primary characters, as nearly as we can discern them, consist in an approximation more or less exact to those of the African in diverse instances indeed some families of these eastern negroes are more strongly marked by the peculiarities which distinguish the ethiopian from the european race than even the africans of guinea the facial angle is small and the forehead low the head narrow and resembling the negro in its general conformation the nose somewhat depressed 
but generally full and fleshy towards the point. The structure of the limbs has the same analogy. The legs are long, and the gastrocnemii muscles deficient. This description more particularly applies to the savage class, but in some degree also to the more civilized and especially to the inferior orders of them. It shows, however, continually a disposition to deviate, and in many examples approaches very near to or even attains the European form. Such instances are principally found among the better orders of the less barbarous people. The complexion may be said to set out from the black hue of the negro, which in many countries is the color of the majority of the people, but is perpetually found disposed to assume a lighter shade. It is not uniform in any of the tribes with which we are acquainted, and in a few individuals of some of them it has acquired a very opposite character from the original one. The complexion of the savage tribes is commonly blacker than that of the more cultivated races, that is to say, the complexion of the generality of the former is darker than that of generality among the latter. But this difference does not subsist if we consider individuals. For example, the New Hollanders belong to the savage class, and the New Zealanders to the half-civilized one. In New Holland, the majority of the people are black, but many among the number are of the Malay copper color. In New Zealand, many are of a pretty deep black, but the greater number a tawny complexion. The hair of some of these people is as woolly as that of the natives of Guinea. Others have it crisp and curled, but more like the hair of Europeans, and in many instances it is lank and strong. Nor are these different growths peculiar to separate races. They are found among the natives of the same island. The color of the hair is generally black, but neither is this constant. It becomes frequently brown, sometimes of a flaxen or sandy hue, and in a few rare examples it attains the red color which is common among the German tribes. It will appear more fully whether, with our present knowledge of these tribes, their affinity is so decided as to authorize a general description, when we shall have considered separately and compared the most important notices we have concerning the several divisions. This we propose to undertake in detail, and whether the most general conclusion of the authors above quoted shall be established with sufficient evidence or not, we have no doubt of making some interesting deductions from more partial views, which will have all the certainty desirable. We shall begin with considering the history of those tribes which approach most nearly, in their physical characters, to the natives of Africa, whom therefore we shall denominate Eastern Negroes. These appear to be the aborigines of all the countries where they are now found, as well as of others from which they have disappeared. End of chapter 6, section 2, General View of the Nations Inhabiting the South Sea Islands and the Austral Countries.